Hello, everyone. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider subscribing, liking, and commenting. It would really help the channel out quite a bit. Thank you very much. Title, Foundation. Foundation and Empire, Second Foundation. Author, Isaac Asimov. Part number one. Part title, Psycho History and Encyclopedia. Encyclopedia Galactica, 116th edition. Entry, Hardy Selden. Born the 11,988th year of the Galactic Era. Died 12,069. Birthplace, Helicon, Arcturus Sector. He showed amazing ability in mathematics at a very early age. Anecdotes concerning his ability are innumerable and some contradictory. Undoubtedly his greatest contributions were in the field of psychohistory. Selden found the field little more than a set of vague axioms. He left it a profound statistical science. The best existing authority we have for the details of his life is the biography written by Gar Dornick, who, as a young man, met Selden two years before the great mathematician's death. The viewing room will be closed for the remainder of the trip. Prepare for landing, please. Would it be possible for me to stay? I would like to see Trantor. We'll be landing on Trantor by morning. I mean, I want to see it from space. I'm afraid not. If this were a space yacht, we might manage it, but we're spinning down Sunside. You wouldn't want to be burnt, blinded, and radiation scarred all at the same time, would you? I see. Trantor would only be a grey blur anyway. Hmm. Look, why don't you take a space tour once you get there? They're quite cheap. I will. Thank you. Right. You next? Yes. Right. Package. Lisa. Yeah. Right. Well, move on, Dornick. Taxi to the right and third left. Thank you. Next. Is that him? Yes. Good. Uh, taxis to the right and third left. A good hotel, please. They're all good. Name one. Well, the nearest one, please. 1.12. Where do I go? Follow the light track. Your ticket will keep going as long as you're going in the right direction. <laughs> Encyclopedia Galactica, 116th edition, entry, Tantor. Center of the Imperial Government for unbroken hundreds of generations. Located in the central regions of the galaxy, among the most densely populated and industrially advanced worlds of the system. Land surface, 19,230,000,000 hectares, totally urbanized. Population. 40 billions, devoted almost entirely to the administrative necessities of the empire. Its dependence upon the outer worlds for food and indeed all the necessities of life made it increasingly vulnerable to conquest by siege. In the last millennium of the empire, imperial policy 
became little more than the protection of Trantle's delicate jugular vein. Oh, it's obviously your first visit to Trantle. What do you think of it? I don't know what to say. I've seen nothing like it before. I'll need time to soak it all in before I can give an opinion. This must seem a bit stupid to you. Trantorians must take it all for granted. Trantorians never come up here. It gives them nerves. Nerves? Why on earth should it do that? If you're born in a cubicle, grow up in a corridor, work in a cell and holiday in a sunroom, then coming up into the open with nothing but sky over you might conceivably give you a nervous breakdown. How high do you think we are? I don't know. A thousand meters? No. Just a hundred and fifty. What? But the lift took ages. I know. But it spent most of the time just getting up to ground level. Trantor is tunnelled over 1,500 metres down. It's like an iceberg. Nine-tenths of it is out of sight. You here on holiday? Not exactly. I've always wanted to visit Trantor, but I've come primarily for a job. Oh? With Dr. Selden's project at the University of Trantor. Raven Selden? No, Hari Selden, the psychohistorian. I don't know of any Raven Selden. Hari's the one I mean. We call him Raven because he keeps predicting disaster. What kind of disaster? What kind would you think? I'm afraid I wouldn't have the slightest idea. I've read the papers Dr. Selden has published, but they're on mathematical theory. Yes. The ones they publish. Look, I... I think I'd better go now. I'm very pleased to have met you. doing in my room? I am Harry Selden. Good afternoon, sir. I... You didn't think we were to meet before tomorrow? No, sir. Well, it's just that if we're to use your services, we must work quickly. I don't understand. Well, just relax and sit down. Thank you. You were talking to a man on the observation tower, were you not? Yes. I met him in the lift. His name is Gerald. He's an agent from the Commission of Public Safety. He followed you from the spaceport. But why? Did he say nothing about me? He referred to you as Raven Selden. Did he say why? He said that you predict disaster. I do. What does Trantor mean to you? Glorious. You say that without thinking. What of psychohistory? Psychohistory. Psycho that branch of mathematics that deals with the reactions of human conglomerates to fixed social and economic stimuli. Assumptions. One, the human conglomerate be sufficiently large for valid statistical treatment. Two, the human conglomerate is itself unaware of psychohistorical analysis in order that its reactions be truly random. I hadn't thought of applying it to the problem. Before you've done with me, you'll have learned to apply psychohistory to all problems as a matter of course. Now then, you see the function set up on the calculator? Yes. Well, that represents the condition of the empire at the moment. Surely it's not a complete representation. No, not complete. I'm glad to see you don't accept my word blindly. However, this is an approximation which will serve to demonstrate the proposition. Will you accept that? Subject to my later verification of the derivation of the function, yes. Good. Uh, add to this the known probability of imperial assassination, vice-regal revolt, the contemporary recurrence of periods of economic depression, the declining rate of planetary explorations. Do you see, incidentally, the new symbols on the calculator? Yes. Uh, this is Trantor five centuries from now. How do you interpret this function? Total destruction. But that's impossible. All right. You saw how the result was arrived at. Now, forget the symbolism for the moment and put it into words. 
As Trantor becomes more specialised, it becomes more vulnerable, less able to defend itself. Mm. Further, as it becomes more and more the centre of empire, it becomes a greater prize. Yes. As the imperial succession becomes more and more uncertain and the feuds among the great families more rampant, social responsibility disappears. Right. Now, what of the probability of destruction within five centuries? Oh, come on, surely you can perform a field differentiation without the calculator. Uh, about 85%? Not bad, <laughs> but not good enough. The actual figure is 92.5%. Raven Selden. I haven't seen any of this in your journals. Of course not. This is unprintable. You suppose the Imperium could expose its shakiness in this manner? Some of our results have leaked out among the aristocracy. That's bad. Not necessarily. All is taken into account. Then is that why I'm being investigated? Yes, everything about my project is being investigated. Are you in danger? Oh, yes. There is a probability of 1.7% that I will be executed, but that, of course, would not stop the project. We've taken that into account as well. Never mind. You will meet me, I suppose, at the university tomorrow. I will, sir. Mm. Well, goodbye. Yes? Carl Dornick. Yes? I have to inform you that you are under detention at the order of the Commission for Public Safety. You will remain in your room until we are ready for your interrogation. Sit down, Dr. Dornick. Thank you. You'll smoke if you wish. Now then, where do you come from, Dr. Dornick? I'm from Synax. I see. Now, I see from these papers that you are to join Dr. Selton's staff. That's correct. I should be there now. Yes, I know. But why were you invited to join the staff? Well, I'm not too sure, really. I, I got the invitation after receiving my doctorate in mathematics. What are to be your duties? I haven't the faintest idea. I expect I shall be informed when I get to the university. Well, then, let me put it another way. What secret instructions have you received? I don't know what you're talking about. I've had no instructions at all, either secret or not. When will Trantor be destroyed? I beg your pardon. I said, when will Trantor be destroyed? I couldn't say, of my own knowledge. Could you say of anyone's? How could I speak for another? Has anyone told you of such destructions at a date? You have been followed, Doctor. We were at the airport when you arrived, on the observation tower when you waited for your appointment, and, of course, we were able to overhear your conversation with Dr. Selden. Then you know his views on the matter. Perhaps. But we would like to hear them from you. He is of the opinion that Trantor will be destroyed within five centuries. He proved it? Mathematically? Yes, he did. And you maintain the mathematics to be valid? If Dr. Selden vouches for it, then it is valid. Then we will return. Wait. I have a right to a lawyer. I demand my rights as an imperial citizen. And you shall have them. Yes? I am Laws Abbotkin. Dr. Selden has directed me to represent you. Is that so? Well, then, look here. I demand an instant appeal to the Emperor. I'm being held without cause. I'm innocent of anything. You've got to arrange a hearing with the Emperor instantly. The Commission will, of course, have a spy beam on our conversation. It's against the law, but they will have one nevertheless. However, this recorder has the additional property of completely blanketing any spy beam. They won't discover it at once. Then I can speak? Of course. I want a hearing with the Emperor. There are no hearings before the Emperor. Trantor is, I'm afraid, in the hands of the aristocratic families, members of which compose the Commission for Public Safety, a development which was well predicted by psychohistory. Indeed. In that case, if Dr. Selden can predict the history of Trantor 500 years into the future... He can predict it 1,500 years into the future. I don't care if it's 15,000. Why couldn't he yesterday have predicted the events of this morning and warned me? Dr. Selden was of the opinion that you would be arrested this morning. What? 
Look, will you send Dr. Selden to me? Unfortunately, I can't. Dr. Selden is himself under arrest. You will be tried together. Let us see, Dr. Selden. How many men are now engaged upon the project of which you are head? Fifty mathematicians. Including Dr. Gal Dornick? Dr. Dornick is the 51st. Oh, we have 51, then. Search your memory, Dr. Selden, perhaps there are 52 or 53, or perhaps even more. Dr. Dornick has not yet formally joined my organization. When he does, the membership will be 51. It is now 50, as I have said. Not perhaps nearly 100,000. Mathematicians? No. I did not say mathematicians. Are there a hundred thousand in all capacities? In all capacities, your figure may be correct. Maybe. I say it is. I say that the men in your project number 98,572. I believe you're counting women and children. 98,572 individuals is the intent of my statement. There is no need to quibble. I accept the figure. Can the future be changed, Dr. Sutton? Obviously. Can the overall history of the human race be changed? Yes. Easily? With great difficulty. Why? The psychohistoric trend of a planet full of people contains a huge inertia. To be changed, it must be met with something possessing a similar inertia. So, Tranton need not be ruined if a great many people decide to act so that it will not. That is right. As many as a hundred thousand people? That is far too few. You are sure? But perhaps a hundred thousand people can change the trend if they and their descendants labor for five hundred years. Five hundred years is too short. In other words, Dr. Selden, they cannot prevent the destruction of Trenton, no matter what they do. You are unfortunately correct. And on the other hand, your hundred thousand are intended for no illegal purpose. Exactly. In that case, Dr. Selden, what is the purpose of your hundred thousand? To minimize the effects of that destruction. And what exactly do you mean by that? The explanation is simple. The coming destruction of Trantor is not an event in itself, isolated in the scheme of human development. It will be the climax to an intricate drama which was begun centuries ago and which is accelerating in pace continuously. I refer, gentlemen, to the developing decline and fall of the Galactic Empire. Dr. Selden, you are speaking of an empire that has stood for 12,000 years. Is it not obvious to everyone that the empire is as strong as it ever was? Mr. Advocate, sir, the rotten tree trunk, until the very moment when the storm blast breaks it in two, has all the appearance of strength that it ever had. We are not here, Dr. Selden, to listen The empire to... will vanish, and all its good with it. Its accumulated knowledge will decay, and the order it is imposed will vanish. Interstellar wars will be endless. Interstellar trade will decay. Population will decline. Worlds will lose touch with the main body of the galaxy. And so matter will remain. Forever? Psychohistory which can predict the fall, can make certain statements concerning the succeeding Dark Ages. The Empire, gentlemen, has stood 12,000 years. The Dark Ages to come will endure not 12, but 30,000 years. A second Empire will rise, but between it and our civilization will be 1,000 years of suffering humanity. We must fight that. How do you propose to do this? 
By saving the knowledge of the race, if we now prepare an encyclopedia of all knowledge, it will never be lost. Coming generations will build on it and will not have to rediscover it for themselves. One millennium will do the work of 30,000. Oh, all my project, my 30,000 men with their wives and children are devoting themselves to the preparation of an encyclopedia galactica. They will not complete it in their own lifetime. I will not even live to see it fairly begun. But by the time Transor falls, it will be complete, and copies will exist in every major library in the galaxy. That is all, Dr. Sutton. You may stand down. <laughs> Ah, Dr. Selden, this is a pleasure. Please sit down. Thank you, Commissioner Chen. Now then, what can I do for you? You asked me to come and see you. Ah, yes, so I did. My lawyer is not present. This is no longer a trial, Dr. Selden. We are only here to discuss the safety of the state. You disturb the peace of the Emperor's realm. Can you tell me why I may not rig myself both of you and an uncomfortable and unnecessary five-century future, which I shall never see, by having you executed tonight? A week ago, you might have done so and perhaps retained the one in ten probability of yourself remaining alive at year's end. Today, the one in ten probability is scarcely one in ten thousand. How so? The fall of Trantor cannot be stopped, but it can easily be hastened. The news of my interrupted trial would spread throughout the galaxy. Frustration of my plans to lighten the disaster would convince people that the future holds no promise for them. The feeling would grow that only what a man can grasp for himself at the moment would be of any account. Ambitious men, unscrupulous men will not wait. By their every action, they would hasten the decay of the world. Have me killed now, and Trantor will fall, not within five centuries, but within fifty years, and you yourself within a single year. Those are words to frighten children. However, your death is not necessarily the only answer that would satisfy us. Tell me, would your only activity be that of preparing the encyclopedia of which you spoke? Yes. And need that be done on Trantor? Trantor, my lord, possesses the Imperial Library as well as the scholarly resources of the University of Trantor. And yet if you were located elsewhere, let us say upon a planet where your men could devote themselves entirely and single-mindedly to their work, might not that have advantages? Minor ones, perhaps? Such a world has been chosen where you may work, Doctor, at your leisure with your hundred thousand about you. The galaxy will know that you are working and fighting the fall. They will even be told that you will prevent the fall. I see. The alternative is death for yourself and as many of your followers as will seem necessary. The opportunity for choosing between death and exile is given you over a time period stretching from this moment to one five minutes hence. Which is the world chosen, my lord? It is called, I believe, Terminus. It is uninhabited, but quite habitable, and can be moulded to suit the necessities of scholars. It is somewhat secluded. And the edge of the galaxy. As I said, somewhat secluded. It will suit your concentration. We will need time to arrange such a trip. There are 20,000 families involved. You will be given time. I accept exile. Dr. Selden? Yes? 
I have been instructed to inform you that from now on you and all your people are under martial law and that six months will be allowed you for preparations to leave Trantor. Thank you, Captain. Six months? Now we can talk at our ease. But, Doctor, what can be done in six months? Six months will be quite enough. I don't see how. In a plan such as mine, other people's actions and wishes must be bent to our needs. The trial was not allowed to begin until the circumstances were right. But could you have arranged... To be exiled to Terminus? We've been preparing to leave for two years. Of course, we couldn't be certain that it would be Terminus that Chen would choose. But we hoped it might be, and we acted on that hope. But why, Dr. Selden? May I not know? Not yet. It is enough for the moment that you know that a scientific refuge will be established on Terminus. And another will be established at the other end of the galaxy. At Star's End. And as for the rest... You will see more than I. My doctors tell me that I cannot live more than a year or two. That I have accomplished in life what I intended. And under what circumstances may one better die? And after you die? There will be successors. Perhaps even yourself. I don't understand. You will. Most will leave for terminus. But some will stay. It will be fairly simple to arrange. But as for me, I am finished. Encyclopedia Galactica. 116th edition, entry, Terminus. The location of Terminus was an odd one for the role that it was called upon to play in galactic history, and yet in many ways an inevitable one. On the very fringe of the galactic spiral, an only planet of an isolated sun, poor in resources and negligible in economic value, it was never settled in the five centuries after its discovery until the landing of the encyclopedists. But within 50 years, as a new generation grew, it was inevitable that Terminus would become more than a mere appendage of the psycho-historians of Trantor. With the Anacreonian revolt came the rise to power of the first of the great line of mayors, Salvor Hardin. Hardin, what is the matter with you? For the last six months, you've been getting edgier and edgier. Just a growing feeling that everything isn't going the way that it should be. Look, Lee, it's 50 years now since Selden and Dornick dispatched our fathers to Terminus, and in all that time, we've never had any real idea of our reason for being here. To compile the encyclopedia against the destruction of the Empire. That's what we're told. But I'm none too certain. Hmm. Selden must have intended us to do more than that. Population's growing, and all of it can't be used by the Foundation. Furthermore, the Empire doesn't seem to care about us. And now that the province of Anacreon has revolted against it, and furthermore defeated Smyrno in open battle, we are in a bad position. You worry unnecessarily. The Board of Trustees knows what it's doing. You think so? Of course. I wish I shared your confidence. Well, if you're worried about the situation, why don't you go and see the Chairman of the Board? Well, after all, as mayor, you have some authority. That's just the point. As mayor, I have no real authority Oh, at all. really? Oh, I admit that I deal with problems of taxation, agricultural policy, and so forth. But the major decisions, the ones that affect the state, are taken by the board of trustees. My word carries no weight whatsoever with them. Nevertheless, I think they'd listen to you. Would they? Well, Louis Piren is a reasonable man. Louis Piren is a fool. Oh. He can't see anything unless it's under his nose. Totally absorbed with the problems of producing their blasted books. <laughs> He's not interested in anything except the encyclopedia. Uh. Anyway, I'll do as you advise. I'll go and see him tomorrow. Good. I feel sure he'll listen to you. He'd better do a damn sight more than that. If not, we shall have to try other tactics. The situation cannot be allowed to continue as it is. Oh, 
Hardin, what's your problem? The royal governor of the province of Anacreon has assumed the title of king. Well, what of it? Now, that means we are cut off from the inner regions of the empire. Is that so important? Important. Anacreon stands square across our last remaining trade route. Where is our metal to come from? Peren, this is a matter of life and death. The planet Terminus by itself cannot support a mechanized civilization. You know that. Yes, yes. There yes. hasn't a trace of iron, copper or aluminium in any of the surface rocks. And precious little else. What do you think will happen to the encyclopedia if Anacreon clamps down on us? Are you forgetting that we are under the direct jurisdiction of the emperor himself? So was Anacreon. <coughs> and that's not all. At least another 20 of the outermost provinces of the galaxy have begun steering things their own way. I tell you, I feel damned uncertain of the Empire and its ability to protect us. Nonsense, royal governor or king. What's the difference? Forget it, Hardin. It's none of our business. We are first and last scientists, and our concern is the encyclopedia. Oh, yes, I almost forgot, Hardin. Mm. Do something about that newspaper of yours. It isn't mine. It's it... privately owned. What's it been doing? For weeks now, it's been recommending that the 50th anniversary of the Foundation be made the occasion for public holidays and quite inappropriate celebrations. Well, why not? In three months, the radium clock will open the first vault. I'd call that quite a big occasion, wouldn't you? Not for silly pageantry, Hardin. The first vault and its opening concerns the Board of Trustees alone. Anything of importance will be communicated to the people by me. I am the Emperor's representative on Terminus and have full powers in this respect. I see. Well, Pirret, in connection with your status as Emperor's representative, then, I have a final piece of news to give you. About an acrium? Yes. A special envoy, Anselm Roderick, is being sent to us in two weeks. An envoy here? From an acrium? What for? I'll give you one guess. <laughs> Of course, all the formal discussions, the paper signing and such dull technicalities, that is, will take place before the... Uh, uh, what is it you call your council? The Board of Trustees. Odd name. Anyway, that's for tomorrow. But we might as well clear some of the underbrush man to man right now, though. Don't you agree? And that means... Just this. There's been a certain change out here in the periphery. And the status of your planet has become a trifle uncertain. It would be very convenient if we succeeded in coming to an understanding as to how the matter stands. Let me understand this, Your Eminence. Your mission is merely one of uh, clarification. That's correct. In that case, it's soon over. We are a state-supported scientific institution and part of the Emperor's personal domain. Yes, that's a nice theory, Dr. Perrin, but what's the actual situation? Uh, how do you stand with respect to Smyrna? You're not 50 parsecs from their capital, you know. And uh, what about Conom and Daribo? We have nothing to do with any province. They're not provinces, they are kingdoms now. Mm, kingdoms, then. We have nothing to do with them. As a scientific institution... Science be damned. Yes. The devil has that got to do with the fact that we're liable to see Terminus taken over by Smyrno at any time? And the Emperor. He would just sit by. Well, now, Dr. Peren, you respect the Emperor's property, and so do I. But Smyrno might not. Remember, we've just signed a treaty with the Emperor, which places upon us the responsibility of maintaining the borders of the old province of Anacreon on behalf of the Emperor. Our duty is clear, then, is it not? Certainly. But Terminus is not part of the province of Anacreon. And Smyrno? Nor is it part of the province of Smyrno. It is not part of any province. Does Smyrno know that? I don't care what it knows. But we do. We've just finished a war with her, and she still holds two stellar systems that are ours. Terminus occupies an important strategic position between the two nations. Uh, what is your proposition, Your Eminence? <laughs> it seems perfectly obvious that since Terminus cannot defend itself, Anacreon must take over the job. We believe that it would be best for all concerned to have Anacreon establish a military base here. And that is all you would want? A military base in some of the vast unoccupied territories? Well, of course, there would be the question of supporting the occupying forces. Oh, I see the terminus is to be a protectorate and pay tribute. Not tribute, taxes. We're protecting you, you pay for it. <laughs> Whatever. Let me speak, Hardin. Your eminence, I don't give a damn for Anacreon, Smyrno, your local politics and petty wars. I tell you, this is a tax-free, state-supported institution. State-supported? 
But we are the state and we are not supporting. Your eminence, I am the direct representative of his, his august... august majesty, the emperor. I am the direct representative of the king of Anacreon, and Anacreon is a lot nearer, Dr. Perrin. Gentlemen, let's get back to business. Yeah, how would you take these so-called taxes, your eminence? Wheat, potatoes, vegetables, cattle? You're joking. Gold, of course. Chromium or vanadium would be even better if you had it. Chromium? Vanadium? We, we haven't even got iron. Here, take a look at our currency. What is it? Steel? That's right. I don't understand. The terminus is a planet practically without metals. We import it all. Well, you might pay with land. What do you mean? This world is just about empty and the unoccupied land is probably fertile. Could doubtless come to some mutually satisfactory agreement. Anacreon could supply us with plutonium for our atomic power plant. We have only a few years supply left. Harding, you have atomic power. Oh, certainly. Well, what's unusual in that? I imagine that atomic power is 50,000 years old now. Why shouldn't we have it? Except that it is a little difficult to get hold of plutonium. Yes. Yes. Uh, now, gentlemen, tomorrow I shall meet your board of trustees. For your own sakes, I would advise you to appraise them of the situation prior to my arrival. Should we not reach a mutually beneficial arrangement, I have to tell you that I shall return to Anacreon, and from then you will have precisely three months before I return with my troops, wanted or not. And now, if you'll excuse me, I wish you good night, gentlemen. He is insufferable. Not at all. Merely the product of his environment. What did you mean by all that talk about military bases and tribute? Are you mad? No, I merely gave him the opportunity to talk. You'll notice he managed to stumble out Anacreon's real intention. And naturally, I don't intend to let that happen. Don't you? And who the hell are you? And may I ask why you mentioned our atomic power plant? It's just the thing that would make us a military target. Yes, a military target to avoid. Isn't it obvious why I brought the subject up? It confirmed a very strong suspicion I have. What? That Anacreon no longer has atomic power. If they had, Roderick would have known the plutonium, except in ancient traditions, and used in power plants. And therefore it follows that the rest of the periphery no longer has it either. Certainly Smyrno hasn't. Or they would have defeated Anacreon in their last little encounter. Interesting. Back to oil and coal, are they? <laughs> Gentlemen, I think you all know our mayor, Salvo Hardin. Hardin, may I introduce the members of the board of trustees? Thomas Soot. Hardin. Njord Farah. Hardin. Lundin Krast. Hardin. And Yate Fulham. Hardin. Now then, gentlemen, I find it very gratifying to be able to inform the board that since our last meeting, I have received word that Lord Darwin, Chancellor of the Empire will arrive at Terminus in two weeks. It may be taken for granted that our relations with Anacreon will be smoothed out to our complete satisfaction as soon as the Emperor is informed of the situation. Leaving vague expressions out of account, what do you expect Lord Darwin to do? It is quite evident that Mayor Hardin is a professional cynic. <laughs> ah, he can scarcely fail to realize that the Emperor would be most unlikely to allow his personal rights to be infringed. Why? What would he do if they were? Yeah, I'd like to ask a question. Besides this stroke of diplomacy, has anything been done to meet the Anacreonian menace? Oh, you see a menace there, do you? Don't you? Well, hardly. The Emperor... Is what is this? Be... Every once in a while, someone mentions... Emperor or empire, as if they were magic words. The emperor is 50,000 parsecs away, and I doubt whether he gives a damn about us. No. We have to fight with guns, <laughs> not words. Yes. We've had two months' grace so far, mainly because we've given Anacreon the idea that we have atomic weapons, which, as we all know, isn't true. It's all very well to drag chancellors into this, but it'd be much nicer to drag in a few great big siege guns armed with atomic warheads. No, no, I agree are, with that. I mean, we... Building armaments would mean withdrawing men from the encyclopedia. Mm. That cannot be done, come what may. Very true. Agreed. The encyclopedia first, always. Why, in five years' time, we shall be publishing the first volume. 
Nothing must be allowed to interfere with that. Has it ever occurred to this board that it's just possible that Terminus may have interests other than the encyclopedia? You don't understand the situation. There's a good million of us here. And not more than 150,000 are working directly on the encyclopedia. To the rest of us, this is home. We were born here. We're living here. Compared with our homes, our farms, our factories, the encyclopedia means little to us. We want them protected. The encyclopedia first. Mm. We have a mission to fulfill. That might have been true 50 years ago, but there is a new generation. That has nothing to do with it. We are scientists. You are not scientists. You're clerks, no, no, classifying no, no, the work of scientists of the last no, millennium. No, have you ever thought of extending their knowledge? No. You're quite happy to stagnate like the rest of the galaxy. That's why we have revolts, breakdown of communications, loss of atomic power. The whole galaxy is crumbling to bits. I don't know. What you're trying to gain by your hysterical statements, Hardy. Certainly you're adding nothing constructive to the discussion. Haven't we forgotten something, gentlemen? What? In a month, we celebrate our 50th anniversary. Why not, it? On that anniversary, Hardy Selden's vault will open. Have you ever considered what might be in the vault? I don't know. Routine matters, a stock speech of congratulations... I don't think any great significance need be placed on the vault. Mm. Ah, so but perhaps you're wrong. Doesn't it strike you that the vault is opening at a very convenient time? A very inconvenient time, you mean? We have other things to worry about. Other things more important than a message from Harry Selden? I think not. The encyclopedia was very dear to his heart, you know. Well, yes, yes, true, true. True. Mr. Mayor, hmm. what do you think of the vault? I don't know, Father. I really don't know. Ah, Lord Darwin, there you are. Ah, Harding, you were looking for us, no doubt. A great achievement, this encyclopedia of yours, Harding. Thank you, my lord. The section on archaeology is marvellous, truly marvellous. Uh, you're not by any chance interested in archaeology yourself, are you, Harding? No, my lord, I can't say I am. Oh, pity, it's a fascinating subject. I've done an awful amount of work in the science, extremely well read, in fact. I've gone through all of them. Jordan, Ovid Jesse, Lamoth, now Lamoth, for instance. He presents a new and most interesting addition to my knowledge of the origin question. He tries to show that archaeological remains on the third planet of the Arcturian system show that humanity existed there before there were any indications of space travel. Really? <laughs> But I must read it closely and weigh the evidence before I can say for certain. Why not go to Arcturus and study the remains for yourself? Whatever for, my dear fellow? <laughs> to get the information first-hand, of course. Uh, but where's the necessity? It seems an uncommonly roundabout way of getting anywhere. How insufferably crude it would be to go to Arcturus and blunder about when the old masters have covered the ground so much more effectively than we could possibly hope to do. I see my lord, may I ask you a question? Oh, certainly, my dear fellow. Only too happy to be of service. My store of knowledge is small. Well, it isn't I... exactly about archaeology, my lord. Oh, well, never mind. Uh, what is it? Well, last year we received news here on Terminus of an explosion of a power plant on Planet 5 of Gamma Andromeda. Uh, yes. We got only the barest details of the accident. I wonder if you could tell me exactly what happened. Well, there isn't very much to tell. The plant exploded. It was quite a catastrophe, you know. I believe several million people were killed and at least half the planet was laid in ruins. Yes, but what was wrong with the plant? Uh, well, really, who knows? It, it had broken down some years previously, and it's thought that the replacements and repair work were inferior. It's so difficult to get technicians now who really understand these things. You realize that the independent powers of the periphery have lost atomic power altogether? I'm not at all surprised. Barbarous planet. Oh, but my dear fellow, you mustn't call them independent. They aren't, you know. They acknowledge the sovereignty of the Empire. They'd have to, of course, or we wouldn't treat with them. Well, that may be so, but they have considerable freedom of action. Yes, I suppose so, but that scarcely matters. The Empire's far better off with the periphery thrown upon its own resources. They're no good to us, you see. Barbarous planets. Quite uncivilized. Uh, 
Lee, this can't go on. This incredible vacillation on the part of the board of trustees. Not one of them seems capable of making a rational decision. And as for Lord Darwin, if they really think that either he or the word of the Empire count for anything, they must be even more insular than I suspected. Lord Darwin is a very accomplished diplomat. Precisely. Look, Lee, will you do something for me? What? Take these microtapes and have them subjected to a thorough analysis by symbolic logic. Can you do that? Yes. What do they contain? You'll see. Very well. When do you want the analysis? Tomorrow morning, when I meet the board. What will you say to them? That depends upon the result of the analysis. But if these tapes contain what I think they do, then I shall have no alternative but to assume power myself. Hardin, you're going to stage a coup and force the board of trustees out? No, Lee, not force them out. Simply supersede them. Someone has to have sole power when the crunch comes, and I'm better equipped than anyone else. Are you with me? Yes, Hardin, I'm with you. So, gentlemen, it turned out we didn't have much time after all. Lord Roderick gave us three months, but little as it was, we threw it away, unused. And this new Anacreonian ultimatum gives us one week. What do we do now? There must be a loophole. It is absolutely unbelievable that they would push matters to extremities in the face of what Lord Darwin has assured us regarding the attitude of the Emperor and the Empire. I see. You have, of course, informed the King of Anacreon of this uh, alleged attitude? I have, after having placed the proposal to the board for a vote and having received unanimous consent. And when did this vote take place? I don't believe that I am answerable to you in any way, Mayor Hardin. All right. I'm not that vitally interested. It's just my opinion that it was your diplomatic transmission of Lord Darwin's valuable contribution to the situation that was the direct cause of this friendly little ultimatum. And just how do you arrive at that remarkable conclusion, Mr. Mayor? Quite simply, common sense. You see, there's a branch of human knowledge known as symbolic logic, which can be used to prune away all sorts of dead wood that clutters up human language. What about it? I applied it. Among other things, I applied it to this document here. I didn't really need to for myself because I knew what it was all about. But I think I can explain it more easily to five scientists by symbols rather than words. This message from Anacreon was a simple problem, naturally. The men who wrote it were men of action rather than men of words. It boils down quite simply to the straightforward and unqualified statement, you give us what we want within a week, or we beat the hell out of you and take it anyway. No loophole there, is there, Dr. Perel? There doesn't seem to be. All right. Before you now, you see a copy of the treaty between the Empire and the Nacre. As you see, gentlemen, something like 90% of the treaty cancels out in the analysis. And what we end up with can be described in the following interesting manner. Obligation of Anacreon to the Empire? None. Powers of the Empire over Anacreon? None. That seems to be correct. <clears throat> you admit, then, that the treaty is nothing but a total declaration of independence on the part of Anacreon and a recognition of that status by the Empire? It seems so. And do you suppose that Anacreon doesn't realize that? That it would naturally tend to resent any appearance of threats from the Empire? particularly when it's evident that the Empire is powerless to carry out any such threats, or it would never have allowed independence. But then, how would you account for Lord Darwin's assurances of Empire support? You know, that's the most interesting part of the whole business. I thought his lordship an absolute ass when I first met him, but it turns out he was actually a most accomplished diplomat and a very clever man. I took the liberty of recording all his statements, and then I took them and had them analysed. And after I'd succeeded in eliminating all the meaningless statements, vague gibberish and useless qualifications, I found I had nothing left. Hmm? Everything cancelled out. 
Lord Darwin, in five days of discussion, didn't say one damn thing. We have one week left. What do we do now? It seems that we have no choice but to allow Anacreon to establish military bases on Terminus. I agree with you there. But what do we do towards kicking them off again at the first available opportunity? That sounds as if you've made up your mind that violence must be used against them. Violence is the last refuge of the incompetent. But I certainly don't intend to put out the welcome mat and dust off the best furniture for them. I still don't like the way you put that. It is a dangerous attitude. Our policy has but one cardinal principle. And that is the encyclopedia. Whatever we decide to do or not to do will be decided because it will be the measure required to keep that encyclopedia safe. Then you have come to the conclusion that we must continue our intensive campaign of doing nothing. You have demonstrated that the Empire cannot help us, though how it can be so, I don't understand. If compromise... There is no compromise. Don't you realize that all this talk about military bases is utter nonsense? We've gone quite far enough, I think. There seems no point in concealing that the board came to the decision that the real solution to the Anacreonian problem lies in what is to be revealed to us when the vault opens in six days from now. We are to do nothing, is that right, except to wait in quiet serenity and utter faith for the deus ex machina to pop out of the vault? Stripped of your emotional physiology, that is correct. Such subtle escapism. Really, Dr. Farrar, such folly smacks of genius. Would it surprise you to hear that I have given the matter considerable thought these last few weeks? With what result? With the result that pure deduction is found wanting. What is needed is a little sprinkling of common sense. For instance? Seldom foresaw the Anacreonian threat. Why did he not have us placed in some other planet, nearer the galactic center? Why put us here, on Terminus? If he could see in advance the break in communication, our isolation from the Empire, the threat of our neighbors. If he could foresee the problem then, we should be able to find the solution now. But how did we come? But you haven't tried. You haven't tried once. First you refused to admit that there was a menace at all, and then you reposed a blind faith in the Emperor. Now you've shifted it to Harley Seldon. Throughout, you've invariably relied either on authority or on the past, never on yourselves, and that's wrong. We sit here considering the encyclopedia the be-all and end-all. We consider the greatest end of science is the classification of past data. It's important, Phil, is there no further work to be done? We're receding and forgetting. Here in the periphery, they've lost atomic power. In Gamma Andromeda, a power plant's blown up because of poor repairs. The chance of the Empire complains that atomic technicians are scarce on the solution? To train new ones? Never. Instead, they're to restrict atomic power. Don't you see it's a worship of the past? It's a deterioration? Stagnation? Well, philosophy isn't going to help us. Let us be concrete. Do you deny that Hardy Seldon could easily have worked out historical trends of the future by simple psychological technique? No, of course not. But we must rely on him for a solution. At best, he might indicate the problem. But if ever there's to be a solution, we must work it out ourselves. What do you mean, indicate the problem? We know the problem. You think you do. You think Anacreon is all that Hardy Seldon is likely to be worried about. I disagree. I tell you, gentlemen, that as yet none of you has the faintest conception of what is really going on. Now, look, there must be no hesitation. Do you understand that, Lee? Hmm. No time to allow them to grasp the situation. Once we're in a position to give orders, give them as they were born to do so, and they'll obey you out of habit. But if the board remained irresolute... After even... tomorrow, their position in the affairs of Terminus won't exist. You know, it's strange that they've done nothing to stop us so far. You say they weren't entirely in the dark. Father stumbled at the edges of the problem. And Perenne's been suspicious of me ever since I was elected. But you see, they never had the capacity of understanding what was really going on. Their whole training has been authoritarian. They're sure that the Emperor, just because he is the Emperor, is all-powerful. They're sure that the Board of Trustees acting in the name of the Emperor cannot be in a position where it cannot give the orders. And that incapacity to recognize the possibility of revolt is our greatest ally. They're not bad fellows, Lee. You're when they stick in the encyclopedia. And we'll see to it that that's where they do stick in the future. They're hopelessly incompetent when it comes to ruling Terminus. Anyway, you'd better go and start things rolling. Tomorrow in the time vault, we'll know what to expect. <laughs>
What's the time? About half a minute to go. Quiet. The lights are going out. Yes. I am Harry Seldon. I can't see you, so I can't greet you properly. If any of you are standing, please sit down. It is 50 years now since this foundation was established, 50 years in which the members of the foundation have been ignorant of what it was they were working towards. It was necessary that they be ignorant, but now that necessity is gone. The encyclopedia is, and always has been, a fraud. It is a fraud in the sense that neither I nor my colleagues care at all whether a single volume of the encyclopedia is ever published. In the 50 years that you have worked on this fraudulent project, your retreat has been cut off and you now have no choice but to proceed on the infinitely more important project that was, and is, our real plan. From now on, and into the centuries, the path that you must take is inevitable. You will be faced with a series of crises, as you are now faced with the first. And in each case, your freedom of action will become circumscribed so that you will be forced along one and only one path, the path which our psychology has worked out. Somewhere in the 50 years just past is where the historians of the future will place an arbitrary line and say, this marks the fall of the galactic empire. After this fall will come inevitable barbarism a period which psychohistory tells us should last for 30,000 years. We cannot stop the fall, but we can shorten the period of barbarism. The ins and outs of that shortening we cannot tell you, just as we could not tell you the truth about the Foundation 50 years ago. Had you known the truth, your knowledge would have extended, your freedom of action expanded, and the additional variables would have been more than our psychology could handle. But this I can tell you. Terminus and its companion foundation at the other end of the galaxy are to be the seeds and founders of the Second Galactic Empire. And it is the present crisis that is starting Terminus off towards that climax. This, by the way, a rather straightforward crisis, much simpler than many of those that are ahead. Action is forced on you. The nature of that action, that is the solution to your dilemma, is of course obvious. But whatever course your future history may take, impress it always upon your descendants that the path has been marked out and that at its end, is a new and greater empire. You were right, it seems, Hardin. The Anacreonians will be here tomorrow. If you will see us tonight at six, the board will consult with you as to the next move. Encyclopedia Galactica, 116th edition, entry. Board of Governors subscript. Sergeant Harding's foresight meant that Lee's men were already in control and the board was giving orders no longer. And in six months, the Anacreonian invaders were also not giving orders. The solution to this first Selden crisis had been obvious. This was the beginning of the great line of the mayors.
Title, Foundation. Foundation and Empire, Second Foundation. Author, Isaac Asimov. Audio adaptation, Patrick Tal. Part number one. Title, Foundation. Foundation and Empire, Second Foundation. Author, Isaac Asimov. Part number two. Part title, The Mayors. Encyclopedia Galactica, 116th edition. Entry, The Four Kingdoms. The name given to those portions of the province of Anacreon, which broke away from the First Empire in the early days of the Foundation era to form independent and short-lived kingdoms. The largest and most powerful of these was Anacreon itself. Undoubtedly, the most interesting aspect of the Four Kingdoms involved the strange society forced temporarily upon it during the administration of Salvor Hardin. Better come in, Lee. I need one person on my side of the fence. I don't see why we need waste time with them. They can't do anything until the next election. Legally, anyway. That gives us a year. Give them a brush off. Lee, you'll never learn. In the 30 years I've known you, you've never once learned the gentle art of sneaking up from behind. <laughs> Not my way of fighting. Yes, I know that. I suppose... That's why you're the one man I trust. I've come a long way since we engineered the coup against the encyclopedists. Mm. Getting old. Fifty-two. Do you ever think how fast those twenty years went? Oh, I don't feel old. And I'm fifty-six. Yes, but I don't have your digestion. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're here. How will you see them? Here. Oh, you're making them too important. Why go through all the ceremonies of an official mayor's audience? I'm getting too old for all that red tape. Besides which, flattery is useful when you're dealing with youngsters, particularly when it doesn't commit you to anything. Uh, sit down, Lee. Uh, Give me your moral backing. Uh, I'll need it with this young fellow, Sir Max. Sir Max's dangerous, Harding. He's got quite a following. Don't underestimate him. Have I ever underestimated anybody? Well, then, have him arrested. You can charge him with something later. Uh. Here they are. Ah, oh, come in, gentlemen. Councilman Sir Mac, I've been anxious to see you ever since your very excellent speech last month. Your attack on the foreign policy of this government was a most capable one. Your interest honours me. The attack may or may not have been capable, but it was certainly justified. Perhaps. You're entitled to your opinions, of course. Still, you are rather young. It is a fault that most people are guilty of at some point in their lives. <laughs> you became mayor of the city when you were two years younger than I am now. Yeah, I take it that you've come to see me now about the same foreign policy that annoyed you so greatly in the council chamber. Are you speaking for your colleagues, or must I listen to each of you separately? I speak for the people of Terminus, who are not truly represented in the rubber stamp body called the council. I see. Go ahead. It comes to this, Mr. Mayor. We are dissatisfied... By we? Uh, I take it you mean the people? I believe that my views represent the majority of the voters on Terminus. Yes. yes, yes. Does that suit you? Well, a statement like that's always the better for proof, but uh, continue. You are dissatisfied? Yes. We are dissatisfied with the policy which for 20 years has been stripping Terminus defenseless against the inevitable attack from outside. I see. Therefore, it's nice of you to anticipate. And therefore, we are forming a new political party. One that will stand for the immediate needs of Terminus, and not for some mystic manifest destiny of future empire. We are going to throw you and your clique out of City Hall. Unless? There's always an unless, you know. Not much of one in this case. Unless you resign now. I'm not asking you to change your policies. 
I wouldn't trust you that far. Your promises are worth nothing. An outright resignation is all we'll take. I see. That's your ultimatum. Well, nice of you to give me warning. But you see, I rather think that I shall ignore it. Don't think it was a warning, Mr. Mayor. It was an announcement of principles and action. The new party has already been formed, and it will begin its official activities tomorrow. There is neither room nor desire for compromise. And frankly, it was only our recognition of your services to the city that induced us to offer you the easy way out. I didn't think you'd take it, but now my conscience is clear. The next election will be a more forcible and quite irresistible reminder that resignation is necessary. Good morning. Now hold on! Sit down. In exactly what way do you want our foreign policy change? I mean, do you want us to attack the four kingdoms now, at once, simultaneously? It is our simple proposition that all appeasement must cease immediately. Throughout your administration, you have carried out a policy of scientific aid to the kingdoms. You have given them atomic power. You have helped rebuild power plants on their territories. You have established medical clinics, chemical laboratories, and factories. Well, what's your objection? You have done this in order to stop them attacking us. With these as bribes, you have been playing a colossal game of blackmail, in which you have allowed Terminus to be sucked dry, with the result that we are now at the mercy of these barbarians. In what way? Because you have given them power, given them weapons, actually serviced the ships of their navies, they are infinitely stronger than they were two decades ago. Their demands are increasing, and with their new weapons, they will eventually satisfy all their demands at once by violent annexation of Terminus. Isn't that the way that blackmail usually ends? Of course. And your remedy? Stop the bribes immediately, while you still can. Spend your effort in strengthening Terminus itself, and attack first. Are you finished? For a moment. Well then, do you notice the maxim on the wall behind me? Violence is the last refuge of the incompetent. An old man's doctrine, Mr. Mayor. I applied it as a young man, Mr. Councilman, and successfully. You were probably busy being born when it happened, but perhaps you may have read something of it when you were at school. Anacreon then, as now, the most powerful of the four kingdoms, demanded and actually established a military base upon Terminus. And the then rulers of the city, the encyclopedists, knew very well that this was only a preliminary to taking over the entire planet. That is how matters stood when I... uh, Assumed uh, actual government. Well, what would you have done? Well, that's an academic question. Of course, I know what you did. But perhaps you don't get the point. The temptation was great to muster what force we could put up a fight. And what I did instead was to visit the three other kingdoms one by one, point out to each that to allow the secret of atomic power to fall into the hands of Anacreon was the quickest way of cutting their own throats and suggest gently that they do the obvious thing, that was all. One month after the Anacreonian force had landed on Terminus, their king received an ultimatum from his three neighbors, and in seven days, the last Anacreonian was off Terminus. Now tell me, where was the need for violence? I fail to see the analogy. You still seem unable to grasp the fundamental necessities of our position. Our problems weren't over with the departure of the Anacreonians. They'd just begun. The four kingdoms were more our enemies than ever, for each wanted atomic power, and each was kept off our throats only for fear of the other three. We were balanced on the point of a very sharp sword. The slightest sway in any direction, if, for instance, one kingdom becomes too strong, or if two form a coalition, You understand? Certainly. That was the time to begin all-out preparations for war. That was the time to begin all-out prevention of war. I played them one against the other. I helped each in turn. I offered them science, trade, education, medicine. I made Terminus more valuable to them as a flourishing world than as a military prize. It has worked for 20 years. Yes. But you were forced to surround these scientific gifts with the most outrageous mummery. You've made half religion, half boulder dash out of it. You've erected a hierarchy of priests and complicated, meaningless ritual. What of it? I started that way at first because the barbarians looked upon our science as a sort of magical sorcery. It was easier to get them to accept it on that basis. It's a minor matter. But these priests are in charge of the power plants. 
That's not a minor matter. True, but we've trained them. Their operational knowledge is purely empirical. And they have a firm belief in the mummery that surrounds them. But if someone breaks through the mummery, what is to prevent him learning actual techniques and selling out to the most satisfactory bidder? What price our value of the kingdoms then? No chance of that, sir. The best men on the planets of the kingdoms are sent here to Terminus each year and are educated into the priesthood. And the best of these remain here as research students. If you think that those who return with a distorted knowledge the priests receive can penetrate a bound to atomic power, <laughs> you have a very romantic and foolish idea of science. Mr. Mayor, a message for you. Thank you. Set it up on the scanner. In short, gentlemen, the government is of the opinion that it knows what it is doing. Thank you. Clear the message. And that, gentlemen, concludes the interview. Thank you for coming. do you think he'll go? I'm not sure. But treat him with kid gloves and he's quite liable to win the next election just as he says. Oh, quite likely. Very likely. If nothing happens first. Sir Mac has a following. What if he doesn't wait until the next election? There was a time when you and I put things through violently despite your slogan about what violence is. Ours was a necessary measure put through at the proper moment and went over smoothly, painlessly and all but effortlessly. As for Sermak, he's up against a different proposition. You and I, Lee, aren't the encyclopedists. <laughs> we stand prepared. However, put your men onto these uh, youngsters in a nice way. Yeah, don't let them know they're being watched. <laughs> Sermak and his men have been under surveillance for a month now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> By the way, Ambassador Verisov is returning from Anacreon. Was that the message? Yes. Are things breaking already? I don't know. I can't tell until I've heard what Verisov has to say. They may be, though. What are you looking so worried about? Because I don't know how it's going to turn out. You're too deep, Hardin. And you're playing the game too close to your chest. <laughs> and how was the trip, Verisov? Interesting. There was a priest in the next cabin who, on his way here, to take a course in the preparation of radioactive synthetics for the treatment of cancer. Surely he didn't call it radioactive synthetics? <laughs> Certainly not. To him it was the holy food. <laughs> he inveigled me into a theological discussion. and did his level best to elevate me out of my sordid materialism. Well, I never recognized his own high priest. Without my crimson robe? <laughs> Besides, he was a Smyrnian. It was an interesting experience there. It's remarkable, Hart, in how the religion of science has caught on. Uh, I've written an essay on the subject. Really? Well, I'm sorry, it's my own amusement. It wouldn't do to have it published. Treating the problem sociologically, it would seem that when the old empire began to rot at the fringes, science, as science, failed the outer world. To be re-accepted, it would have to present itself in another guise, and it has done just that. Oh, it works out beautifully when you use symbolic logic to help out. Interesting. Now, what about the situation on Anacreon? Bad. Obviously. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Mm. Here's the position. The key man on Anacreon is the Prince Regent Vinus. He's King Lepo's uncle. I know. But Lepo is coming of age soon, isn't he? Yes, if he lived. His father died under suspicious circumstances. A needle bullet through the chest during a hunt. It was called an accident. Yes. I remember Vinus when I was on Anacreon, or before your time. But let's see now. If I remember, he was a dark young man. Black hair and a squint in his right eye. And he had a hooked nose. <laughs> That's him. The hook and the squint are still there, but his hair's grey now. He plays the game dirty. Luckily, he's the most egregious fool on the planet. But he has unlimited self-confidence. 
Probably an overcompensated inferiority complex. Younger sons of royalty get that way, you know. That amounts to the same thing. He's foaming at the mouth with eagerness to attack the foundation. Scarcely troubles to conceal it. And he's in a position to do it, too, from the standpoint of armament. The old king built up a magnificent navy. And Vinus hasn't been exactly sleeping the last couple of years. All right, then. I've got the background. What has actually happened? Well, two weeks ago, an Anacreonian merchant ship came across a derelict cruiser of the old Imperial Navy. It must have been drifting in space for at least three centuries. Yes, I heard about it. The Board of Navigation has sent me a petition asking me to obtain the ship for the purposes of study. It's in good condition, I understand. In entirely good condition. When Vinus received your suggestion last week that he turn the ship over to the Foundation, he almost had convulsion. Hasn't answered. He won't, except with guns. You see, he came to me on the day I left Anacreon and requested that the Foundation put this battle cruiser into fighting order and turn it over to the Anacreonian Navy. He had the infernal gall to say that your note of last week indicated a plan of the Foundation to attack Anacreon. Oh. He said that a refusal to repair the cruiser would only confirm his suspicions and indicated that measures for the self-defense of Anacreon would be forced upon him. Of course, he expects a refusal. And that would be a perfect excuse in his eyes for a beaded attack. Well, we have at least six months to spare. So have the ship fixed up, presented with my compliments. Have it renamed the Vinus as a mark of our esteem and affection. <laughs> I suppose it's a logical step. I'm still worrying. What about? That ship's cubic capacity is half again that of the entire Anacreonian Navy. It's got atomic power blasts capable of blowing up a planet and a shield that can take a cube beam without working up radiation. Superficial, very soft. Superficial. You and I both know that the armament Vinus has now could defeat Terminus. Long before we could repair the cruiser for our own use. Well, what does it matter then if we give him the cruiser as well? You know it won't ever come to actual war. Well, I suppose not, but... Look, <clears throat> this isn't anything to do with me, I know. But I've been watching the Visicasts. What's all this about a group of councilmen forming a new political party? Oh, look, Harley, I know that you're in better touch with internal matters than I am. But they're attacking you with everything short of physical violence. How strong are they? Strong? Probably control the council after the next election. Not before. There are ways of gaining control besides election. Who do you take me for? Vinus? No, but repairing the ship will take months. And an attack after that is certain. The addition of the Imperial cruiser will just about double the strength of their navy. They're bound to attack. So why take chances? Either reveal the plan of campaign to the council, or force the issue with Anacreon now. That's the one thing I mustn't do. There's hardly Selden and a plan, you know. I'm absolutely sure, then, that there is a plan. Well, there can scarcely be any doubt. Now, I was present at the opening of the time vault, and Selden's recording revealed it then. No, I didn't mean that, Harley. I just don't see how it could be possible to chart history for a thousand years ahead. Maybe Selden overestimated himself. Well, I'm no psychologist. Exactly. None of us are. But I did receive some elementary training in my youth, enough to know what psychology is capable of, even if I can't exploit his capabilities myself. There is no doubt that Selden did what he claims to have done. Well, everybody knows the way things are supposed to go, but can we afford to take chances? Can we risk the present for the sake of a, of a nebulous future? We must, because the future isn't nebulous. It's been calculated by Selden and charted. He said in the time vault that at each crisis our freedom of action will become circumscribed to the point where only one course of action was possible. So as to keep us on the straight and narrow? Yes. But conversely, so long as more than one course of action is possible, the crisis has not been reached. We must let things drift so long as we possibly can. And that's what I intend doing. I would rather not have told you about this. Why not? Because there are now six people... You and I, the other three ambassadors, and Johan Lee, who have a fair notion of what's ahead. And I'm certain it was Selden's idea to have no one know. Why, sir? Because Selden wanted us to proceed blindly, according to the law of mob psychology. As I once told you, I never knew where we were heading when I drove out the Anacreonians. My idea had been to maintain the balance of power, no more than that. It was only afterwards that I thought I saw a pattern in events. 
But I've done my level best not to act on that notch. Action due to foresight would have interfered with the plan. Then how do you expect to spot the right moment for action? It's spotted already. You admit that once we repair the battle cruiser, nothing will stop Vinus from attacking us? There will no longer be any alternative in that respect? Yes. All right. That accounts for the external aspect. You'll further admit that the next election will see a new and hostile council that will force action against Anacreon? There is no alternative there? No. So, as soon as the alternatives disappear, the crisis has come. I see. This... One thing that worries me, I've got the idea, it's just a notion, that the external and internal pressures were planned to come to a head simultaneously. As it is, there's a few months' difference. Vinus will probably attack in six months, but the elections are still a year off. Is six months' difference that important? I don't know. Anyway, there's one thing I have decided. What's that? When the crisis does begin to break, I'm going to be on an acrium. <laughs> Climbing to the sun and over. I catch him under the wing. Got him. Up he goes. Have a dive. Will he dive? Yes, here he comes. And. Got him! Thank you. I think that makes uh, 46. Correct, Your Majesty. Perhaps 50 before you come of age. 50 Nyaks before... Leffel, come back to the palace immediately. One of the more important things than Nyak hunting now. But, Uncle... Do as I say. <laughs> so important. I've been to the ship. What ship? There is only one ship. The one the Foundation is repairing for the Navy. The old Imperial cruiser. Do I make myself sufficiently plain? Oh, that one. You see, I told you the Foundation would repair it if we asked them to. It was all poppycock, you know, that story of yours about them wanting to attack us. The you a fool. Well, now, look here. I don't think you ought to call me that. You forget yourself. I'll be of age in two months, you know. <laughs> and you're in a fine state to assume regal responsibilities. If you spent half the time on public affairs that you spent on hunting, I'd resign the regency now, and with a clear conscience. Well, I don't care. That has nothing to do with the case. The fact is that even though you are my uncle and the regent, I'm still the king. You oughtn't to call me a fool, and you oughtn't to sit in my presence. You haven't asked my permission. <sighs> uh, may I refer to you as your majesty? Yes. Very well. You're a fool, Your Majesty. Oh, I'm sorry, Leopold. I shouldn't have spoken harshly. But I know that your youthful spirits are impatient of the dry detail of statecraft. Well, that's all right. However, you will come of age in two months. Moreover, in the difficult times of the coming, you'll have to take a full and active part. You will be king henceforward, Leopold. Yes, Uncle. There will be war, Leopold. War? There's been a truce with Smyrna. Not there? with Smyrna. With the foundation itself. But, the Uncle, they've agreed to repair the ship. You said... So. Level. There is to be war with the foundation, whether the ship is repaired or not. The foundation is the source of all power and might. All the greatness of Anacreon. Its ships, its cities, its people, its commerce. Depends on the dribbles and leavings of power that the foundation has given us. It seems to me we should be great. Grateful? Lepo? You will be king of Anacreon. Your children may be the kings of the universe if you have the power that the Foundation is keeping from us. Hmm, there's something in that. After all, what right have they to keep it to themselves? It's not fair, you know. Anacreon counts for something, too. Ah, it seems that you're beginning to understand. And now, my boy, what if Smyrno decides to attack the Foundation on its own part and thus gains all the power? How long do you think we could escape becoming a vassal state? How long would you hold on to your throne? You're absolutely right, you know. We must strike first. It's simply self-defense. When do we strike? Not immediately. First, we must wait for the repairs of the battle cruiser to be completed. The mere fact that they're willing to undertake them 
uh, proves that they fear us. The fools attempt to placate us. Uh, but we are not to be turned from our path, are we? Not while I'm king of Anacreon. Besides which, we must wait for Salva Hardin to arrive. Salva Hardin? Yes, Lippo. The leader of the foundation is coming to Anacreon himself for your birthday. Salva Hardin? Are you afraid of the name? It's the same Salva Hardin who on his previous visit ground our noses into the dust. You're not forgetting that deadly insult to the royal house from a common? Well, no. I, I won't forget. We'll pay him back. But I'm afraid a little... Afraid? Of what? Of what? It would be sort of um, blasphemous to attack the Foundation. Oh. I mean, if there really were a galactic spirit... Oh. Well, it might like it, don't you think? No, I don't. And so you really bother your head a great deal over the galactic spirit, do you? You've been listening to Beresov. Well, he did explain a great deal. About the galactic spirit? Yes. <laughs> Why, he believes in that mummery a good deal less than I do. And I don't believe in it at all. How many times have you been told that all this talk is just nonsense? Well, I know that, but Beresov... Beresov says... says... Damnation to Beresov! It's nonsense! Everyone believes it just the same. About the prophet Harry Seldon and how he appointed the foundation to carry on his commandments that there might someday be a return to the earthly paradise and how anyone who disobeys his commandments will be destroyed for eternity. They believe in it. I presided at festivals. I'm sure they do. Yes, they do. But we don't. According to them, you are king by divine right and are semi-divine yourself. Very handy. It eliminates all possibilities of revolts and ensures absolute obedience in everything. And that is why, Leopold, you must take an active part in ordering the war against the Foundation. I am only regent and quite human. You are king and more than half a god. Am I? No, not really. But you are to everyone but the people of the Foundation. Once they're out of the way, there'll be no one to deny you the godhead. And after that, will we ourselves be able to operate the power boxes of the temples uh, and the ships that fly without men uh, and the holy food that cures cancer and all the rest? I mean, very soft, said Very soft, Ed. Very soft, Mr. Silverhardin, is your greatest enemy. Stick with me, Leffold. Don't worry about them. Together we will recreate the empire. Not just the kingdoms of Anacreon, but one comprising every one of the billions of sons of the galaxy. That better than their earthly paradise? Yes. Can Beresov promise more? No. Very well. Ah, I suppose that we may consider the matter settled, Your Majesty. Now get along. I'll be done later. Oh, just one thing, Lippo. Uh, yes, Uncle? Uh, do be careful when you're out hunting. Since your father's unfortunate accident, I have the strangest presentiments. You will be careful, I hope. And uh, you'll... Uh, do as I say about the foundation, won't you? Yes, certainly. Good. Gentlemen, may I present Louis Hort. Hort, this is Doko Vato. How do you do? And this is Len Taki. How are you? Delighted to meet you both. Now do sit down. Uh, you both know how active Hort has been within the party. Yes, of course. Uh, what you don't know is that for the last six months he has been on an acrium seeing what he can find out. I don't have a rosy report for you. In fact, I'm afraid our position is a lost cause. You think so? It's gone past Fort Summit. There's no room for any other opinion. Why? It's the attitude of the people. My original idea was to foster some sort of palace rebellion and install as king someone more favorable to the foundation. Unfortunately, that's impossible. And Salvor Hardin has seen to that. How do you mean? The religion that Hardin and the Foundation has established works. All you see here is a large training school for the priesthood that occasionally puts on a special show for the pilgrims. But that's all. The whole business hardly affects us. But on Anacreon... What kind of religion is it? Hardin's always said that it was just to get them to accept our science without question. Hardin's explanations don't always mean much at face value, Tarkin. Ethically, morally, it's fine. It scarcely varies from the philosophies of the old empire. But that's not all. It's built on strictly authoritarian lines, and the priesthood has sole control over the instruments we have given Anacreon. 
They believe in this religion entirely and in the or, spiritual value of the power they handle. They form a hierarchy, at the apex of which is the king, who is regarded as a sort of minor god. He's an absolute monarch, and the people believe it completely, as do the priests. You can't overthrow a king like that. Now, hold on, hold on. You've said that Hardin has done all this. How? The Foundation has fostered this delusion. We've put all our scientific backing behind this hoax with the side effect that Hardin himself is virtually a god to the Anacreonians. And he's, uh, he's semi-holy, uh, above even their high priest. Oh, what? Well, it's not doing there. Is he blind too? There was a time when he was a convinced actor. I don't know what he's doing. He's, he's high priest to them. But he seems to be a figurehead. There's something odd about it all. Is Hardin such a fool? Seems to be. Uh, there's something wrong. To cut our own throats so thoroughly and so hopelessly would require colossal stupidity. On the one hand, to establish a religion that would wipe out all chance of internal troubles, and on the other, to arm them. I don't see it. The matter is a little obscure, but the facts are there. What else can we think? Outright treason. He's in their pay. No, I don't see that either. Tell me, Bort, did you hear anything about a battle cruiser that the Foundation is supposed to have put into shape for the use of the Anacreonian Navy? No. The Navy Yards are religious sanctuaries. No one ever hears anything about the fleet. Well... Rumours have leaked out. Some of the party have brought the matter up in council, and Hardin never denied it. It might have significance. It's all of a piece with the rest. If true, it's absolutely crazy. He must have something. Some some secret weapon. <laughs> yes, a huge jack-in-the-box that will leap out at the psychological moment and scare Vinus to death. <laughs> if we have to rely on a secret weapon, we might as well blow ourselves out of existence here and now and save ourselves the agony of suspense. Then what it boils down to is this. Gorse, how much time do we have? I don't know. They never mention the Foundation. The entire media are given over to the approaching celebrations. Uh, what celebrations? Leopold comes of age next week. Well, we have months, then. That gives us it time. It gives us no time at all. I've told you that the king is a god. Do you suppose that he has to carry on a campaign of propaganda to get his people into a fighting spirit? When the time comes, Leopold gives the order and the people fight. He may give the order tomorrow, for all I know. So that! What is it, Norath? What's happened? Hardin going to Anacreon. What? It's true. It was on the Visicaster just now. Oh, well, so. You're right. Hardin sold us out. That leaves us no choice. I'm going to ask the council tomorrow that Hardin be impeached. It's going to look bad, Hardin. They're going to say you're sneaking away. Let them. I've got to get to Anacreon. And I want to do it with the minimum of fuss. You know that Sir Mac called for your impeachment in the city council yesterday? He had a perfect right to do so. And nevertheless, his motion was defeated. Yes. By a majority of 22. And we counted on a minimum of 60. Oh. It was close. Very. And after the vote, 59 members of the Actionist Party walked out of the chamber. But not until Sir Mac had denounced you as a traitor. And said that the council had condoned your treason. But that the name of his party was not Actionist for nothing. Now, what does that sound like? Trouble. And now you're chasing off at daybreak like a criminal. You ought to face them, Hardin. And if you have to, declare martial law. Violence is the last refuge of, of the... the incompetent. Yes, I know. Twenty years ago, the time vault opened. On the 50th anniversary of the beginning of the Foundation. And Hardy Selden gave us our first idea of what was really going on. I remember. I was there. Well, that was during our first crisis. This is our second. And three weeks from today will be the 70th anniversary of the Foundation. Does that strike you as in any way significant? You mean he's coming again? Selden never said anything about returning, but it's of a piece for the whole plan. He's always done his best to keep all foreknowledge from us. And there's no way of telling whether the radium lock is set for further opening short of dismantling the vault. I've been there every anniversary since the first appearance, just on the off chance. He's never appeared. But this is the first time since then that there has been a crisis. Then he'll come. Maybe, I don't know. But this is what I want you to do. At today's session of the council, just after you announced that I'd left for Anacron, you will further announce officially that in three weeks' time there will be another highly seldom recording containing a message of the utmost importance regarding the recently successfully concluded crisis. That's very important. Thing. Right. Now, don't add anything, no matter how many questions you're asked. Will they believe it? Doesn't matter. It will confuse them, which is all I want. Between wondering if it's true and what I mean by it, if it isn't, they'll decide to postpone action at least until the vault opens. I'll be back considerably before then. 
Ah, here we are. Well, goodbye, Lee. Goodbye. I hate to leave you in the frying pan like this, but there's no one else I can trust. <laughs> Don't worry. Now, please, keep out of the fire. that it is a trifle noise. No, on the contrary, Your Highness. It's all extremely interesting. We have no comparable spectacles on television. No doubt. Well, would you care to come to my private chamber? Yes, to be able to fly. Glass of wine? Thank you. And here you are, honey. Thank you. Lepo the first, king of Anakwa. And soon to be emperor of the periphery. And further, who knows? The galaxy may even be reunited someday. Undoubtedly. By Anacreon. Why not? With the help of the Foundation, our scientific superiority over the rest of the periphery will be indisputable. Well, yes, except that, of course, the Foundation's bound to help any nation that requests scientific aid. Due to the high idealism of our government and the great moral purpose of our founder, Hari Seldon, we are unable to play favorites. But the galactic spirit helps those who help themselves. I quite understand that left to itself, the Foundation would never cooperate. Oh, I wouldn't say that. We repaired the Imperial Cruiser for you, even though my board of navigation wanted it for research purposes. <laughs> research purposes? Right. Yet you would not have repaired it if I had not threatened war. Oh, I don't know. I do. Look here, Hardin. You were on Anacreon once before. You were young then. We were both young. But even then we had entirely different ways of looking at things. You're what they call a man of peace, aren't you? I suppose I am. At least I consider violence an uneconomical way of attaining an end. Yes. Yeah. I've heard. For myself, I've always believed in carving a straight path to my objective and following that path. I've accomplished much that way and fully expect to accomplish much more. I know. I believe you're carving such a path for you and your children, considering the unfortunate death of the late king, your elder brother, and the present king's precarious state of health. He is in a precarious state of health, is he not? You might find it advisable, Hardin, to avoid certain subjects. You may feel that your position as mayor of Terminus gives you a certain license. But you are wrong. I'm not one to be frightened of words. It's been my philosophy of life that difficulties vanish when faced boldly. And I have never turned my back upon one yet. I don't doubt that. And what particular difficulty are you refusing to turn your back on at the present moment? The difficulty of persuading the Foundation to cooperate. <laughs> Your well, policy of peace has led you into making several very serious mistakes. Not everyone is as afraid of direct action as you are. For instance? For instance, you came to Anacreon alone and accompanied me to my chambers alone. And what's wrong with that? Nothing. Except that outside this room there are five armed guards ready to shoot. I don't think that you can leave. I, I have no desire to leave. Do you then fear me so much? I don't fear you at all. About this may serve to impress you with my determination. Or shall we call it a gesture? Mm -hmm. Call it what you please. I shall not concern myself over the incident, whatever you choose to call it. I'm sure that that attitude will change with time. But you have made another error, Hardy. A more serious one. It seems that the planet Terminus is almost wholly undefended. Naturally, what have we to fear? We threaten no one's interests and we serve all alike. Yet, while remaining defenseless, you allow us to arm ourselves with a navy which, since your donation of the Imperial Cruiser, is quite irresistible. Your Highness, you're wasting time. If you mean to declare war, in informing me of the fact, you will allow me to communicate with my government at once. Sit down, Hardy. 
I am not declaring war. And you are not communicating with your government. When the war is fought, not declared, are informed. The Foundation will be informed of it in due time by the atom blasters of the Anacreonian Navy. When will all this happen? The ships of the fleet left Anacreon exactly 50 minutes ago, at 2300 hours precisely. And the first shot will be fired as soon as they sight Terminus, which will be at noon tomorrow. You may consider yourself a prisoner of war. I am disappointed. Is that all? I would have thought that the moment of coronation, midnight, would have been the more logical time to have set the fleet in motion, but evidently you wanted to start the war while you were still regent. It would have been more dramatic the other way. What are you talking about? I've set my counterstroke for midnight. Short, not bluffing me. There's no counterstroke. If you're counting on the support of the other kingdoms, forget it. Their navies combined are no match for ours. I don't intend firing a shot. It's simply that the order was given a week ago that at midnight tonight the planet Anacreon goes under interdict. Interdict? Every priest in Anacreon is going on strike, unless I countermand the order. But I can't while I'm being held in communicado, nor do I wish to, even if I weren't. Do you realize, Your Highness, that an attack on the Foundation is nothing short of sacrilege of the highest order? Yeah. Say that nonsense for the mob. My dear Finess, whoever do you think I am saving it for? I imagine that for the last half hour, every temple in Anacreon has been the center of a mob listening to a priest exhorting them upon that very subject. There's not a man or woman upon an acrium that doesn't know that their government has launched a vicious, unprovoked attack upon the centre of their religion. You'd better go to the Grand Hall to watch events. Yeah, I'll be quite safe here with five guards outside the door. <laughs> Congratulate you upon your coronation. Uh, thank you. Arden, order your priests back to their jobs. Order them yourself, Vines. At this moment, there isn't a single wheel turning on an acrium. There's not a light burning, except in the temples. On the winter half of the planet, there's not a calorie of heat, except in the temples. Not a drop of water running, except in the temples. The hospitals are taking in no more patients. Power plants have shut down. All ships are grounded. If you don't like it, Vinus, you could try ordering the priests back to their jobs yourself. Very well, Hardin. I will. If it's to be a showdown, so be it. We'll see if your priests can withstand the art. Tonight, every temple on the planet will be put under supervision. Very good. But how are you going to give the orders, hmm? Every line of communication on the planet's shut down. The only communicator on the planet that will work outside the temples, of course is the televisor right here in this room, and that is fitted only for reception. If you wish, you can order your army into the Argoli Temple just outside the palace, and then use the ultra-wave sets there to contact the rest of the planet. But if you do that, 
I'm afraid that the army contingents will be cut to pieces by the mob. Then who will protect your palace, Vinus? And your life, We Vinus. can hold out, Charlie. Let the mob howl and the power die. When the news comes back that the foundation has been taken, the mob will find out in what a vacuum their religion has been built. And they will desert the priests and turn against them. I give you until noon tomorrow, Harding, because you can't stop my fleet. They're on their way, Harding. And at their head, the great cruiser you yourself ordered repaired. Yes, the great cruiser I myself ordered repaired. Yeah, but in my own way. Huh? Tell me, Vinus, have you ever heard of an ultra-wave relay? No. Well, uh, switch on the televisor. In about two minutes, you'll see what it can do to your ship. Oh. Uh, would you care to sit down, Your Majesty? Thank you. Uh, well, oh, I... Vinus, do sit down. No. no. Who are you? What are you doing on the brig of my ship? I am Theo Apparat, one of the senior priests of Anacrium, and I wish to address your crew. Tend to yourselves and your blessings, priest. I'll attend to the ship and its crew. Very well. Restrain him, then. Uh, Don't listen to him, man! Uh, for reception, you know. What do you think you're doing? Get your hands off me this instant! He is our priest, Admiral, and we must obey him. And I am the Silence! Silence! I listen to what I have to say. Silence! Open all communication channels for me, will you? I wish to address the ship. Communication channels open, Your Reverence. Thank, Thank you. you. Soldiers of the Royal Flagship, it is your priest, Apparat, who speaks to you. Your ship is engaged in sacrilege. Without your knowledge, it is performing such an act as will damn the soul of every man among you. Listen, it is the intention of your admiral to take this ship to the foundation and there to bombard that source of all blessings into submission to his sinful will. And since that is his intention, I, in the name of the galactic spirit, remove him from his command. The divine king himself may not maintain his kingship without the consent of the galactic spirit. No, oh, this is absolute rubbish. Oh, God, God, that this is me. It is upon such a devil, heaven. The blessing of the spirit is removed from it as well. In the name of the galactic spirit, I curse this ship. What's happening? The ship is paralyzed. Paralyze what you mean. The chief characteristic of a scientific religion is that its curses really work. A priest on an Acreon operates an ultra-wave relay and a ship in deep space, uh, fitted out by the foundation, of course, is rendered helpless. What a curse. I now order that the one-time Prince Regent Vinus be imprisoned. Fight! And tried before an ecclesiastical court for his crimes. Rubbish! Otherwise, the Navy, upon returning to Anacreon, will blast the palace to the ground and take whatever other measures are necessary to destroy the nest of sinners and the den of destroyers of men's souls that now prevails. There is an old fable as old, perhaps, as humanity, for the oldest records containing it are merely copies of other records much older. It might interest you, Vines. A horse, having a wolf as a powerful and dangerous enemy, lived in constant fear of his life. Being driven to desperation, it occurred to him to seek a strong ally. Whereupon he approached a man and offered an alliance, pointing out that the wolf was likewise an enemy of the man. The man accepted the partnership at once and offered to kill the wolf immediately if his new partner would only cooperate by placing his greater speed at the man's disposal. The horse was willing and allowed the man to place bridle and saddle upon him. The man mounted, hunted down the wolf and killed him. The horse, joyful and relieved, thanked the man and said, Now that our enemy is dead, remove your bridle and saddle and restore my freedom. Whereupon the man laughed loudly and replied, The hell with you. Giddy up, Dobby. You see the analogy, I hope. 
In their anxiety to consolidate their position of total domination over their peoples, the kings of the four kingdoms accepted the religion of science that made them divine. But that same religion of science was your bridle and saddle, for it placed the lifeblood of atomic power in the hands of the priesthood, who take their orders from Terminus, not from you. You've killed the wolf, but cannot get rid of the harness. So I'll finish you yet. You won't escape. Soldiers, shoot him down. They are wiser than you, Vines. Shoot him down. Kill him. Uncle, he's the figurehead of our religion. He's divine. Damn you, then. Give me a blaster. Uncle. Ah! Poor Vines. A man of direct action to the end. The last refuge. Ah, Lee. You look very worried. What's wrong? I thought you wouldn't get here. Selden's due to appear at any moment, isn't he? I certainly hope so. And what if he doesn't? Are you going to wear me down with your worries all my life, Lee? If he doesn't, if he doesn't. But without Selden's backing for what we've done, Sir Matt will be free to start all over again. He wants outright annexation of the Four Kingdoms and immediate expansion of the Foundation by force, if necessary. He's begun his campaign already. I know. A fire-eater of last eat fire. He only has to kindle it himself. And you, Lee, have got to worry, even if you have to kill yourself to invent something to worry about. My God, honey, you were right. He is going to appear. Then have some respect for self. Be quiet for a little. I am Harry Seldon. This is the second time I have been here. Of course, I don't know if any of you were here the first time. In fact, I have no way of telling by sense perception that there is anyone here at all. But that doesn't matter. If the second crisis has been overcome safely, you are bound to be here. There is no way out. If you are not here, then the second crisis has been too much for you. I doubt that, however, as my figures show a 98.4% probability that there is to be no significant deviation from the plan in the first 70 years. You have now reached domination of the barbarian kingdoms immediately surrounding the foundation. Just as in the first crisis, you held them off by the use of the balance of power, so now, in the second, you have gained mastery by the spiritual power as against the temporal. However, I must warn you here against overconfidence. It is not my way to grant you any foreknowledge in these recordings, but it would be safe to indicate that what you have now achieved is merely a new balance, though one in which your position is considerably better. The spiritual power, while sufficient to ward off attacks of the temporal, is not sufficient to attack in return. Because of the inevitable growth of the counteracting force known as regionalism or nationalism, the spiritual power cannot prevail. The neighboring kingdoms, in manpower and resources, are still overwhelmingly powerful when compared with yourselves. Beyond them stretches the vast, tangled jungle of barbarism that extends around the rim of the galaxy. Within that rim, there is still the galactic empire, and that, weakened and decaying though it is, is still incomparably mighty. And never forget that there was another foundation established 70 years ago, a foundation at the other end of the galaxy, at Star's End. Gentlemen, 930 years of the plan stretch ahead of you. The problem is yours. He didn't say when he'd be back. I know. But I trust that he won't return until after you and I are safely and cozily dead.
title, Foundation. Foundation and Empire, Second Foundation. Author, Isaac Asimov. Audio adaptation, Patrick Chow. Part number two. Part title, The Mayors. Salvo Hardin, Lee Montague. Johan Lee, John Hollis. Vinus, Francis de Wolfe. Seth Sermak, John Sampson. Verisoft, William Fox. Leopold I, Jerry Scully. Theo Apparat, Michael Kilgariff. Doka Walter, William Slay. Harry Selden, William Eagle. Encyclopedic Readout, David Baller. Producer, David Kane. Location, BBC Radiophonic Workshop. <laughs> Foundation. Foundation and Empire. Second Foundation. Author, Isaac Asimov. Part number three. Part title, The Merchant Princes. Encyclopedia Galactica 116th edition. Entry, The Traders. Constantly in advance of the political hegemony of the Foundation, were the traders, reaching out for tenuous finger holes through the tremendous distances of the periphery. Through it all, they forged an empire more enduring than the pseudo-religious despotism of the four kingdoms. With psycho-historical inevitability, the economic control of the foundation grew. The traders grew rich, and with riches came power. It is sometimes forgotten that Hober Mallow began life as an ordinary trader. It is never forgotten that he ended it as the first of the merchant princes. It's something of a puzzle. In fact, and this is in the strictest confidence, it may be another of Harley Seldon's crises. Mm, I don't know about that, Soot. As a general rule, politicians start shouting Selden crisis at every mayoralty campaign. I'm not campaigning, Mallow. We are facing atomic weapons. And we don't know where they're coming from. Well, go on. If you have more to say, say it. Very well. Have a look at this star chart. That over there is the Karelian Republic. Now, three trade ships, inviolate under the Convention, have disappeared within the territory of the Republic in the last year. And those ships were armed with all the nuclear explosives and force field defences. What was the last thing heard from the ship? Routine reports, nothing else. What did Corral say? There was no way of asking. The Foundation's greatest asset throughout the periphery is its reputation for power. Do you think we can lose three ships and ask for them back? <laughs> no, I see that. Well, three ships lost in the same sector in the same year cannot be coincidence. And atomic power can only be conquered by more atomic power. Mm -hmm. The question automatically arises... If Corel has atomic weapons, where is it getting them from? And where is it? Two alternatives. Either the Corellians themselves have constructed them. Far-fetched. Very. But the other possibility is that we are being afflicted with a case of treason. Do you think so? Oh, there's nothing miraculous about the possibility. Since the four kingdoms accepted the Foundation Convention, we've had to deal with considerable groups of dissident populations in each nation. I see, but what do you want with me? You're a Sminian. You know the Outlanders. You're a trader and one of the best. You've been to Corel and know the Corellians. And that's where you've got to go. As a spy? Not at all. As a trader. But with your eyes open. I want you to find out where the power is coming from. When do I leave? When will your ship be ready? In six days. Then that's when you leave. <laughs> But the mayor did allow you to send Mallow out. It's a point. 
Oh, but such a small one, Manlio. It gets us nothing immediately. The whole business is the crudest sort of stratagem, since we have no way of foreseeing it to the end. True. And this Mallow is a capable man? If there is treachery, we need a capable man to detect the truth. And Mallow will be watched. Look, sir. What is worrying you? I'll tell you, Manlio. We are in the middle of a Selden crisis. How do you know? Reason it out. Since the Galactic Empire abandoned the periphery and threw us on our own, we have never had an opponent who possessed atomic power. Now, for the first time, we have one. That seems significant even if it stood by itself, and it doesn't. For the first time in over 70 years, we are facing a major domestic political crisis. I should think the synchronization of the two crises, inner and outer, puts it beyond all doubt. And you've, uh, made your plans to meet this crisis? Yes. And am I to play a part in it? Yes. What? Before we meet the threat of foreign atomic power, you have got to put our house in order. Now, these traders are useful. But they are too strong and too uncontrolled. They are outlanders, educated apart from religion. On the one hand, we put knowledge into their hands, and on the other, we remove our strongest hold upon them. Now, the cure must come quickly, before the Selden crisis becomes acute. It is obviously your job. Mine? I can't do it. As the mayor's secretary, my office is appointed and has no legislative power. What about the mayor himself? Impossible. His personality is entirely negative. He is energetic only in avoiding responsibility. But, but if an independent party arose that might endanger re-election, ah. he might allow himself to be led. Yes, Twer, I have heard of your campaign to get direct trader representation on the council, but why me? I know what I'm doing. Do you remember when I met you last year at the traders' convention? Yes. Well, you ran that meeting, Mallow. You've got glamour. Or, at any rate, solid adventure publicity, which is the same thing. Very good, but why now? Because now the Actionist Party is splitting wide open. And we can finish it on a straight question of equal right for traders. No, I'm sorry, Twer. I'm leaving next week on business. You'll have to get someone else. Business? What kind of business? Very super secret. I had a talk with the mayor's own secretary. Soot! It's a trick. He's getting rid of you, Mallow. If it's a trick, I'll be back someday for the reckoning. If it isn't, Soot is playing into our hands. Now listen, there's a Selden crisis coming up. What's a Selden and... crisis? <laughs> what did you do when you went to school? All right. If you'll just explain. I'll explain. The future course of the foundation was plotted according to Harry Selden's science of psychohistory and conditions arranged so as to bring about a series of crises that would force us most rapidly along the route to future empire. Each Selden crisis marks an epoch in our history. We're approaching one now, our third. Of course. I should have remembered. Good. And I am being sent into the middle of the development of this crisis. There's no telling what I'll have when I come back, and there is a council election every year. Are you on the track of something? No. Nope. Any definite plans? Not the faintest inkling of one. We must improvise. I tell you what. How about coming with me? Coming? You were a trader before you decided there was more excitement in politics. Or so I've heard. Where are you going? I can't say until we're out in space. Well? Suppose Soot wants me where he can see me. Not likely. If he's anxious to get rid of me, why not you as well? All right, I'll go. <laughs> It'll be my first trip in three years. Good. You know where the Far Star docks, don't you? Yes. Then I'll see you there tomorrow. trading here. You might call this virgin territory. Mallow, we've been here a week and done nothing at all. The local government won't grant us an audience. There's a guard around the field and there are ships overhead. 
Suppose they're getting ready to blow us into a hole in the ground. They've had the week to do that. Maybe they're waiting for reinforcements. We're all waiting. They don't know what I'm doing here, and I don't know what they've got here. But I'm in a weaker position because I'm one, and they're an entire world, maybe with atomic power. I can't afford to be the one to weaken. All right. Certainly it's dangerous. Certainly there may be a hole in the ground waiting for us, but we knew that from the start. What else is there to do? I don't... Yes, Sergeant. Pardon, sir. The men have given entry to a foundation missionary. A what? A missionary, sir. He's in need of hospitalization. He won't be the only one in a few minutes, Sergeant. Order them into battle stations. Twer, get the officers together, except for the coordinators and the trajectory. Right. The men are to remain at stations until further orders. <coughs> man in without orders from me. Pardon, sir, it was no definite person. It was a sort of mutual agreement. It was one of us, as you might say, and these foreigners, well, I'm afraid... These men, were they under your command? Yes, sir. When this is over, they are to be confined to individual quarters for a week. You yourself are relieved of all supervisory duties for a similar period. Understood? Yes, sir. And now, get back to your gun stations. Very good, sir. Why the punishment, Mallow? You know the Karelians kill captured missionaries. Where is this missionary? Get him in here. Yes, sir. An action against my orders is bad in itself, whatever reasons there may be in its favor. No one was to leave or enter the ship without permission. What's your name? Your name, revered one. My son, my children. May you always be in the protecting arms of the galactic spirit. The man's sick, Mallow. Order him to bed and let him have attention. Don't interfere, Twer, or I'll have you out of the room. Your name, revered one. I am George Palmer of the Anacreonian Works. Educated at the foundation. The foundation itself, my children. As you are children of the spirit, protect me. Enemy units in sight. Maintain vigil. That is all. Someone turn on the televisor. Very good, sir. There's thousands of them. Lieutenant Sinter, get the outer speaker working and find out what they want. Ask if they have a representative of the law with them. Yes, sir. Mallow, you're bound to hold on to this man. He's off the foundation and he's a priest. Those savages outside. Do you hear me? I hear you, Twer. I've got more to do here than to guard missionaries. I'll do, sir, what I please. And if you try to stop me, I'll throttle you. Are you... Revered Palmer. My son. Did you know that by convention, no Foundation missionary may enter Corellian territory? I can go but where the spirit leads, my son. If the darkened ones refuse enlightenment, is it not the greatest sign of their need for it? That's outside the question. You are here against the law of both Corell and the Foundation. I cannot in law protect you. You hear them? What is sort of law to me? A law made by man, but a higher law. Was it not the galactic spirit that said, even as thou dealest with the humble and defenseless, thus shalt thou be dealt with? Sir. Yes, Lieutenant. Sir, they demand the person of George Palmer. And if not? There are various threats, sir. It's difficult to make much out. There's someone who says he governs the district and has police powers, but he's quite evidently not his own master. A master or not, he is the law. Tell them that if he approaches the ship alone, he can have the revered George Palmer. Quiet! I don't know what insubordination is. I have never had any experience with it. But if there's anyone here who thinks he can teach me, I'd like to teach him my antidote in return. All right. Send him out. Cursed be the traitor who abandoned his fellow man to evil and death. Seven be the ears of the death of the pleadings of the helpless. Disperse to respective stations. Maintain full vigil for six hours after dispersal of crowd. Double stations for 48 hours thereafter. Further instructions at that time. Twer, come with me. I sit down, Twer. Your three years in politics seem to have got you out of trader habits. You have no official position. You're here on my invitation, and I'll extend you every courtesy in private. But in the presence of my officers and men, I am Sir and not Mallow. 
And when I give an order, you'll jump faster than a third-class recruit, or I'll have you in irons, understand? My apologies. Accepted. It's just that it's difficult to send a man out to be lynched. That governor can't save him. It's murder. Really? Didn't you notice anything? Notice what? This spaceport is deep in the middle of a sleepy far section. Suddenly a missionary escapes. Where from? He comes here. Coincidence? A huge crowd gathers. From where? The nearest city of any size must be at least a hundred kilometers away. But they arrive in half an hour. How? What if the missionary were brought here and released as bait? Our friend revered Palmer was considerably confused. He seemed at no time to be in complete possession of his wits. Yes? Sir, communication received. Submitted immediately. Palmer was here against the laws of Corell and the Foundation. If I'd withheld him, it would have been an act of war against Corell, and the Foundation would have had no legal right to defend him. Good theory. Where's the proof? Half an hour after we hand back the missionary, we finally get a very polite invitation to the Condor's August presence, after seven days of previous waiting. I think that's proof enough. There is no ostentation here, Trader Mallow. In me, you see merely the first citizen of the state. And that's what Condor means. And that's the only title I have. It is fortunate that I have you to deal with, then, Commodore. The despots and monarchs of surrounding worlds, which haven't the benefit of enlightened administration, often lack the qualities that make a ruler well-beloved, as I believe you are called by your uh, fellow citizens. Thank you. But to which qualities did you refer? Your concern for the best interests of your people. Uh. Up to now, trade between our two nations has suffered because of the restrictions placed upon our traders by your government. Surely it has long been evident to you that unlimited trade... Free trade. Yes, free trade, then. Well, surely you must see that it would be of mutual benefit. There are things that you have that we want and things that we have that you want. But your people have always been so unreasonable. Oh. I am in favor of all the trade our economy can support. But not on your terms. I am not sole master here. I am only the servant of public opinion, and my people would not accept a commerce which sparkled in crimson and gold. A compulsory religion. So it has always been, in effect. None of what you speak is at all what I suggest. No. No, I am a master trader. Money is my religion. All this mysticism and hocus-pocus of the missionaries annoys me. <laughs> well said. The Foundation should have sent a man of your caliber before. But you've only told me half. You've told me what the catch is not. Now tell me what it is. The only catch, Condor, is that you are going to be burdened with an immense quantity of riches. Indeed. And what would I want with riches? The true wealth is the love of one's people, and I have that. You could have both, for it is possible to gather gold with one hand and love with the other. Now, that would be an interesting phenomenon. How would you go about it? Oh, in a number of ways. The difficulty is choosing amongst them. Let's see. Well, luxury items, for instance. Uh, this object here now. Uh, what is it? Can you fetch me a girl? Any young female will do. And a full-length mirror. Hmm. Let's go indoors. This is one of the Condor's girls. Does she do? Perfectly. Now, just fasten this chain around your waist. Well, is that all? Will you close the shutters, Condor? Ah. Now, young lady... There's a small switch here, just by the clasp. Will you move it upwards, please? Go ahead, it won't hurt you. Oh. It's amazing. Astounding. Isn't it? As though the aurora borealis had been torn out of the sky and moulded into a cloak. How poetic, Condor. Turn it off now, my dear. Push the switch down gently. It's yours, Commodore. A gift.
for the Condor. Uh, take it to her, my dear. My lord. How is it done? That's a question for our technical experts. But it will work for you without priestly help. But what could you do with it? Where does the money come in? You have receptions, banquets, that sort of thing. Yes. Do you realize what women will pay for that sort of jewellery? A fortune. Ah. And since the power unit of this particular item will not last longer than six months, there will be the necessity of frequent replacements. Now, we can sell as many of these as you want for the equivalent in wrought iron of 1,000 credits. You should be able to make about 900% profit on the deal. I see. And that's not all. We have a complete range of household goods, almost anything you like. Think of your increased popularity if you make them available to the public. Think of your increased quantity of uh, worldly goods if they're available through a government monopoly with 900% profit. It'll be worth many times the money to the people, and they needn't know what you pay for it. Everybody will be happy. Except you, it seems. What do you get out of it? Just what every trader gets by foundation law. Half of whatever profits we take in. What did you say you wanted to be paid in? Iron? That and coal and bauxite and oh, nothing you haven't already got enough of. Sounds well. I think so. Oh, and still another item at random, Commodore. I could retool your factories. Uh -huh. Well, take your steel foundries. I have handy little gadgets that could cut costs to 1% of previous marks. I could show you exactly what I mean if you'd allow me a demonstration. You do have a steel foundry in this city. It wouldn't take long. It could be arranged to tomorrow, but tomorrow, <coughs> tomorrow. But would you dine with us tonight? Thank you. A symbolic, friendly union of our nations. It will give us a chance for further friendly discussion. <laughs> Mallow, there's trouble, isn't there? Trouble? No, quite the opposite. In fact, I'm in the position of throwing my full weight against the door and finding it was already open. We're getting into this steel foundry too easily. You suspect a trap? Don't be melodramatic. It's just that the easy entrance means that there will be nothing to see. No atomic power. Mm. We've seen no evidence of it so far, and it would be pretty hard to mask all signs of the widespread effect it would have. Not if it was just starting up and being applied to a war economy. Then you'd find it in the shipyards and the steel foundries only. So if we don't find it there, then they haven't got it. Or they're deliberately not showing it. Take your pick. Ah, as I said, the instrument is dangerous, but so is a buzzsaw. You just have to keep your fingers away. Just one more demonstration. Uh, may I have those two short lengths of piping? Thank you. Now, test that pipe. It's one piece now. Not perfect, naturally. The joining shouldn't be done by hand. Twer, look. What? The blasters the guards are wearing. They're atomic. I know that, but look at the symbol on the butts. The spaceship and sun. Well, the spaceship and sun is the symbol of the Empire, Twer. Here in the periphery, after a century and a half, the Empire is emerging again. <laughs> You are acting captain of the Far Star until I return, or forever. Very good, sir. This envelope contains the exact coordinates where you will wait for me for two months. If before the two months are up, the Foundation locates you, this microfilm is my report of the trip. If, however, I do not return at the end of two months, and Foundation vessels do not locate you, return to Terminus and hand in this time capsule as the report. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. At no time are you or any of the men to amplify in any single instance my official report. If we are questioned, sir. Then you know nothing. Yes, sir. Is my lifeboat ready? Yes, sir. Good. Then I'll be away in ten minutes. Good morning. There is no need to keep it closed. Do you wish anything of me? 
Yes. May I sit? If the chairs will hold you. Thank you. My name is Hoba Mallow. I am Onumba, and one time patrician of the Empire. Then this is Suana. Huh? I had only old maps to guide me. They must have been old indeed for star positions to be misplaced. All I really need are directions to the center of government. Do you mean the capital of the planet or the capital of the imperial sector? Are they the same? Didn't you say that this was Suena? Suena, yes. But Suena is no longer the capital of the Noanic sector. Is the new capital far off? It's on Osha too. Twenty parsecs off. Your map will direct you if it's not too old. Well, 150 years. That old? Yeah. History has been crowded since then. Do you know any of it? I'm afraid I don't. No fortunate. Oh? It's been an evil time for the provinces. Ruin and rebellion. You sound as if the province were impoverished. Compared to the wealth of the last century, we have gone a long way downhill. But why are you so interested in that, young man? I'm a trader out here. I found some old maps and I'm out to open new markets. Naturally, talk of impoverished planets disturbs me. Are you a trader? You look more like a fighting man. There is a scar on your jawbone. There isn't much law where I come from. Fighting and scars are part of a trader's overheads. Now, will I find enough money here to make it worth my while? I take it I can find the fighting easily enough. Easily enough. You could join our present gracious viceroy. Gracious by right of murder, pillage, and rapine. That's not very friendly to the viceroy, Patrician Bar. Supposing I'm one of his spies. What if you are? What can you take? Your life? It would leave me easily enough. It had been with me five years too long. When Suena was the provincial capital, I was a patrician and member of the provincial senate. My family was an old and honored one. One of my great-grandfathers had been... No, never mind that. Past glories are poor feeding. I take it there was a civil war or revolution. Civil wars are chronic in these degenerate days. Our last viceroy aimed at the imperial purple. He wasn't the first to aim, and if he'd succeeded, he wouldn't have been the first to succeed, but he failed. For, as the Emperor's Admiral approached the province to subdue him, we rebelled. The Viceroy was driven out, and the planet, and with it the province, were thrown open to the Admiral with every gesture of loyalty. But he wanted the glory of conquering a rebellious province. So, while the people were still gathered in every large city, cheering the Emperor and the Empire, he occupied all armed centers and ordered the population put to the atom blast. On what pretext? On the pretext that they had rebelled against their viceroy, the Emperor's anointed. And the Admiral became the new viceroy by virtue of one month of massacre, pillage and complete horror. I had six sons. Five died variously. I had a daughter. I hope she died too. I escaped because I was old. I came here. They left me nothing because I had helped to drive out a rebellious viceroy and deprived an admiral of his glory. What of your sixth son? He is safe. He has joined the viceroy under an assumed name. He is a gunner in his personal fleet. He visits me when he can and gives me what he can. He keeps me alive. And someday, our great and glorious viceroy will grovel to his death. And it will be my son who will be his executioner. And you tell this to a stranger. You endanger your son. No. I help him by introducing a new enemy. No danger ever threatened us from the broken edge of the galaxy... Until you came. I? Oh, I am no danger. There will be more after you. I knew you when you entered. You have a force shield about your body, or had when I first saw you. Yes, I had. But I was a scholar. And I know that in all the history of atomics, no portable force shield was ever invented. We do have force shields, 
Huge, lumbering powerhouses that will protect a ship or even a city. But not one single man. I say nothing, but I would like to ask you something. Does Suena possess atomic power? I know it possesses the knowledge of atomics, but are its power generators intact, or did the recent sack destroy them? Destroy them? No, no. Half a planet would be wiped out before the smallest power station would be touched. They are irreplaceable, and the suppliers of the strength of the fleet. We have the largest and best on this side of Tranter itself. What would I do if I wanted to see one of these generators? Nothing. You couldn't approach any military center without being shot down instantly. You mean all the power stations are under the military? Oh, there are small city stations, the ones supplying power for heating and lighting and powering vehicles and so forth. They are controlled by the tech. Who are they? A special group which supervises the power plants, the honor is hereditary. I see. I don't say that there aren't cases where tech men have been bribed, but it would require a great deal of money, and I have none. Have you? Money? No. But does one always bribe with money? Now, my man, quickly. I've got work to do. You seem a stranger. I am not of the neighborhood, but that is irrelevant. I had the honor to send you a little gift yesterday. I received it. An interesting little trifle. I may have a use for it on occasion. I have other and more interesting gifts, quite out of the trifle stage. Oh, I think I see the course of the interview. It's happened before. You're going to give me a few credits, a cloak, second-hand jewelry, anything your little soul may consider sufficient to bribe a tech man. And I know what you want in exchange. You wish to be adopted into our clan. You wish to be taught the mysteries of atomics. Oh, do you think that I would betray my trust? The Suanese traitors that preceded me, perhaps. But you're dealing with a different breed now. Oh, I'm surprised that I don't kill you myself. Now, with my bare hands. You are wrong on three counts. First, I am not one of the Viceroy's spies come to test your loyalty. Second, my gift is something the Emperor himself, in all his splendor, does not and will never possess. And third, what I require in return is very little, a nothing, a mere breath. Something the Emperor doesn't have. I have waited three days to see you, Your Wisdom, but the display will take only three seconds. If you will draw your blaster and shoot me, I should be obliged. What? If I am killed, you can tell the police that I tried to bribe you into betraying state secrets. If I am not killed, you may have my shield. Does the Emperor have a personal force shield? You can have one. Where did you get that? What do you care? Do you want it? There it is. Is it complete? Complete. Ah, and what if I shoot you now and keep the shield? Do you think I gave you my only sample? And what is this nothing that you require in return? I want to see the generators. You realize that it is forbidden? I merely want to see them. And if I refuse? You have your shield, but I have a blaster especially designed to pierce that shield. Very well. All these generators are in your hands? Every one. And you keep them running and in order? Right. And if they break down? They don't break down. They were built for eternity. Eternity is a long time. But just suppose... Suppose I were to fuse a vital connection or smash a quartz detube. You would be killed. Yes, I know that, but what about the generator? Could you repair it? Sir, you've seen what you asked for. Now leave. I owe you nothing more. Well, Lieutenant, you can return the microfilm and the time capsule. 
I'm glad you didn't need to turn them over to Terminus. I'm just glad to turn over command of the ship to you again, sir. Good. Set course for the Foundation. You must be glad to be back home, Lalo. I am, Gile, I am. You've been working for a long time. You must need a rest. Maybe I do, but I'd rather rest in a council seat. <laughs> I'm going to have that seat, Gile, and you're going to help me. Ah. You don't think much of my chances, do you? Well, frankly, no. Terrain Soot is the cleverest politician on the planet, and he'll be against you. And he fights hard and dirty. I've got money. That helps. But it'll take a lot. I'll have a lot. Well, I'll do what I can, but don't say that I encouraged you. Jurain Soot to see you, sir. Oh, very well. Show him in. Quick, Giles, into the next room and turn the speaker down to low. I want you to listen. All right. Sit down, Soot. Thank you. Now then, if you'll state your terms to begin with, we'll get straight to business. Terms? You wish to be coaxed. Well then, what did you do on Corel? You have my report. It was incomplete. You were satisfied with it at the time. Yes, but since then your activities have been significant. We know what you're doing, Mallow. We know how many factories you're putting up in what a hurry you're doing it and how much it's costing you. And this palace you have, which sets you back considerably more than my annual salary. So, beyond proving that you have capable spies, what else does it prove? It proves that you have money you didn't have a year ago. Where are you getting it? My dear Sutch, you can't really expect me to tell you. I don't. I didn't think you did. That's why I'm going to. It's straight from the treasure chests of the Commodore of Corel. What? Unfortunately for you, the money is quite legitimate. I am a master trader, and 50% of any profit is mined by hidebound contracts with the Foundation. The other half goes to the government at the end of the year when all good citizens pay their taxes. There was no mention of any trade agreement in your report. Nor was there any mention of what I had for breakfast or the name of my current mistress or any other irrelevant detail. I was sent, to quote yourself, to keep my eyes open. I followed orders. But beyond that, I was and still am a free agent. According to the laws of the Foundation, a master trader may open whatever new markets he can and receive therefrom half of the profits. It is the general custom of all traders to advance the religion of their trade. I adhere to law and not to custom. Look, Mano, this goes beyond money or markets. We have the science of the great Harry Selden to prove that upon us depends the future empire of the galaxy. And we cannot turn from the course that leads to the Imperium. And the all-important instrument towards that end is our religion. The primary reason for the development of trade and traders was to introduce and spread this religion more quickly. I know the theory. I understand it entirely. Do you? It's more than I expected. Then you understand, of course, that your attempt to trade for its own sake can only end with the overthrow and complete negation of the policy that has worked successfully for a century. And time enough, too, for a policy outdated, dangerous and impossible. However well your religion has succeeded in the four kingdoms, scarcely another world has accepted it. There isn't a ruler in the periphery that wouldn't sooner cut his throat than let a priest of the foundation enter his territory. I don't propose to force Corel or any other world to accept something I know they don't want. If atomic power makes them dangerous, a sincere friendship through trade will be many times better than an insincere overlordship based on fear and hate. Very nicely put. So, to get back to the original point of the discussion, what are your terms? Can you offer me more than I'm getting at the moment? You could have three quarters of your trade profits rather than half. <laughs> The whole of the trade on your terms would fall far below a tenth share on mine. <laughs> Try harder than that. You could have a council seat. I shall have that anyway, without and despite you. 
You could also save yourself a prison term of 20 years. What's the charge? Murder. Murder? Whose? The murder of an Anacreonian priest in the service of the Foundation. Is that so? And what's your evidence? Mallow, I'm not bluffing. The preliminaries are over. I have only to sign one final paper and the case is begun. Now you have five seconds to prevent the punishment due to you. For myself, I'd rather you decided to bluff it out. You'd be safer as a destroyed enemy than as a doubtfully converted friend. Very well. It was the mayor who wished the preliminary attempt at compromise. Not I. Witness that I didn't try too hard. Well, Giles, what do you make of it? Well, it's my notion that his ultimate aims aren't spiritual. <laughs> I was fired from the cabinet for arguing on the same issue. And what do you think those unspiritual aims are? Well, suppose one ambitious man uses the force of religion against us rather than for us. You mean so? That's right, I mean so. Listen, if he could mobilize the various hierarchies on the subject planets against the foundation in the name of orthodoxy, what chance would we stand? As Hardin said, an atom blaster is a good weapon, but it can point both ways. All right, then, Gile. Get me in that council and I'll fight him. And when? Maybe not. What was all that about murdering a priest? It isn't true, is it? No, it's true enough. Oh, it's bad. Bad? What's bad about it? According to the Foundation's own laws, that priest was illegally on Corral. All I did was to hand him over. I know you've missed the point. So it isn't out to convict you. He knows he can't do that. But if the people think that you threw a priest to the dogs, your popularity is gone and you will never get elected to a council seat. So... I'll stand by you, but I can't help. You're on the spot. Dead center. You cut it fine. You got the recording? Here, take it. It's everything you ask for. Good. How are they taking it outside? There's lynch talk. And Publius Manlius men on the outer planets. Or I wanted to certain... ask you about that, Gile. He's stirring up the hierarchy against me, isn't he? It's the sweetest setup you ever saw. As foreign secretary, he handles the prosecution in the case of interstellar law. As high priest of the church, he rouses the fanatics. Forget it. You remember that Harding quote you threw at me last month about the atom blast? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, we'll show them that it can point both ways. Well, I only hope you're right. You sit here and watch the fun. Right. Be seated at the court. Gentlemen, to save time, I will admit the truth of every point made against me by the prosecution. However, the picture they presented fell short of completion. I ask the privilege of supplying the completion in my own fashion. I begin at the same time as the prosecution, the day of my meetings with Jorain Sut and Jaim Twer. The events of that day were strange. Consider. Firstly, Sut, secretary to the mayor, asks me to play the part of an intelligence agent for the government in a highly confidential matter. Secondly, Twer, a self-styled leader of a political party, asks me to run for a council seat. Now, what were their motives? Consider again. Twer presents himself as a trader, retired into politics, yet I know of no details of his trading career, although my knowledge of the field is immense. And further, although Twer boasted of a lay education, he had never heard of a Selden crisis. Now, gentlemen, you all know there is only one type of education upon the Foundation that excludes all mention of the psycho-history of Selden and deals only with him as a semi-mystical wizard. I knew at that instant that Jaim Twer had never been a traitor. I knew then that he was a fully-fledged priest and the bought man of Jorain Soot. 
I didn't know such purposes with regard to myself, but since he seemed to be feeding me rope liberally, I handed him a few fathoms of my own. I invited her to come with me on my mission, and he accepted. That gentleman of the council explains two things. First, that Twer is not testifying against me reluctantly, as the prosecution would have you believe. He is a spy, performing his paid job. And second, it explains a certain action of mine when I interviewed the priest who I'm alleged to have murdered, an action as yet unmentioned because unknown. I got rid of Twer for a moment by sending him out for my officers. In his absence, I set up an audiovisual recorder so that whatever happened might be preserved for future study. With your permission, I am now going to show you a single moment from that record. For some strange reason, the prosecution has made no mention throughout these entire proceedings of the revered George Palmer. The prosecution has advanced no details concerning George Palmer because it cannot. There never was a George Palmer. Playback, please. Perhaps I have a question. You are here against the law of both Corel and the Foundation. I cannot in law... A fast run. <laughs> Slower. <laughs> and... <laughs> Stop. <laughs> run back slowly. <laughs> slowly. <laughs> Stop. Now, focus in on Palmer's hand. Closer. Onto that bright spot. Fine. Now, gentlemen, I had flooded the control room in ultraviolet light. Those glowing letters, an admittedly naive method of secret identification, are invisible in ordinary light, but stand out in high relief under ultraviolet. Perhaps some of you have already guessed what KSP stands for. Where George Palmer learned his job, I cannot say. But KSP stands for Corellian Secret Police. I have collateral proof in the form of documents brought from Corell, which I can present to the council if required. And where now is the prosecution's case? They have already made the monstrous suggestion that I should have fought for the missionary in defense of the law and sacrificed my mission, my ship, and myself to the honor of the Foundation. But to do it for an imposter, would Jorain Soot and Publis Manlio have had me fall into such a stupid, odious trap? Mm -hmm. You've put on a beautiful show, so don't spoil it now. You can't seriously consider running for mayor. Mob enthusiasm is a powerful thing, but it's notoriously fickle. Exactly, so we must coddle it, and the best way to do that is to continue the show. Now what? You are to have Publis Manlio and Geraint Soot arrested. What? You heard, have them arrested. I control the mob, for today at any rate. On what charge? On the obvious one. They've been inciting the priesthood on the outer planets to take sides in the factional quarrels of the Foundation. Charge them with endangering the state. Just get them out of circulation till I'm mayor. But it's six months till election time. Not too long. Listen, I'd seize the government by force if I had to. There's still that Selden crisis coming up. And when it comes, I have to be both mayor and high priest. What's it going to be? Corel, after all? Of course. They'll declare war eventually. With atomic ships? What do you think? Those three merchant ships we lost in their sector weren't knocked out by compressed air pistols. They're getting ships from the Empire itself. Empire. It's still there, you know. It may be gone here in the periphery, but in the galactic center, it's still very much alive. I know, I went there. I saw that atomic plants. Anyway, I'm the only man who knows how to fight the crisis. Oh, what are you going to do? Nothing. What? I'm going to do nothing. One hundred percent nothing. That is the secret of the crisis. <laughs> My gracious lord has finally come to a decision upon the fate of the Foundation upstarts. Indeed. And what more does your versatile understanding 
embrace. Enough, my noble husband. You've had another of your endless consultations with your counselors. Mm. And who is the excellent source from which your understanding understands all this? What does it matter? Why don't you attack now? One ship from the Empire would be enough to blast their planet to rubble, and I know you have five. I couldn't attack that planet even with a dust. And how long would their planet hold out with their trade ruined and their cargoes of toys and trash destroyed? Those toys and trash mean money. A good deal of money. But if you had the foundation, you would have all it contained. It's been three years since that barbarian came with his magic sideshow. It's long enough. I lack the resilience to withstand your rattling mouth. You say you know I have decided. Well, I have. There is war between Corel and the Foundation. <laughs> I'll give you your chance, Soot. I don't need you, but I can use you. So I'll tell you what it's all about, and then you can either join me and receive a place in a coalition cabinet, or you can play the martyr and rot in jail. You've tried that once before. Not very hard. The right time has only just come. Now listen. This is a Selden crisis we're facing, and Selden crises are not solved by individuals, but by historic forces. The solutions to the various crises must be achieved by the forces that become available to us at the time. In this case, trade. I hope that I'm not of subnormal intelligence. But the fact is that your vague lecture is not very illuminating. Then let us become very simple and specific. Corel is now at war with us. Consequently, our trade with her has stopped. But in the past three years, she has based her economy more and more upon the atomic techniques which we introduced and which only we can continue to supply. Now, what do you suppose will happen once the tiny atomic generators begin to fail? And one gadget after another goes out of commission. Hmm? The small household appliances will go first. After half a year of this stalemate, a woman's atomic knife won't work anymore. Oh. Her cooker begins to fail. Her washer doesn't do a good job. And is that what you're pinning your hopes on? A housewife's rebellion? A sudden uprising of butchers and grocers? No, of course I'm not. I expect, however, a general background of grumbling and dissatisfaction, which will be seized on by more important figures later on. And what more important figures are these? The manufacturers, factory owners, and industrialists. After two years of stalemate, the machines in the factories will begin to fail. Those industries which we have changed to atomics will find themselves very suddenly ruined. The factories ran well enough before you went there, Mallow. Yes, sir. So they did. At about one-twentieth of the profits... With the industrialist and the financier and the average man all against him, how long do you think the Commodore can last? As long as he pleases. As soon as it occurs to him to get new atomic generators from the Empire. <laughs> you missed everything, Zurt, and understood nothing. <laughs> Look, the Empire can replace nothing. The Empire has always been a realm of colossal resources. They've calculated everything in planets, in stellar systems, in whole sectors of the galaxy. Their generators are gigantic because they thought in gigantic fashion. Our generators have had to be the size of our thumb because it was all the metal we could afford. This whole war is a battle between those two systems, between the big and the little. To seize control of the world, they bribe with immense ships that can wage war but lack all economic significance. We, on the other hand, bribe with little things useless in war, but vital to prosperity and profits. And it's still the little things in life that count, Soot. And Asper won't be able to stand up against the economic depression that will sweep all Corel within two or three years. Oh, no. You are not the man. You still don't believe I don't trust you. There's nothing straight about you. No motive that hasn't another behind it. No statement that hasn't three meanings. You mean there'll be no compromise? I mean, you must get out. By free will or by force. I warned you of the only alternative to cooperation. And I warn you, Hobermallow of Smyrno. 
that if you arrest me, there'll be no quarter. My men will stop nowhere in spreading the truth about you. And the common people of the Foundation will unite against their foreign ruler. They have a consciousness of destiny that a Smenian can never understand. And that consciousness will destroy you. <laughs> You've made a martyr for the cause. What next? It was not the soot I used to know. He's completely blinded by hatred for me. All the more dangerous, then. Dangerous? Nonsense. He's lost all power of judgment. <laughs> You're overconfident, matter. You're ignoring the possibility of a popular rebellion. Once and for all, Gile, there is no possibility of a popular rebellion. <laughs> You're sure of yourself. I'm sure of the Selden crisis and the historical validity of its solutions, externally and internally. To paraphrase that famous Salvor Hardin quote of yours, it's a poor atom blaster that won't point both ways. Yes. If Corel prospered with our trade, so did we. If Corellian factories fail without our trade, so will our factories fail and our prosperity vanish. And there isn't a factory, not a trading center, not a shipping line that isn't under my control that I couldn't squeeze to nothing if Soot attempts revolutionary propaganda. So, by the same reasoning which makes me sure that the Corellians will revolt in favor of prosperity, I am sure that we will not revolt against it. The game will be played out to the end. So you're establishing a plutocracy. You're making us a land of traders and merchant princes. Then what of the future? What business of mine is the future? No doubt Selden has foreseen it and prepared against it. There will be other crises in the time to come when the power of money has become as dead a force as the power of religion is now. Let my successor solve those new problems as I have solved the one of today. <laughs> Encyclopedia Galactica, 116th edition, entry, Corel. After three years of a war, which was certainly the most unfought war on record, the Republic of Corel surrendered unconditionally. Hober Mallow took his place next to Harry Selden and Salvo Hardin in the hearts of the people of the Foundation. Title, Foundation. Foundation and Empire. Second Foundation. Author, Isaac Asimov. Audio adaptation, Patrick Tal. Part number three. Part title, The Merchant Princes. Hover Mallow, Julian Glover. Jerome Soot, Anthony Jackson. Angkor Jaya, Peter Williams. Commodore Asper, Fraser Carr. Giant Twer, Robin Brown. Lysia, Gail McFarlane, Onumba, Douglas Blackwell, Tech Man, David Goodison, Encyclopedic Readout, David Valor, Producer, David Kane, Location, BBC Radiophonic Workshop. Foundation. Foundation and Empire. Second Foundation. Author, Isaac Asimov. Part number four. Part title, The General. Encyclopedia Galactica, 116th edition. Entry, Del Rios. At the end of 200 years, the Foundation was the most powerful state in the galaxy, except for the remains of the Empire, 
which, concentrated in the central third of the Milky Way, still controlled three quarters of the population and wealth of the universe. It seemed inevitable that the next danger that the Foundation would have to face was the final lash of the dying empire. General Del Rios, in his relatively short career, earned the title The Last of the Imperials and earned it well. He had his chance when, the first of the Empire's generals to do so, he faced the Foundation squarely. I am General Bell Rios. I recognize you. Your business? One of peace. If you are Duke and Barr, son of Onan Barr, I ask the favor of conversation. Come in. I must apologize for your wait at the door. The automatic device registers the presence of a visitor, but will no longer open the door. Your repairs fall short. Parts are no longer available. Will you sit, sir? Thank you. You're said to be young. Thirty-five? Four. In that case, I could not better begin than by informing you that I am not in the possession of love, charms, potions, or filters. Well, I have no need of artificial aids in that respect, sir. Do you receive many requests for such things? Enough. Unfortunately, an uninformed public tends to confuse scholarship with magicianry. And love life seems to be the factor that requires the largest amount of artificial aid. Tell me then, Patrician, who are the magicians, the real ones? There are no magicians. Oh, but Sawena crawls with tales of them. There are cults being built about them. I mean, eventually the matter might become a danger to the state. Why ask me? Your father once met a magician, alive and actual, and spoke with him. You had better tell me what you know. It would be interesting to tell you certain things. It would be a psychohistoric experiment of my own. What kind of experiment? Psychohistoric. My father was a patrician of the Empire and a senator of Suena. His name was Ernan Barr. I know both of him and the circumstances of his exile very well. You needn't elaborate upon that. During his exile, a wanderer came upon him, a merchant from the edge of the galaxy who knew nothing of recent imperial history and who was protected by an individual force shield. This is the magician of whom you hear myths and whispers. Is that all the story there is? I see you don't believe me. Well, I have concrete proof of his existence. His generator for the Force Shield hangs on the wall behind you. It no longer works, but if you look at it, you will see that no one in the Empire ever designed it. That is the generator. It was the generator. The secrets of its workings are beyond discovery well, now. Well, your proof is still inconclusive. You have demanded my knowledge of me. You choose to meet it with skepticism. You want me to stop? No. I continued my father's researches after he died. It was then that I discovered that Siwena was well known to Hari Seldon. Who is Hari Seldon? A psychohistorian. The last and greatest of them all. He foresaw the decline of imperial power and the barbarization of the entire galaxy. Then he foresaw wrongly, my good scientist. The empire is more powerful now than it has been in a millennium. The decay has not yet reached the heart. So this Hari Seldon foresaw a galaxy of uniform barbarism. What then? He established two foundations at the opposing ends of the galaxy. Foundations of the best, the youngest, and the strongest. They are to breed, grow, and develop. The worlds on which they were placed were chosen carefully, as were the times and the surroundings. And from these foundations will grow the seeds of a second galactic empire. I must find one of these foundations that you speak of and observe with my own eyes. Now, you say there are two. The records speak of two. Supporting evidence has been found only for one. But that is understandable. The other is at the extreme end of the long axis of the galaxy. Well, in that case, I'll visit the near one. You know where to go? I'll find my way. I thank you for your help and your hospitality. Your visit was a great honor. As for the information you gave me... I'll know how to thank you for that when I return. If you return. <laughs> How are 
going to sit and ponder forever? Does it matter who speaks first? Speak you first, then, Pharrell. You're the one who should be most worried. Because you think I'm the richest? Well, or is it that you expect me to continue as I have started? I don't suppose you forget it was my trade fleet that captured this scout ship of theirs. Well, it's nothing to sleep over. In fact, triumph, this grasping of little ships. Most likely it will anger that young man, what's his name, Del Rio's even further. You think he needs motives? I do. And this might or will save him the vexation of having to manufacture one. You forget we captured his scout ship without loss to ourselves and without warning being given to Del Rio's flagship. He doesn't know we have it. You hope. I know. Anyway, this ship has proved its value. It's provided us with information. This young man is a general of the old Galactic Empire. We knew that. You suspected that. But if a man comes with ships and wealth, with friendly offers of trade, it is only sensible not to antagonize him until we are certain that the profitable mask is not a face after all. But now... We might have been even more sensible. We might have found out first. Before allowing him to leave. Listen for him. You listen. This young general may have been a possible customer. All three of you tried to talk him into an advance contract. We have an agreement, a gentleman's agreement, against it. But you tried. So did you. Then let's forget what we should have done while he was here and concentrate on what we should do now he's gone. Right. Right. Now, what did you get out of your captured ship for him? As I told you, indeed, as you know. This man is a general in the Imperial Fleet of the Empire. He has proved his military brilliance, so I'm told, and is the idol of his men. The stories they tell of him are How quite... How do you unknown. know they were telling the truth? I used a psychic probe, roughly. In the old days, they would have used pure psychology. Painless, you know, but very sure. This is not the old days. Forel, what does he want here, this young, heroic general? That's state policy. He wouldn't confide the details of that to his crew. I know. I tried hard enough to get it out of them. Which leaves us... To draw our own conclusions. Now, this young man is a general of the Empire, yet he pretends to be a minor princeling from some obscure part of the galaxy. Couple that knowledge with the fact that the Empire has already subsidized one attack on us in my father's time, and the possibilities become ominous. There is nothing in your findings which makes for certainty. Certainty? I don't believe in the possibility. Look, we have Seldon's assurance that he will in the end form the Second Galactic Empire. This is only another Seldon crisis. And we weathered the three before this. Yes, with the guidance of Salva Hardin and Hober Mallow. Who's to guide us through this one? Seldon's laws of psychohistory only help those who help themselves. The times make the man. Another proverb. You can't count on that, not with absolute assurance. But if this is the fourth crisis, Seldon foresaw it, and it can be beaten. But as before, it can only be beaten by a method other than pure force. We must find the weak side of the enemy and attack it there. And what is that weak side? Do you know, Pharrell? No, I don't. But I intend to find out. We need spies. Can... No, not one of us. We are rusty with red tape and administrative detail. We need younger men who are out in the field. The independent traders. Yes, if there's still time. Ship, Lieutenant. None, sir. The scouting party has quartered space, but their instruments have detected nothing. The fleet is ready for an immediate attack. Not yet. Have this message sent to the Emperor. Sir. Have it coded first and transmitted by type B. Yes, sir. Has the Suenian, Duke of Bar, arrived yet? A few moments ago, sir. And then show him in here immediately. Very good, sir. Good day, Patricia. You have a good trip. I'm a little old to be taking good trips from my home planet. Now, will you tell me what you want? Bar, 
We had a discussion six months ago about your magician. Yes. You remember what I said I would do? Very well, you said you'd find them. And I did. But they are not magicians, Patricia. Far from it. They inhabit a world that is so tiny and with so few resources as to be beyond belief. Yet they are so proud and ambitious as to dream quietly and methodically of galactic rule. They are so sure of themselves that they do not even hurry. They swallow worlds at leisure, creep through systems with dawdling complacency, and they succeed. There is no one to stop them. They have built up a trading community that dominates systems further even than their ships can reach. I tell you, I was on planets closer to the Empire than they were to the Foundation. Yet to them, the Empire was a myth, but the traders of the Foundation living truths. We ourselves were mistaken for traders. The Foundationers themselves told you they aimed at galactic domination? Told me it was not a matter of telling me. It is a thing that cannot be hidden. A universal optimism that they don't even try to hide. So far it would seem to bear out quite accurately my reconstruction of events. It is no doubt a tribute to your analytical powers. It is also a terrifying comment on the growing danger to the domains of his imperial majesty. Possibly. Patricia, I need your help. Indeed. I frankly admit it. Such help as I could give means nothing. All the might of the Empire could never crush the Foundation. Why not? If you think that I have underestimated the enemy, you are wrong. I've lost a ship. I have no proof that it fell into the hands of the Foundation, but it may mean that they have already opened hostilities. Well, can you then help me by answering one specific question? What is their military power? I am the faintest notion. Well, then how do you know that the Empire cannot defeat this foundation? Because, as I told you before, I have faith in the art and principles of psychohistory and in the inevitable success of the Solon plan. But do you mean that this art of his predicted that I would attack the foundation and lose such and such a battle for such and such a reason? Are you trying to say that I am a robot following a predetermined course into destruction? No, the science doesn't concern itself with individual actions. It encompasses the entire galactic concept. We stand grasped tight in the hand of a goddess of historical necessity. Of psycho-historical necessity. And if I exercise my prerogative of free will, if I choose to attack next year, or not attack at all, how pliable is this goddess? How resourceful? Look. Attack now or never. With a single ship or all the force of the Empire, by military force or economic pressure, by open declaration of war or treacherous ambush, do whatever you wish in your freest exercise of free will, you will still lose. Because of Harley Seldon's dead hand. Because of Harley Seldon's mathematics of human behavior that cannot be stopped. I'll take that challenge. It's a dead hand against a living will. <laughs> Encyclopedia Galactica, 116th edition. Entry, Cleon II. The last strong emperor of the First Empire, he is important for the political and artistic renaissance that took place during his long reign. He is best known to romance, however, for his connection with Bel Rios, and to the common man, he is simply Rios' emperor. <laughs> I live, Roderick, I live, if you can call it life, when every scoundrel who can read a book of medicine uses me as a blank and receptive field for his experiments. There is not one of them who can count a pulse beat without a book of the ancients before him. I'm sick, and they call it unknown, the fools. The Great Hall holds the usual number of supplicants, Your Grace. Well, let them wait. Have it announced that I hold no audience today. There is a rumor, sire, that it is your heart that troubles you. Huh? 
It will trouble others more than myself if any act prematurely on that rumour. But what is it you want? Let's have it. A message, sire, has been received from General Berrios. Oh? And to what effect? He has spied out the land of these barbarians and advocates an attacking force. Ah, why bother me with this? It's, after all, a minor point. Success on a remote border with limited troops is scarcely a state affair. Sire, the man was popular here and is popular there. He is young. If he annexes a vagrant barbarian planet or two, he will become a conqueror. And a young conqueror who has proved his ability to rouse the rabble is dangerous at any time. <laughs> You're a valuable subject, Broderick. Sir. <laughs> you always suspect far more than is necessary. And I have only to take half your suggested precautions to be utterly safe. The young man has, I suppose, made no hostile moves yet. He reports not, but already he asks for reinforcements. Reinforcements? What force has he? Ten ships of the line, sire. Uh, ten ships should seem adequate for any reasonable undertaking. And in any case, who are these barbarians he is fighting? He refers to them as the Foundation. The Foundation? What is that? There is no record of it anywhere, sire. The area of the galaxy indicated falls within the ancient province of Anacreon. But there is no planet there known as the Foundation. Mm, really? There is a vague reference in the library to a group of scientists sent to that province 200 years ago to prepare an encyclopedia. I believe they called it the Encyclopedia Foundation. Well, well that seems a rather tenuous connection you're advancing? I'm not advancing it, sire. No word was ever received from that expedition after the growth of anarchy in that region. Even if their descendants still live, they have almost certainly reverted to barbarism. Mm -hmm. And he wants reinforcements. That is most peculiar. To propose to fight savages with ten ships and then to ask for more before a blow is struck. There may be more in this than would seem. <laughs> I need a man out there. A man with brain and... and loyalty. <laughs> in short, you, Broderick. And the ships, sire? Not yet. Not till we know more. <laughs> What do you think of my plans so far, Patrician? I have what value on my thoughts. I'm not a military man. Can you read a map in radio projection? Yes. Well, then, look here. These stars in gold represent the imperial territories. The red stars are those in subjection to the foundation. The pink stars are those which are probably within their economic sphere of influence. The blue stars are neutral for the present. Now... The blue stars have now been taken over by my forces, and they still advance. No opposition has appeared anywhere. The barbarians are quiet, and particularly, no opposition has come from Foundation forces. You spread your force thinly, don't you? As a matter of fact, despite appearances, I don't. The planets which I garrison and fortify are relatively few, but they are carefully chosen. The force expended is small, but the strategic result is unbeatable. Yes. Have you received a reply from the Emperor? You mean my request for reinforcements? Yes. Just the answer. No ships? No, I half expected that. Frankly, I should never have allowed myself to be stampeded by your theories into requesting them in the first place. There is Imperial Majesty can spare no ships. Psycho history could have predicted that. In fact, it probably did. I should say that Seldon's dead hand wins the opening round. I have enough ships as it is. Your Seldon wins nothing. Should the situation turn more serious, more ships will be available. As yet, the Emperor does not know all the story, which, with all respect to you, is inherently improbable. If developments warrant, but only then would I make out the case of mortal danger to the Empire. 
then for the present, you expect nothing from the Emperor? No. Unless you count a special envoy as something else. Special envoy? An old custom. A direct representative of the Crown is present on every military campaign. It's a method of preserving the symbol of personal imperial leadership in all campaigns. You will find that very inconvenient, General, extraneous authority. I don't doubt that. Did you know we've captured one of these Foundation traders, alive and with his ship intact? Well, I want you here when I'm questioning him. You may understand him better than I. Ah, come in. Your name? Nathan Devers. Are you the boss here? You are a trader of the Foundation. An independent trader of the Foundation. Listen, if you are the boss, you'd better tell your men to keep off my card. Answer questions. Do not volunteer orders. Sit down, Devers. Thank you. You're a sensible man. Thank you. Are you impressed by my face, or do you want some? You surrendered your ship when you might have decided to put up a fight. It could result in good treatment for you if you continue that sort of outlook. Good treatment is what I crave. Good. And cooperation is what I crave. Now, I've neglected the introductions. I apologize. This is Lord Duke and Barb, Patrician of the Empire, and I am Belle of Eos, Peer of the Empire, and General in the Armed Forces of His Imperial Majesty, Cleon II. The Empire? You mean the old empire they taught us about in school? Funny. I always had the idea that it didn't exist anymore. Well, look about you. It does. What's the game, General? The game is war. Empire versus Foundation. Correct. Why? I think you know why. I don't. I'm sure you do. You're thinking I ought to jump up and lay about me. I could catch you before you move if I choose my time. But you won't. No. I won't. Killing you wouldn't stop the war. And I presume there are more generals... Very accurately calculated. Besides which... I'd probably be killed two seconds after I got you. And I never like to count on that when I'm making plans. I said that you were a sensible man. But there is one thing I'd like to know. What do you mean when you say that I know why you're at war with the Foundation? I don't. And I don't like guessing games. Have you ever heard of Harry Seldon? I said I don't like guessing games. Don't you play games, Stevens? I know all about Harry Seldon's psycho-historical club trap. But how the Foundation is going to destroy the Empire and build a new one. Is that so? And who told you that? That is unimportant. Now, what do you know about the Selden thing? But if it's a fable... Don't play semantics, Stevens. I'm not. You know all I know about it. Every world has its fables. Oh, I've heard about it. Selden... Second Empire and so on. <laughs> they put kids to sleep at night with the stuff. Is that really so? Well, I've been on the planet, sir. I know your foundation. I've looked at it in the face. And you ask me? Me, when I haven't been there for more than two months in ten years? You are wasting your time. But go ahead with the war of its fables you're after. You're so confident, then, that the foundation will win? How did you squeeze that out of what I said? Because the nation would bother you if you thought that your nation might lose this war and suffer the bitter results of defeat, I know. My world once did and still does. Listen, what's defeat? I've seen wars and I've seen defeats. Now what if the winner does take over? Who's bothered? Me? <laughs> the people? Oh, some of them get killed and the rest pay extra taxes for a while, but it settles itself down in the end. Look, I spend my life in space, selling my cheap gadgets, taking my cut from the big combines. Suppose you run the Foundation. You'll still need us, because you don't know your way around, and we do. So we could bring in the hard cash. We'd make a better deal with the Empire than we've got now. I'm a man of business. If it adds up to a plus, I'm for it. Lieutenant Kerr, 
Yes, General. Prepare plan indicating position of each ship in action. Await orders on full armed defensive. Patrician, I am leaving this man with you. I expect results. This is war. And I could be cruel to failures. Remember. Look. What's going on? The forces of the Foundation are obviously coming out for their first battle. You better come with me. fit into all this. You're in my charge, that's all. Yes, but you're in this at once. By whom? By the Empire. Here. What are you... What? Uh, it's all right. We can talk now. With that on your wrist, they won't hear a thing. What do you want? Look, you make noises like a patriot. Your own world has been smashed up by the Empire, and here you are, collaborating with the Emperor's general. It doesn't make sense. I played my part. A conquering Imperial Viceroy is dead because of me. Really? When? Forty years ago. Forty years ago? That's a long time to live on memories. Does the General know about it? Yes. And still you want the Empire to win? May the Empire and all its works perish in eternal catastrophe. But I have children now and grandchildren. The general knows where to find them. So, you killed a viceroy once. You know, I'm beginning to remember a few things. We had a mayor once named Hober Mallow. He visited Suena, and he met a man named Barr. That was my father, Onam Barr. Huh? What do you know of all this? Oh, what every trader on the foundation knows. Just the same, I'd like to see you prove that you're the son of Onam Barr. The sixth and youngest to escape the massacre. Look here, then. Well, that's Mallow's monogram, all right. The design is 50 years old. I believe you. A man-sized atomic shield is proof enough for me. Uh... It is what one would expect from the enlightened wisdom of His Imperial Majesty to send so competent an observer as yourself. The eyes of the Emperor are everywhere. <clears throat> Yet still it would seem that too great an emphasis is being placed upon the difficulties of this campaign. To desire more forces under these circumstances would save almost of incapacity. Or worse, had you not already given sufficient proof of your boldness. But there is a difference between boldness and blindness. You might as well ask why the same man sprints boldly over an obstacle course in the day and falls over the furniture at night. Dramatic, but not satisfactory. You have been to this barbarian world yourself. I beg you to remember, Lord Broderick, that a world which has developed in isolation for two centuries cannot be interpreted to the point of intelligent attack by a month's visit. But you have this enemy prisoner. Nor can a single prisoner, and furthermore, one who has no close connection with the enemy world, introduce me to all the inner secrets of enemy strategy. I take it you have questioned him. I have. Well? It has been useful, but not quite so. His ship is tidy of no account. Naturally, there is a good deal about its workings that I do not understand. But then, I am not a Czech man. But you have among you those who are. I, too, am aware of that. But they have far to go before they can meet my needs. I have already sent for experts who understand the workings of the atomic field circuit the ship contains. I have received no answer. Men of that caliber cannot be spared, General. 
Surely there must be one man in your entire province who understands atomics. If there were, I would have him repairing the motors of two of my own ships. Oh, why is that? Two ships of mine are lacking sufficient power and are condemned to consolidating positions behind the line. You are not unique in that respect, General. The Emperor has similar troubles. Has a psychic probe been used upon this prisoner? A superannuated one that failed me the one time I needed it. I set it up during the prisoner's sleep and received nothing. And there is not one of my tech men who can tell me why it failed. Hmm. I think I had better speak to this trader myself. Certainly. Alone. Certainly. However, since the trader is at my permanent base, you will have to leave the front at an interesting moment. Interesting? In what way? My preparations are now complete. Within a week, the 20th fleet of the Empire advances towards the core of the resistance. Suppose I were to blast him. Who, Rios? Yes. Assassination isn't the answer. I tried it once when I was 20 and it solved nothing. I removed a villain from Siwena, but the Imperial yoke remains. But Rios isn't just a villain. He's the whole army. It would fall apart without him. There are other armies and other leaders. There is Broderick, for instance. He could demand hundreds of ships where Rios must struggle with ten. I know him by reputation. Who is this Broderick? He's the Emperor's advisor in all things and loyal only by necessity. They say there is no way to the Emperor but through him and no way to him but through infamy. And he's the one the Emperor sent to keep an eye on Rios. Hmm. I have an idea. Suppose this Broderick takes a dislike to Rios. Probably has already. He's not noted for a capacity for liking. But suppose it got really bad and the Emperor heard about it. Rios would be in trouble. Quite likely. But how do you propose to get it to happen? Huh. I don't know. I suppose Broderick could be bribed. Oh, yes. But even if you reached his scale, it wouldn't be worth it. There's probably no one so easily bribed, but he lacks even the fundamental honesty of honourable corruption. He doesn't stay bribed, not for any sum. Think of something else. There must be some way to make it work. Lord Broderick is coming to see you. Broderick? When? Tomorrow. Well, how do you know? Because the captain told me to have my men ready for dress review by him. I just thought I'd warn you. Mm. Uh, thank you, Sergeant. I appreciate it. But there was really no need. Oh, you don't know. There are the most terrible stories about him. They say he has men with blast guns who follow him everywhere, and when he wants a laugh, he just tells them to blast down anyone they meet. And they do. They say he'd like to kill the general, but he can't, because our general's a match for anyone. And he knows about Lord Broderick. So, you be careful. Uh, watch him. Thank you, Sergeant. Thank you very much. Now all we need is the bait, and Broderick will bite. Hmm. Now all we need is the bait, and Broderick will bite. You say your name is Devers. That's right. Sir... So, Devers, it seems our general is fighting an apparently meaningless war with frightful energy over a world at the end of nowhere, which, to a logical man, would seem not worth a single blast of a single gun. Yet the general is not illogical. On the contrary, I would say that he was extremely intelligent. Do you follow me? I can't say that I do, sir. Now listen further, then. The general would not waste his ships and men on a sterile feat of glory. Now, if you were my prisoner, and had told me as little as you have told the general, I would slit open your abdomen and strangle you with your own intestines. My, you are a silent fellow. According to the general, even a psychic probe made no impression. Well, Devers, I too have a psychic probe, one that ought to suit you particularly well. 
Well, it looks like money. It is money. The best money in the empire because it is backed by my own estates, which are more extensive even than the emperor's. One hundred thousand credits. Here. Yours. Well, for what? All trade goes in two directions. For what? For the truth. What is the general after? What do you mean, what's he after? The empire, of course. How will beating these barbarians give him the empire? Look. The foundation has secrets. Books. Old books. So old that their language is known only to a few. And the secrets are shrouded in ritual and religion. And none may use them. I tried. And now I'm here. And there's a death sentence waiting for me there. I see. And these old secrets. Come, for 100,000 credits, I deserve more information than that. The transmutation of elements. I have been told that practical transmutation is impossible by the laws of atomics. Oh, so it is, if atomic forces are used. There are sources of power greater than the atom. If the Foundation had used those sources, as I suggested... The General then, is, I am sure, aware of all this. But what does he intend doing once he finishes this skirmish? With transmutation, he controls the whole economy of your empire. Mineral holdings will be worthless when Rios can make tungsten out of aluminium and iridium out of iron. There'll be the greatest economic upheaval the Empire has ever seen, and only Rios will be able to control it. He's got the foundation by the scruff of the neck now, and once he's finished it, he'll be Emperor within two years. So, do you know that the foundation has been in communication with the General? Huh? You're surprised. Well, why not? They offered him a hundred tons of iridium a year to make peace. No wonder our rigidly incorruptible general refused, when he can have the iridium and the empire as well. You have earned your money, trader. But one reminder. My servants here have neither middle ears, tongues, education, nor intelligence. They can neither hear, speak, nor write. But they are very expert at interesting executions. I have bought you for 100,000 credits. Should you at any time repeat our conversation to Rios, you will be executed. My way. Now, I haven't much time. In the first place, Patricia, your Seldon is losing. Indeed. Well, to be sure, he battles well, for every planet is defended viciously, and one's taken is as much trouble to hold as to conquer. But they are taken, and they are held. Seldon is losing. He has not yet lost. Oh, the foundation itself retains less optimism. They offer me millions in order that I may not put this to the final test. So rumour has it. Does it also mention that Lord Broderick is now second in command at his own request? His own request? How did that happen? Or are you getting to like the fellow? No. It's just that he bought the office at what I consider to be a fair price. Which was? A request to the Emperor for reinforcements. So he's communicated with the Emperor, has he? I take it that you're just waiting for those reinforcements that they'll come any day now, right? Wrong! They have already come. Five ships of the line with a personal message of congratulation from the Emperor and more ships on the way. Oh, what's wrong, traitor? Nothing. The news would seem to disturb you. Now, surely you have no sudden birth of interest in the Foundation? No. There are strange points about you. You were caught easily. You surrendered at first blow with a burnt-out shield. You are quite ready to desert your world, and that without a price. It's very interesting, all this, isn't it? I craved to be on the winning side. You called me a sensible man. You no, I did. But no trader has been captured since. Are you the only sensible man? You neither fight nor flee, but turn traitor without energy. You are unique. Amazingly unique. In fact, 
suspiciously unique. I take your meaning, but you have nothing on me. I've been here six months now, and I've uh, been a good boy. There you have, and I've repaid you by good treatment. I've left your ship undisturbed and treated you with every consideration, yet you fall short. Freely offered information, for instance, on your gadgets might have been more helpful. I'm only a trader, not a technician. I sell the stuff, I don't make it. Well, there, we shall find out. It is what I came here for. I brought with me the psychic probe. It failed for contact the enemy is a liberal education. You, trader, will remove your wristband. Thank you. Uh, yes, what is it? A communication for you, General. Very well, sir. You too, Patrician. Thank you. I am not vindictive, but I shall judge the fate of your family by the results of the psychic probe. But first, this communication. Excuse me. Now. Your ship works. Well, how are we going to find it in this maze? Yes. Ask, of course. There's a sergeant. No words, please, sergeant. I'll have to use this. What the? The blaster. That's the general's blaster. You killed the general. Ah! I'm sorry, sergeant. Come on, Bar. Let's get to the ship and we'll see if they've got one to match my speed. Long ago. They couldn't have followed us. They haven't got the power. I don't know what they've done to the ship, though. Some of the gaps are out of alignment. I take it you're trying to get to the foundation. Yes. But I'm having to use directional control at the moment. Still, I have been in touch with the association briefly. Association? The Association of Independent Traders. What Rio said was true. About the offer of tribute? Mm -hmm. They offered it, and had it refused. Things are bad. They've been fighting large ships previously never encountered, which means that Rios wasn't spinning as a yarn. He has received more ships. Broderick has switched sides, and I've miscalculated the whole thing. So much for improvisations, then. We can't cut through the Imperial Alliance to return to the Foundation. We can do nothing but wait patiently. Wait? You're still satisfied to wait, even with the Imperial Navy where it is? I would wait in perfect confidence, even if they'd landed upon the planet Terminus itself. It can't work like that. They're strong and we're weak. What can Selden do about There's it? There's nothing to do. It's already done. Maybe. But I wish you'd finished off, Rios. And have Broderick take a man with also when I, his hostage? No, let Rios live. But six months in the enemy base with nothing to show for it. Well, now, wait. What about this? Hmm? The message capsule Rio's received. Does that count as something? I don't know. It depends what's in it. What are you doing? Opening it. Can you, without Rio's personal characteristics? Well, if I can't, I'll resign from the association. Mm -hmm. A capsule's a crude job, anyway. You ever see a foundation capsule? Half the size and impervious to electronic analysis. Got it. <laughs> it's from Broderick. The message medium's permanent. In a foundation capsule, the message would be oxidized to gas within a minute. What does it say? From Amal Broderick to General Bell Rios. I greet you. Planet 1220 no longer resists. Plans of offense, as outlined, continue smoothly. The enemy weakens visibly, and the ultimate ends will surely be gained. It says nothing. Now Broderick's playing a general, the empty-headed peacock. Oh, wait a minute, hold on. Throw it away. Will you hold on? Now, what does he mean by 
ultimate ends in view. The conquest of the Foundation? No, we know that. But does the Emperor? What do you mean? I'll show you. Now, there's no one in the Empire who can open this capsule without knowledge of the personal characteristics of Rios. No. For the Emperor can open it, can't he? Personal characteristics of government officials must be on fire. Oh, the Majesty. Then when you, a Sewellian patrician and a peer of the realm, tell the Emperor that Broderick and Rios are planning to depose him and hand him this capsule as evidence, what will he think Broderick's ultimate ends are? <laughs> do first. Do you know how many people want to see the Emperor every day? About one million. Do you know how many he sees? About ten. I have to work through the civil service, and that makes it even harder, but we can't afford the aristocracy. We have almost 100,000 credits. A single peer of the realm would cost us that, and it would take at least three to form a bridge to the Emperor. It may take 50 supervisors and commissioners to do the same, but they would only cost us a hundred apiece. I'll do the talking. You don't know the etiquette of imperial bribery. But it's going to take time. Well, how long? A month, if we're lucky. A month? But the emperor doesn't take it into his head to go to the summer planets, where he sees no petitioners at all. The foundation! The foundation will take care of itself. But the Emperor is indisposed, gentlemen. It is useless to take the matter to my superior. His Imperial Majesty has seen no one in a week. He will see us. It is only a matter of seeing some member of the Privy Council. Impossible. It be more than my job's worth. I'm willing to help, you understand, but naturally I want something less vague. Something I can present to my superior. If my business could be told to any but the highest, it would scarcely be important enough to rate an audience with His Imperial Majesty. I propose that you take a chance. That's all very well, but... Naturally, such a risk should have its compensation. We have already been greatly obliged by your kindness, but if you would allow us to express our gratitude in advance. <laughs> Backed by the previous secretary, eh? Good money. I'm happy that it's satisfactory. To return to the subject. No. We know more about you than you think. Is it not true that you have recently been the guests of General Rios? Is it not true that you have escaped from the midst of his army with, to put it mildly, astonishing ease? Is it not true that you possess a small fortune in notes backed by Lord Broderick's estates? In short, is it not true that you are a pair of spies? I deny the right of a petty commissioner to accuse us of crimes. We shall leave. You will not leave. I am no commissioner. I am a lieutenant of the Imperial Police, and you are under arrest. Police? I'm afraid I have no choice, Lieutenant. <laughs> Quick, to the ship! Can you get away from them? Just watch me. There's not an Imperial ship that could follow me anywhere. But there's nowhere left for us to run. And we can't fight the whole Empire. What's there to do? What can anyone do? No one has to do anything. Have a look at this new ship. Hmm? It's all over. Recalled and arrested? Broderick and Rios. Why? It doesn't say, but what does it matter? The war with the Foundation is over and Siwena is up in revolt. We'll get the full details in one of the provinces later. Now, if you don't mind, I'll get some sleep. <laughs> I must congratulate you. 
Your mission succeeded beyond my wildest dreams. Thank you, Farrell. But it wasn't my doing. It is Lord Barr here you have to thank. Not true, Davis. I did nothing at all. It was inevitable from the first. But you went to Trantor? Yes, sir, we did. Surely that must have been the reason for Rio's recall. Ah, but we never saw the Emperor. The reports we picked up on our way back concerning the trial showed it to be the purest frame-up. Rios was accused of being tied up with subversive elements of the Imperial Court. And he was innocent? Heavens, yes. Broderick was a traitor in principle. But even he was never guilty of the specific charges brought against him. It was a judicial farce. But a necessary, inevitable, predictable one. You are not clear, Lord Barr. Well, you see, sir, you and Divas had the idea that beating the Empire meant prying apart the Emperor and his general. You tried bribery and lies. You appealed to ambition and fear. But you got nothing for your pains. And all through this threshing up of tiny ripples, the Selden wave continued onward, quietly but quite irresistibly. The dead hand of Harry Selden was guiding all of us. He knew that a man like Rios would have to fail, since it was his very success that brought failure. Mm, I can't say that you're getting any clearer. Just look at the situation. A weak general could never have endangered us, obviously. A strong general during the reign of a weak emperor would never have endangered us either, for he would have turned inwards towards a much more fruitful target. So it's only the combination of strong emperor and strong general that can harm the foundation. For a strong emperor cannot be dethroned easily, and a strong general is forced to turn outwards, beyond the frontiers. I see. But what keeps the emperor strong? It's because he permits no strong subjects. Rios won victory, so the Emperor became suspicious. Why did Rios refuse a bribe? Why did his most trusted courtier suddenly favor Rios? Very suspicious. So, he was recalled, accused, condemned, and murdered. The Foundation wins again. There is not a conceivable combination of events that does not result in the Foundation winning. It was inevitable. Whatever Rios did, and whatever we did... You haven't proved your point yet. What if the Emperor and the General had been the same person? I can't prove anything. I haven't the mathematics, but I appeal to your reason. What would happen to even a strong Emperor who preoccupied himself with wars at the extreme end of the galaxy? How long would he have to remain away from the capital before somebody raised the standard of civil war and forced him home? Ah. I once told Rios... And not all the strength of the Empire could sway the dead hand of Hari Seldon. Then the Empire can never threaten us again. That's how it seems to me. Then there are no more enemies. There's the second foundation. At the other end of the galaxy. Not for centuries. Perhaps there are internal enemies. Are there? Who, for instance? People, for instance, who might like to spread the wealth a bit and keep it from concentrating too much out of the hands of those that work for it. See what I mean? Title, Foundation. Foundation and Empire... Second Foundation. Author, Isaac Asimov. Audio adaptation, Patrick Tarver. Part number four. Part title, The General. Bell Rios, Dinsdale Landon. Lucan Barr, Peter Howell. Latham Devers, Michael Harbour. Broderick, Martin Friend. Senate Forel, Ronald Herdman. Cleon II, William Fox. Lieutenant Brandt, Michael Kilgarry. First trader, Hayden Jones. Second trader, John Ruddock. Encyclopedic readout, David Valor. Producer, David Kane. Location, BBC Radiophonic Workshop.
title, Foundation. Foundation and Empire, Second Foundation. Author, Isaac Asimov. Part number five. Part title, The Mule. Encyclopedia Galactica, 116th edition. Entry, The Mule. Probably the most important single threat of the Selden plan was posed by the mutant known to history simply as the mule. Less is known about the mule than about any other figure of comparable significance in all galactic history. His real name is unknown. His early life and origins mere conjecture. Even the period of his greatest renown is known to us almost entirely through the eyes of his antagonists, and principally from the observations of a young foundation bride. It's only a small city, of course, compared to the Foundation. There's not much in the way of shops or entertainment. But there's no secret police, either. It's beautiful. Mm. It's just like a toy city, all white and pink and so clean. Toran! There's Father over there. Oh, Toran! Great to see you. Great to see you again, Father. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, what about uh, some formal introductions? Yes, yes, this is Beta. Beta, my father. Hello. Fran. Fran. Hmm. And this venerable gentleman is my Uncle Randu. Hello. Hello. We've heard a lot about you. Really? Oh, Torin couldn't write about anything else. <laughs> he even sent me a crystal of you. Well, I thought you were beautiful then, but uh, you look much better in the flesh. Thank you. Now, to tell you the truth, Peter, I've been worried about Torin. I never really thought he knew what he was up to. Is he still chasing young women, Uncle Randall? When he's not sleeping or eating. You just pick up the luggage and walk, Randall. I'm going to have to watch you, Father. Watch and learn, son. (laughs) You see, (laughs) uh, next birthday he'll be 60. I I thought he'd have acquired a little dignity (laughs) by now, a little self-restraint at least. But no, not a chance. He's a throwback to the original traders, that's my opinion. Oh, I must say, with all respect, she's a very desirable woman, your wife. Thank you. Oh, what a meal. Delicious. My compliments to the chef. Yeah, I haven't eaten so well in months. All I want to do now is lie back and sleep. Well, before you drop off altogether, I'll make some coffee. Yeah, you will not enter my kitchen while you're in Sit down. You cook the meal. That's enough for one day at your age. Oh, Oh, really? (laughs) Well, I like your woman, Torren. But even so, I'm not sure I agree with the extreme act of marriage. I never did such a thing. You were never in one place long enough to establish residence requirements. <laughs> it's largely a legal formality, Father. The situation has its convenience. Mainly for the woman. Anyway, it's Torrance's decision. Marriage is an old custom among the Foundationers. The Foundationers are not fit models for honest traders. But my wife's a Foundationer. Yeah. Ah, there we are. Thank you. Thank you. Beta, have you studied history? I was the despair of my teachers, but I learned a bit eventually. A citation for scholarship, that's all. What did you learn? You want me to tell you everything? No, just use your knowledge to make a judgment. Is the galactic situation as bad as it appears to be? No, ignore him. He's just trying to ruin our digestions. I think we're close to another Selden crisis. Really? I was on the foundation as a student, and I remember we were always expecting a Selden crisis then. But nothing happened. So why do you think that we're close to a crisis now? Well, the world Selden lived in was falling apart, dying because of inertia, despotism, and the maldistribution of goods and wealth. Yes. Selden foresaw an inevitable collapse, followed by a period of barbarism. 
So he devoted his life to trying to shorten that period of barbarism. Ah, so he established the two foundations and honor be to his name. Well, I went to school too for a while. Now, our foundation was so situated in space and the historical environment was such that within only 1,000 years it was to become the foundation of a new and greater empire. Beta Uncle Randu knows all this. In the 100 this. years since the last Selden crisis, almost every vice of the old empire has reappeared within the foundation. We are suffering from exactly the same three diseases that killed the empire. Mm. Inertia, our ruling class knows only one law, no change. Yeah. Despotism, they know only one form of argument, force. Quite and right. maldistribution, the ruling class has only one plan for the future, to uh, grab uh, everything for themselves. Exactly, while others starve. <laughs> Beta, you're no fool, girl, you're right. The monopolists of the foundation sit on their money bags while we, the traders who won them their wealth in the first place, we live out our lives in genteel poverty on provincial little planets like Haven. Generation after generation, never knowing even a slight improvement. Your father's a kind of latter-day Latham Devers. Latham <laughs> Devers was the greatest trader in history. And those cutthroats and their paid thugs who rule the foundation then and now, they killed him because he loved justice. And for that and for a thousand other crimes, they owe us a debt of blood. And by galaxy, that debt will be paid one day. Beta, go on with what you were saying before he gets his breath back. There's nothing much to go on about. There must be a crisis, but I don't see how there can be. There are some progressive forces on the foundation, but they're very weak. And you traders may have the will to rebel, but you're broken up and weak too. Perhaps if all the forces of goodwill in and out of the foundation could combine and work together... No, well... no, child, no, 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 no. There's no hope within the foundation. None. There are those who whip and those who are whipped. That's all. Dad, you've never been to the foundation. You know nothing about it. The political underground there is made up of people with just as much courage as any trader. No, I... Before you say anything else, I'd better tell you Beta's a member of the underground, and so am I. Uh, all right, all right, no offense. The trouble with you, Father, is you've got a provincial outlook. Like you think just because a few traders get together on some completely unwanted planet like Haven and then refuse to pay their taxes to the Foundation, you think that means something? Well, it means something to us. Not one foundation tax collector has ever got a single coin out of Haven. Now, that means something to and us. And what would you do if the foundation ever sent more than just a single tax collector? Eh? If they sent a whole fleet to collect the taxes? We'd blast them to pieces. Oh, Dad, once the foundation decided it was worth its while to deal with Haven, you'd be smashed within days, within yeah, minutes. they'd never be able to. The traders need allies inside the foundation. Just as much as the Foundation Underground needs you. The boy's right, Fran. You know he is. You don't like it and neither do I. Uh. Torren, I'll tell you why I started all this. Yeah? Recently, we've had two visits from Foundation tax collectors. Oh. The local people made sure they got nothing, but they'll be back in strength. Oh, that? Your father knows all this, Torren. Really, he does. Look at him. Stubborn but worried. He knows Haven is in trouble. And he knows that against the full force of the Foundation, we're helpless. Yeah. But he just repeats the old formula, blast them to pieces. Really, he knows it isn't as simple as that anymore. Mm. But what can we do? Well, we formed a small group of fairly influential citizens, and we've made some contact with other trader planets. We haven't done anything yet, but we've made a start. But a start mm -hmm. towards what? The most obvious thing would be a rebellion, if we could get all the trader planets to join with us. We've decided that, as you said, there must be a Selden crisis somewhere in the near future. We were rather hoping it would be provoked by one of the periphery warlords getting ambitious enough to attack the Foundation. Not a chance. Every one of those warlords, no matter how ambitious he is, knows for a certainty that any attack on the Foundation would be simple suicide. Right. Bell Rios of the old Empire was a better man than any of them. He attacked with all the resources of the galaxy, but he couldn't defeat the Selden plan. Is there one warlord who doesn't know the history of the Foundation and those who attack it? There might be. Just no. one. Not a foundation man, not a provincial governor or anything like that, but in the last few months, there have been rumors about a strange man called the Mule. Mule? Ever heard of him, Torn? No. What do you know about him, Uncle? Oh, very little, really, but we've heard rumors that he's had important victories on the edge of the periphery. The rumors are probably very exaggerated, but all the same, it would be interesting to know more about him. 
he might have the ability and the intelligence and yet not believe in Harry Seldon's laws. We could perhaps encourage his disbelief in the infallibility of the Foundation mm -hmm. if we could make contact with him. He might attack. Yeah. And if he did, the Foundation would win. Yes, but not necessarily easily. It might be a crisis and we could take advantage of it and force concessions from the Foundation dictatorship. The way Uncle Rando puts it, it'll be worth a try. But how do we contact this mule? That's where we can use you two, if you're willing. Willing? Willing to take a second honeymoon. <laughs> we never really had a first honeymoon. We couldn't afford it. Well, then, now's your chance. We want you to take a honeymoon, all expenses paid, on Calgon. Calgon? It's a small pleasure planet, only 7,000 parsecs from here. Semi-tropical, climate, beaches, beautiful water, entertainments, <laughs> everything. But why Calgon? We think that that's where the mule is. Certainly his forces are there. He took it about a month ago, without even a battle, despite the Calgon warlord's threatening speeches. Where's the warlord now? He isn't. Disappeared. Now, what do you say? Will you go? What do ah. we do when we get there? You yes. enjoy your honeymoon and find out whatever you can. If you can actually make contact with the mule. We don't oh, expect well. that, Fran. Mm. If you could just look around, see how the mule governs, what kind of forces he's got there. Of course, it might be dangerous. We don't know, but it might be. Doran? When do we leave? Ah, that's what I wanted to hear. We'll show these foundation bureaucrats that the trader spirit isn't crushed yet. An audience is granted by His Excellent Mayor in Boer to Captain Han Pritchard of Intelligence. Captain Pritchard? Your Excellency. You know why you're here? Disciplinary action has been taken against you by your superior officer. The papers concerning the matter have come in the ordinary course of events to my notice, and since no event in the Foundation is too insignificant to warrant my attention, I took the trouble to ask for further information in your case. You're charged with three times refusing to accept an assignment what have you to say about that? Excellence, the assignment is not important. There are far more important things to be done, and they are not being done. Exactly how do you know they are not being done? You care to elaborate? Excellence, it's obvious. Well, none of my superiors denies that I have experience, ability, and intelligence. And those qualities tell me that we've got our priorities wrong. Captain, there is no reason to raise your voice. I can be persuaded by logic, but never by volume. And your logic appears to be rather flimsy. Excellent. You do not seem to realize that you are arrogating to yourself the right to determine intelligence policy. You are usurping the duties of your superiors. Excellent. My duty is not to my superiors, but to the state. Fallacious. Your superior has his superior who has his superior, which is me, and I am the state. You have therefore disobeyed me, which is an act of treason. However... I am prepared to exercise what you have rightly described as my proverbial justice and to give you an opportunity to explain the cause of your disobedience. I don't want to dispose of a useful intelligence officer if it is at all avoidable. Proceed. Excellent. For the last year and a half, I have been living on the planet of Calgon. My instructions were to establish an identity for myself as a retired merchant, then to direct Foundation Intelligent Activity on Calcum and to prepare an organization which could act as a check on the foreign policy of the warlord of Calcum. Proceed. Excellent. Two months ago, I returned here. The organization had achieved its purpose, a complete survey of the capabilities of the planet. Proceed. The warlord of Calcum had a virtually perfect defense system capable of repelling any attack. Then, one month ago, an unknown soldier of fortune captured Calcum without a fight. The warlord made no attempt to defend himself and is now presumed dead or depersonalized. The government of the planet goes on as before. But the head of the state is now this unknown commander, the mule. The what? Excellence. 
the conqueror of Calgon, is called the Mule. Little is known about him, apart from rumours. His father is unknown, his mother died in childbirth, his upbringing was that of a vagabond, his education consisted entirely in drifting around the various tramp planets of the periphery. He has no name apart from the mule, which is apparently what he calls himself. It seems to signify his immense physical strength and his stubbornness of purpose. I am not uh, interested in his physique, Captain. What is his military strength? Excellent. There are rumors of enormous fleets of warships. But so far, he appears to control only a relatively small territory. But the exact limits of his power have not yet been determined. And what has all this got to do with the assignment you refuse to accept? Excellence, the mule must be investigated. And I will be the right man for the job. But instead of that, I'm assigned to some fruitling little planet called Haven as some kind of tax collector. You appear to have made a very partial survey of the situation, Captain. The planet Haven is populated by the descendants of the traders. Anarchists, rebels, social maniacs, and other undesirable elements. They claim foundation ancestry, but they refuse to pay their taxes. Oh, yes, but anyway. I do not can... welcome interruptions, Captain. Now, I am aware that Haven itself is not very important, but they are not alone, Captain. There are dozens of these little planets, all populated by various combinations of the dregs of space, all refusing to accept the absolute authority of my government. This is a test case, Captain. By making an example of Haven, we can persuade the others to accept their proper place in the order of things, obedient servants of our government. But if we fail to crush these impertinent creatures here and now, then they will certainly, certainly make contact with criminal elements within the Foundation. And there are such elements, Captain. Social reformers, Democrats, and other political perverts even here, even here. <coughs> Excellency, I have been told all this. But whatever the political implications of these remnants of the traders, the most immediate danger to the Foundation comes not from them, but from the remnants of the old empire. The warlords of the periphery still have power, Excellence. And if they are brought together by the mule, either by alliance or by conquest, then that would present us with a very real threat. I should be employed investigating the mule and not sent out on some child's errand collecting taxes from backward planets. Captain Pritchard! I am going to complete my explanation despite your lack of manners. Now listen carefully. It is a soldier's failing to think that weapons are the real threat and the real defense. The generals of the Imperial Age and the warlords of the present day are equally impotent against us. Selden's science is based not on individual heroism, as you seem to believe, but on the social and economic trends of history. Yes, Excellence, but Selden's science is known only to Selden. We ourselves have only faith. Captain Pritchard, enough! Sir. The facts are quite clear, quite simple. Selden guarantees victory over any warlord who might attack the Foundation. But with the descendants of the traders, the matter is more complex. We are the foundation, but so in a way are they. A war with them would be civil war. Selden's plan does not guarantee the outcome of a civil war. The foundation would survive, but this government might not. So you have your orders. You will obey those orders. You may be excused. anything yet. Exactly. We're getting absolutely nowhere. There might just as well be no mule at all for all the difference he seems to have made. Everybody says that things are just as they always were, except nobody's seen the old warlord of Calgon since the takeover. But then nobody's seen the mule either. Mm. He doesn't live in the palace. He doesn't make speeches. He doesn't even tour the planet. He might not even be on Calgon at all. He might have left or he... Might never have been here. Oh, all right, we'll go back, but not today, eh? Tomorrow, maybe. Now, just relax, lie back, let the sun do you good. 
Oh. Look at that. What? That, that acrobat over there. Oh, he's just another of those beach entertainers. There are hundreds of them. Yes, but he's the best I've ever seen. Oh. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. He should be in a circus. He's good enough. <laughs> he looks like he'd been broken into pieces and put together again, but the parts don't quite fit. Like a big puppet. Oh, oh don't give him anything. Don't worry, my lady. I'm not here for that. I just want to stare at your beauty for a moment. Oh. Oh. The most beautiful eyes I've ever seen. Ever. Huh? My lady, in the ancient days, you would have been a goddess. Torrin, give him a five-credit piece. Oh, all right. My lady, I did not speak for money. I simply spoke the truth. You have kindness, intelligence, and a loveliness I've never seen before. All in your eyes. My lady, do you want me to go? Or may I stay and beg your help in Look, my trouble? If, if money's your trouble, well, it's my trouble too. Let him so. talk. What, what's he Please. Gonna... Now, what is your trouble? The guards are... The guards are looking for me. Why? Is it illegal to entertain people on the beach? No, my lady. But it is forbidden to leave the service of the mule. The mule? What do you say? I ran away, my lord. I thought I could just take my freedom. But ever since, I've been more terrified than I was in his service. I've looked at every face, looking for someone who might help me. I believe I've found that help now. In your eyes, my lady. Did you say you served the mule? For as long as I could bear it, sir. But always looking for an escape. I'd like to help. We both would. But really, I, I don't see how we can. We're strangers here. Have you actually seen him? Seen him? Sir, I served the mule. I was his clown, his fool, his toy. Stop that man! No, no! Hold him! No! No, no, protect me, my lady. My, my, my lord, my lady. protect me. So, now, I've got you at last, eh, Worm? Take your hands off. What? Take your hands off him. But, this is entertaining. This is causing no one any trouble. Do you know what he is? Or what he was, rather? Look, this creature is. was the favourite clown of our lord and master. Now, my mule doesn't like it when his toys run away. He doesn't like it at all. So I'm taking him back for punishment. You've just seen his final performance. <laughs> Come on, worm. Ooh. Leave him alone. My lord. I didn't think I'd need this, but the Foundation recommended it to all their citizens who travel to less civilized parts of the galaxy. The Foundation? Yes. This man is a friend of mine, and I want him to stay with me. Now, you can either attempt to use force and risk the consequences, or you can just leave and go about your business. Have you got Foundation identity papers? At my ship. I realize I could have you disintegrated for threatening me with that stun pistol. Do you realize what would happen if you did? Your body would be sent in small pieces as an apology to the Foundation. I'm going to check this with my commanding officer. And we're going back to my ship. With our friend... Uh, um... Magnifico. Well, we'll know where to find you. But if you make any attempt to leave this planet, you'll be blasted. <laughs> Come on, Beta. Let's get back to the ship. Come on, Magnifico. Oh, thank you, my lady. Quick, Beta, seal the outer door. Now, this one. Right. For the moment, we're safe. Oh, my lord. My lady, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, get up off your knees, man. You're not a slave. I'm grateful, my lord. Well, don't be too grateful yet. We're still on the mule's planet, don't forget. 
What's going to happen now? I don't know. I just have to wait and see. Well, whatever happens, I thought you were superb standing up to that guard like that. Superb. Superb. <gasps> the mule. He's coming for me. I've got to let them in, you know. We're only visitors here. Wait. Let's have a look at them on the scanner first. All right. Seems to be only one of them. I should inform you this is a Foundation ship and is consequently Foundation territory by Interspace Treaty. I know all that. Just let me in. You'll enter with your hands empty and in the air. All right, agreed. Now let me in. <sighs> That's not the mule. <laughs> It's just a man. Exactly. I am not the mule. And I'm not armed. And I come in peace. I'm here to help you, if you'll let me. Who are you? I was on the beach. I saw what happened, and I followed you back here. I said, who are you? I'm a citizen of the Foundation, and unlike you, I have my papers to prove it. Are you implying that I'm not? I'm not implying anything. I'm stating facts. You are a citizen of Haven. Your wife is the only Foundation citizen on this ship. And she is known to be a member of the Democratic Resistance Movement. You got out of Turner's recently, didn't you? You know a lot. I believe that the password the week you left was Sultan Hardin and Freedom. How do you know Walker that? Walker at heart was your section leader. I, too, am a section leader. Yes, it doesn't matter under what name. The underground spreads widely and in some unexpected direction. My official position is Officer of the Foundation Department of Information, Captain Han Richard. Well, may I sit down? Of course. Thanks. Now, I know a lot about today's events. I know that the mule's clown escaped. I know that his security forces are ransacking the planet. I saw you preventing the guard from arresting that man. He fits the clown's description pretty well. Oh, no. But I don't know why you should be risking your lives to hold on to him. Yes. Well, I didn't think you'd tell me. But if you're waiting here for the mule himself to come with armed guards and fanfares and such like, relax. The mule doesn't work that way. How do you know that? I've been trying to contact him myself. Although I've done a rather more thorough job of it than you two amateurs, I didn't get anywhere either. Fritcher, what do you want? I'm offering you a deal. An exchange. You have the clown. He's important. He's one of the very few people in the galaxy who's actually seen the mule. He's important to me. Don't let them take me, my no, lord. No. I need him to try to get the idiots who govern the Foundation to open their eyes. I've risked my life coming to Calgon instead of going where I was told to go. But if I return with concrete evidence of the power of the mule, I can save my own neck and the Foundation. Why should we help you save the Foundation? Why should we help defend a dictatorship? Oh. You mentioned the deal, an exchange. You let me take the clown to the Foundation, and I'll help you get away from Calgon. Now, wait. How do we know the mule will be a worse dictator than the Foundation bureaucrats? Well, it's... Send the clown out of the room a moment, will you? My, my lady. Please, my lady, go. Would you go through to the dining area? Through there. You'll find food and drink in the cabin. Yes, my lady. For you, I'll go. Now... The proof that the mule would be even more of a dictator than fat little Inver is already. All right. The mule is never seen, right? Why not? He's certainly shrewd enough to know the value of a personality cult, the glamour of public demonstrations and such like. Mm -hmm. If he denies himself all that, there must be a reason. Personal contact would reveal something of overwhelming importance, something he wishes to hide. The mule is not a human being. The mule is a mutant. I don't know the extent of his mutation or exactly what his powers are, but he's clearly not a subhuman mutant. In a matter of months, he's come from nowhere, from nothing, to be the ruler of a fair slice of the periphery of the galaxy, right? Now, the question is, can such a genetic accident as the mule, apparently with superhuman capabilities, perceptions, or even powers, we don't know, but can that kind of one-in-a-billion accident be taken into account in the Selden plan? If the mule is superhuman... Why didn't his guards just kill us on the beach? I don't know. He may not be ready for the Foundation yet. What do you mean? It's a sign of intelligence to resist provocation until you're ready to take action. Believe me, the mule will be far more dangerous than Mayor Inber simply because he's more able, more intelligent. Now, suppose you let me speak to the clown. Magnifico. My lady... 
Could you please come here? This man wants to ask you some questions. Would you try to answer them, please? For your sake, my lady. Right. Now, you've seen the mule with your own eyes, haven't you? I have respected, sir. And felt the weight of his arm with my whole body. Can you describe it? Uh, it's frightening even to recall him respected, sir. He is a mighty man. Against him, you'd look like an undernourished child. His hair is crimson. His teeth are like diamonds. And his eyes, respected, sir, no one sees. What? What do you mean? He covers them with black eye covers. It, it, it is said he can see by magic transcending all human vision. I have heard that he kills with his eyes. It is true. As I live, it is true. All right, preacher. Get us out of here and we'll bring Magnifico to the foundation. Good. We use this ship. I'll leave mine behind. Uh, let's see these controls. I'll have to work some pretty maneuvers to get us away from the mule's patrols. I can't guarantee anything. Whatever happens, we can't stay here. True. So let's start working out our tactics and our route. Encyclopedia Galactica, 116th edition. Entry, Ebling Mies. In a period where the survival of the Foundation still rested upon the superiority of its technology, respect was given to those who worked in the field of pure science. And in this field, no one commanded more respect than Professor Ebling Mies. Ah, you're hiding in here, eh? I have never hidden from anything in my life. <laughs> this is my office, Professor. Mm -hmm. You were not invited to enter, but uh, I will forget that intrusion on one condition. That you leave immediately. Well, I did have something to tell you, Mr. Mayor, but... I am usually addressed as Excellence, Professor. If I leave now, Mr. Mayor, you'll never know what I came to tell you. Any request for an audience is to be submitted in triplicate to the appropriate office. Oh. Any unauthorized entry into my presence may be construed as being an attack on my person which, of course, constitutes a clear case of treason punishable as such. Right. <clears throat> Probably wasn't all that important after all. Just a little something about the next Selden crisis, but forget it. Uh, miss, I have decided to be tolerant with you. Uh, you may have the privilege of addressing me hmm? briefly. Well, <clears throat> you know what I've been doing lately. Your investigations into the mathematics of psychohistory have been intended to duplicate Harry Seldon's work with the eventual aim of tracing the course of future history for the use of the planning department of this government. <laughs> you actually read these reports? I read everything. Nothing is too insignificant for my attention. No, oh, you're a great man for insignificant things. Miss, we have established that I am very well acquainted with your research. Now come to the point... I thought it was about time I told you what's not in the reports. Not in the reports? I mean what I've really been doing. What you've really been doing? The Inber. You're an offensive little man at the best of times. Oh. When you will insist on interrupting me with this curious echo effect, I get this uncontrollable urge to knock your head off. Oh, so really? Sit down. Uh, shut up. Close your mouth and listen. Oh, oh really? Now, as any intelligent biped realized long ago, official reports are only important for what is not reported in them. So what I have to tell you now is not in any report and never will be. Even my assistants know nothing about it, right? Good. Now, a few words about the time vault. For every crisis, Selden has prepared a special simulation of himself to help us to clarify the situation, to help us to understand. Four crises so far, and four appearances in this vault. I know all about it. First time, he appeared at the height of the crisis. Second time, just afterwards. At the third and fourth crises, he was ignored. Probably because he wasn't needed. But recent investigations, not included in my reports, of course, indicate that he did appear anyway at the proper times, even though he was ignored. I get it? Selden always appears at a crisis. 
Now, officially, I've been trying to recreate the science of psychohistory. But taking advantage of your generous research grants <laughs> and taking advantage of your almost legendary ignorance, I have made some small advances in studying the time vault. And from my study, I'd say it was getting itself ready for another appearance by Solden. What? Which means that we are now quite close to the fifth Selden crisis. Close? How close? Well, the control computer has double-checked most of the major circuitry, but there's still some things it hasn't done. How close? Four weeks. That's not possible. Uh, four weeks and one day, to be precise. Do you understand what that means? It means you're in trouble. For a crisis to come to a head in four weeks means it must have been growing for years. Right. But there isn't anything. There's nothing hanging over us. Look at that. That's my weekly summary of the entire galactic situation. And all our most pressing foreign policy initiatives in progress at the moment. There's nothing there that is even vaguely threatening. It's all small-scale routine business, and it's all under perfect control. <laughs> Look, see for yourself. Now, where's your crisis going to come from, eh? Eh? What is it? Captain Han Pritcher of the Intelligence Department has just returned from Planet Calgum. Uh -huh. In accordance with your order X20-513, he's been imprisoned pending execution. Those accompanying him are being held for questioning. Well, well. Forgive me, Your Excellence, but Captain Pritcher reported dangerous conditions on Calgum. In accordance with your order X20-515, he has not been given any formal hearing but his remarks have been recorded and a full report filed. What are you trying to tell me, idiot? Your Excellency, I do most humbly beg your forgiveness, but it appears that one of the people with Captain Pritcher is the missing member of the court of the new warlord of Calgon, oh. known commonly as the Mule. Well, if he is the man the Mule wants back, put him in a ship and send him back. No, no. Ah, it appears to be a little too late for that, Your Excellency. Well, what do you mean? We are just receiving reports from the Selenian frontier region. Ships identified as of Calgon origin have entered Foundation territory. Gosh! The ships are armed and some fighting is reported. What action should be taken, Excellence? Uh, uh, Excellence? Look, uh, get Pritcher and the people with him up here immediately. Uh, here, immediately. Yes, Your Excellence. Hmm. Well, Rimber, you're going to be a very busy little man for the next four weeks and one day, aren't you? Gentlemen, this assembly of the representatives of the independent trader planets has been called for one purpose, and one purpose only. To decide as a matter of urgency our military policy and the commitment of our allied armed forces. The war between the Foundation and the Mule has now been underway for three weeks and one day. All the information we have points to the fact that the mule is winning. My brother Francis will outline the situation. In three weeks and one day of total warfare, the mule has lost a maximum of ten ships. His forces have destroyed fifteen times that number of foundation ships. Even more serious, there have been repeated cases of Foundation forces deserting to the Mule. In one case, an entire fleet and its command ship. The Mule now controls some 90% of the periphery of the galaxy and several important planets much closer to the Foundation and closer to us. Gentlemen, the Mule is winning. The war is spreading, and it's spreading in our direction. Now, gentlemen, so far we have been neutral in this war, and so far we have not been attacked. But the time is fast coming when we must choose the mule or the foundation. Oh, I know, I know, our original intention was to achieve exactly the present situation to encourage a war which would weaken the Foundation's grip on our planets. 
and allow us to insist on a proper democratic equality between the Foundation and ourselves. But the mule is doing more than just weakening the Foundation's power. He is bleeding the Foundation to death. And we must decide what our position would be if the mule were to conquer the Foundation. I know it seems unthinkable, but we have to think about it. The time has come to commit the traders' armed forces in this war, and to commit them to the defense of the Foundation against the mule. No, I, want I, want I, I want to speak, Randall. You have the floor. I am about for the world of Navy. I say it would be a disgrace to our ancestors, the original traders, for us to lift one finger in defense of the fat maggots who rule the foundation. Let us not betray our ancestors, the martyrs to justice and freedom, like the great Leighton Devers, persecuted, degraded, and finally killed by whom? By the mule? No, by the fat clerks of the foundation. Brothers, Randall seems Better the dictator you know than the dictator you don't know. Well, I don't agree. I can't imagine any worse government in all the galaxy than the malignant bureaucracy of the Foundation. I don't believe the mule could be half as bad for us. After all, brothers, look at the facts. Has the mule ever insulted us? Never. Has he once failed to respect our neutrality? Not once. No, brothers, I tell you plainly. I have just received this message from the commander of our defenses in the second sector. Well? The coordinator of Fransart, Planet Haven. Prepare yourself, brother. I have just witnessed the total extinction of the planet Namon by the forces of the mule. There cannot be any survivors. The planet no longer exists. The attack was entirely without warning or provocation. As I send you this message, the mule ships are regrouping, moving towards my base. Prepare yourselves to face the mule. I propose that we make an immediate offer to help the Foundation and let me commit our entire combined fleet and all the armaments we have to help the Foundation smash the mule. <laughs> Enabling me to see the prisoners. You pass. Here, signed by mighty Inber himself. Right. Oh, it's you again. Yes, me again. But this time I've got good news. Oh, really? i just come from another session with our illustrious mayor. Now, I haven't got time to explain, but he's agreed, reluctantly, to allow you with Torren here to act as observers to the war fleet. You mean we're free? Well, we're free to leave this prison anyway. But that's only you two. Huh? I'll go on with my questioning of Magnifico, and Beta will stay with him to keep him relaxed, cooperative. Look, if you think I'll leave no, here with you... This isn't the time for personal feelings. The war is obviously going badly, very badly, or else Inver would never have made any concession. Yeah, that's obvious. And Pritchard, especially, would be dead by now. Now, I admit my main plan was to get Magnifico alone with Beta and myself to get him to talk openly. But your mission as observers could be very important, too. See, nobody here knows anything about the war, apart from vague rumors and the ridiculously optimistic reports from the news media. Mm. You, too, have a chance to see what's really happening and to let us know. Well, no, I can't And if that. it eases your conscience at all, Torren, I can tell you you won't just be helping the Foundation. Mm. Your Uncle Randu landed a few hours back with an offer of immediate military help from all the trade-up planets. Now, will you go? Come on, Torrin. All right. But here are your identity passes. Now, leave immediately. And remember, your objective reports on the war could be vital. Now, there's a ship waiting for you. Now, go. <laughs> Uh, 
I've got to find out what Magnifico knows, Beta. You seem to be the only one he trusts. But we've already asked him every question we could think of. I know, and his answers are always the same. He doesn't know anything about the mule beyond what he told Pritcher and you on Calgon. Now, I've got to use the probe on him, but he refuses to let me. So I need your help to persuade him to cooperate, to overcome his fear. Are you willing to help? I'll try. Good. He's asleep next door. All right. Oh. Oh, Magnifico. Magnifico. Oh, you, my lady. Please, for my sake, let the professor use the probe. What? Oh, my lady. I'm frightened. I'll be with you. I wouldn't let anyone hurt you. You will stay with me, yes, my lady. Yes, of course I will. Now, come on. Very well. Sit down. All oh, right. right. That's uh, it. Yes, now, relax. You won't feel anything, I promise. Just try to let your mind relax. Uh, All right? That's all. All over now, and now we should get a complete printout of your memory within an hour at most. There. It didn't hurt at all, did it? No. Thank you, my lady. Here you are. Here's a present for you. What's that? Hmm? He knows. Don't you, Magnifico? Oh. Yes. It's a busy sonar. All right. Take it. It's yours. I got it from the Museum of Music Sciences, the only one they had. Oh. They didn't seem to know much about it. Found in space was all the index card said. It might even be broken for all I know. Try it. Go on. It's yours to keep. It needs a little tuning. But otherwise, I... Yes, it's operational. How did you know that I could play it? I asked you the other day if there was anything about the mule's court that you missed. You said nothing at all, but you just wished you hadn't left your busy sonar behind. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Would you like me to play for you? I've got to go and prepare the printout analyzers. Uh, play for Beta. My lady, would it please you if I played for you? Yes, please. That, that was extraordinary. I... Oh, that was... Very beautiful. Is it always so restful? No, my lady. That was music I played for you. For someone else, I could play music to make them mad. Or dead, even. But it's just a box. I just think the sounds and they pass to you, my lady. I never played it much at the court of the mule. He didn't like it. He knew its power. But I would rather play the Fizzisona than do anything else in the whole galaxy. Especially with you by my side, my lady. Shall I play you more? Yes, please. You look cheerful in birth. I haven't slept for days. Mm. Pritchard and Torrance's reports have given you something to think about, eh? Every single thing they report is in direct contradiction to every official report from every commander. Yes, that makes sense. But the question is, which do you believe? That is no concern of yours, Miss. You may rest assured that the state is in good hands. Mine. The war is going well. The Foundation will win. That's all you need to know. Now, what about this probe into Magnifico's memory? You have the results? Yes. Show them to me. There's nothing to show. 
Is this another of your infantile jokes? There is nothing to show. Apart from verbatim repetition of what he'd already told us in conversation, his memory appears to be a complete blank. This is not possible. I know it's not possible, but it's a fact. Blank. The only reason I could think of is that his subconscious is so terrified of the mule that it's taken refuge in what's known as protective amnesia. And even so, it's the first case I've ever known where the amnesia is so total. Why do you lie to me, Mies? Look, I'm not lying. Why should I lie? Exactly why. I'll tell you. Because you seem to take pleasure in spreading defeatism, don't you, Mies? No. You enjoy trying to make me despair, don't you? Don't you? Well, let me tell you something, Mies. The Foundation cannot lose, even without my devoted leadership. Harry Seldon's calculations of psychohistory guarantee that the Foundation cannot be defeated. Why worry, then? If everything is guaranteed, why worry? <laughs> you think I'm worried? Me worried? <laughs> I suppose you know we have the traitor's forces with us now, eh? I tell you, miss, the mule has overreached himself. He will lose. He must lose. It's inevitable. Absolutely inevitable. You sound convinced. Get out. Get out before I disintegrate no, you. I, I'm going, I'm going. I'll see you in the time wall. Uh, don't forget, will you? You'll see, miss. You'll see. Seldon will show you. Seldon will show you. Now, tell me, what's the truth about the war? Well, initially, the trader forces slowed the mule down, but then Inverse stopped them fighting as an independent force and mixed them up with the Foundation forces. No. The oddest thing we noticed was that the mule seemed to find it much easier to defeat Foundation ships than trader ships. We couldn't see why. Their armaments were virtually identical. Mm. Richard, yes. there's only a few minutes to go. Where's Inverse? Oh, he'll be here, don't you worry. Probably just making sure of a good entrance. <laughs> he wouldn't dare miss this. About the other thing, Miss, mm -hmm. I've organized the ship for you. It's waiting in dock 37, Bay G, fully equipped and provisioned maximum fuel load. Yeah, good man, thanks. But um, I won't be coming with you. Why not? I'm going to stay here and fight. I've had to watch this wall coming, and then I've had to watch our forces being smashed. I want to do my share of the fighting. Well, it's your choice, but you would have been more useful with us. <laughs> Arise, arise, my people. This is no time for ceremony, eh? <laughs> this way, Your Excellency. Yes, yes, yes. But before we have our glorious future confirmed by Seldon, I should just like to tell you the latest news from the war zone. I have here my very own synopsis of the latest reports from all my commanders in space. It is quite brief. We are moving forward on all fronts. Victory is very close, as I am sure Seldon will confirm. Victory, my people. Victory for the Foundation. Silence, please. The vault is opening. That old man. Just, just appearing. Don't be frightened, my dear. No, my lady. I am Harry Seldon. This is my fifth appearance here and the fifth crisis for the Foundation on Terminus. I have no means of knowing if anyone is witnessing my appearance here, but that is not important. I have no fears as yet for the breakdown of the plan. For the first three centuries, the probability of non-deviation is 95.7%. By the way, if any of you are standing, please sit. 
This need not be a solemn occasion. I have no need for ceremony. Ah, my very now, let us look at the problem of the moment. The Foundation is faced with an entirely new kind of threat. Civil war. Until now, the attacks from outside have all been adequately dealt with. Inevitably so, according to the laws of psychohistory. The conflict of the moment is between the undisciplined forces of the outer planets of the Foundation and the over-authoritarian central government. The conflict was necessary. The outcome is obvious. I don't understand this. The compromise which has been worked out, or is at this moment being worked out, is necessary in two respects. The revolt of the traders introduces a new element of uncertainty to a government which has grown far too self-confident. Although not victorious, the independent traders have attained a healthy degree of democratic government for themselves and for the foundation in general. Secondly, and perhaps equally important, the foundation is now a much stronger, firmer coalition than it was before the Civil War. Now only the scattered remnants of the old empire stand in the way of further expansion, and there is no threat from them. Of course, I cannot reveal the nature of the next problem, the next crisis, but I can congratulate you on having successfully passed through this crisis. And of course, I wish you luck in the future. I am confident of your continued success. That can't be all. What went wrong? Rondo. Where's Rondo? I'm here. You're the traitor representative here. Is it true you were planning a revolt? We were, yes. Oh, I, I didn't do it. We, we changed our plans because of the appearance of the mule. You were, yes. Well, it's that's it horse. then. Seldom psychohistory the couldn't foretell the mule. There was no expectation of an fool. individual mutant appear. The plan dealt with mass movement trends. It couldn't make any allowance for an individual military genius, especially not a mutant. Excellence, excellence. The communication channels have all gone deep. <laughs> this is not my fault. It isn't. Seldom the one you should blame, and those half-witted traitors. Not me. <laughs> not me. What should we do? Do surrender your cause. What else can we do? Surrender and try to get a reasonable terms. But we don't. Yes. We don't have a way of communicating a surrender. Yeah. This is not fair. Well, the foundation is being bombarded. We've got to escape. Oh, what can we do? We've got a ship waiting for us. We have to go now. You bring Magnifico. Torren, you come on ahead with me. All right. The mule... The mule is coming, my lord. Richard? I believe that is true. I'll stay in the fight. There may be something I can still do here. All right. This is goodbye. Yes. Good luck, Peter. You need it. So will you. No, Come on now, you kids. No. Follow me. He'll follow us wherever we hide. He'll find us. See? What did I tell you? Traitors running away. None of this is my fault. Is it? You can't. I blame I was always so misogynist. So careful. So painstaking. <laughs> <laughs> Title, Foundation, Foundation and Empire, Second Foundation. Author, Isaac Asimov. Audio adaptation, Mike Stock. Part number five. Part title, The Mule.
title, Foundation. Foundation and Empire, Second Foundation. Author, Isaac Asimov. Part number six. Part title, Flight from the Mule. Encyclopedia Galactica, 116th edition. Entry, Terminus, Subscript. The invasion forces of the mule encountered no opposition when they poured down onto the landing fields of the capital. The proclamation of occupation was made 24 hours after the appearance of Hardy Selden before the former mighty rulers of the Foundation. Now only the planets of the independent traders stood firm, and it was against them that the power of the mule now turned itself. Peter, that you? Yes. Come out here. Oh, I'm so tired. Where have you been? Down to the Bureau of Production. Whatever for? Oh, I just felt I couldn't bear it any longer at the factory. Torrent, morale just doesn't exist anymore. The girls are breaking down crying, and those who don't mm. cry complain. And for the last few days, there have been two or three saying, we ought to make peace with the mule. What, surrender? They say Terminus surrendered. And it seems to be all right for everybody except the mayor. Everything's back to normal. <laughs> normal? I know. Anyway, I wanted to see if the situation's any better on the rest of Haven, so I went to the Bureau of Production and asked a few questions. Just as bad. All over Haven. Falling production, increasing absenteeism, and a growing feeling that it isn't worth fighting anymore. Even some sabotage. Really? The chief statistician I talked to didn't seem to care much either. Just shrugged and said it was beyond him. You know what all this reminds me of? No. It seems as if all these people have that same awful feeling of frustration I had in the time vault, when Selden seemed so irrelevant. Yes. You felt it too, didn't you? I still do. If I don't resist it. It gets harder to resist. Like a voice inside your head. Mm. Like your own private voice. It's pointless to resist the mule. Over and over. My lady? Hmm. Ah, you're bad. I, I, I'll, I'll bring you some food. Oh, thank you, Magnifico. Good to see someone who's not depressed. Anyway, it may not be quite as bleak as it seems. Mies is meeting father tonight. I think they may be working out some kind of resistance. I hope so. Oh, that's so... There you are, my lady. Now rest your feet. Lie back. Don't worry. Professor Meese and, and Commander Francois will come up with something. Have confidence in them, my lady. I have. Just what none of us do have, Magnifico. Confidence. Don't you sleep anymore? Uh, hardly. Uh, I seem to like the night more than the day just lately. Uh, I feel better because I know people aren't looking at me, hoping they'll see some confidence in me that isn't in them anymore. Mm. Do you feel it too, this miserable feeling of inevitable defeat? Oh, everybody feels it. What can you expect? A whole culture has been brought up on the firm, blind belief that a folk hero of the past has planned everything for us, taken care of everything for us. Oh, it's quite like the old-time religious beliefs, and you know what that means. People's characters have been affected, even formed by faith in Selden. They can't change their characters, their personality. But they can't avoid seeing that Selden is no longer watching over us. Uh. So... You get hysteria, a morbid sense of insecurity, depression, even insanity. Well, you know the suicide rate is soaring all over heaven. I know. As if we'd been leaning on Selden, and now without something to lean on, we can't stand up straight because our muscles are atrophy. Yeah, that's it. Atrophy. 
Well, how about you, Mies? What about your muscles? <laughs> A lot weaker, uh, rustier than I'd imagined, but not atrophy. Now, the pursuit of my profession has resulted in just a little independent thinking. Do you see any way out? No, but there has to be one. Selden's projection... Look, was... Selden failed to guarantee us against the mule, Fran, but he didn't guarantee defeat either. Uh, Selden's just out of the game now. We're on our own, and the mule can be beaten. How? Oh. By attacking in strength, where he's weak. Where is he weak? Well, that I don't know yet. But he must have a weakness. Yeah. Look, friend, the mule is not a superman. He is a mutant. Well, a mutant doesn't mean superman. Usually the opposite. Look, every year, throughout the galaxy, there are several million mutants born. In the vast majority of cases, their mutation is imperceptible. The rest, whose mutation is obvious, almost all are defective in some way. Freaks, if you like. It's an absolutely minute number who have any advantageous mutation. It doesn't matter how minute the number is. If the mule is one of them, one is enough. All right. Let's suppose he does have some attribute, probably a mental attribute, which can be used to his advantage, even to the extent of conquering other people, even other worlds. All right. Maybe he can see in another dimension. Maybe he can read other people's thoughts. All right. It's almost certain that he'll have some corresponding deficiency, balancing his extra ability. <laughs> I don't know why, but nature seems to work like that. And if he didn't have some serious fault or weakness, he wouldn't be such a recluse, so frightened of showing himself. In that case, we've got to keep working on the mule's car. Mm, it's useless. I'm beginning to think he may have been brainwashed, specially, so the mule could use him as a pretext for that first attack on the foundation. Neither that or he is naturally simple-minded, or both. Anyway, it means I must work at what facts I have. There are some strange anomalies there. Such as? The mule smashed the foundation fleets almost at will, right? Mm. There were desertion, surrenders, finally a complete breakdown of the will to resist. Now, the fleets protecting Haven and the other enclaves are much weaker than the foundation forces were, yet there have been no desertions and no retreat. Mm. Only the mule's first use of the extinguishing field against the atomic defences of Neymar, only that, really worked for him. He's never used it successfully against any trader planet since then. And yet against the Foundation forces, it worked again and again. Now, why? It's, it just seems illogical. But it can't be illogical. There must be some factors we're just not aware of. Treachery? No. No, but look how easily he took Terminus itself. And yet there wasn't a man on that planet who wasn't certain of victory because of the Selden plan. Who would betray a side that was certain to win? Yes, but now we're certain to lose. But if the mule had a thousand weaknesses, I still can't see Look, any Frank, way that we can... Do you think Haven can resist the mule? Yes, we can. We can, but I don't think we will. I'm pretty sure that before long, I'm going to be the only one left on the governing council who doesn't want to surrender. Mm. That's why I asked to see you, Miss. I want you to leave Haven while there's still time. But, Fran, I... You I... are the Foundation's greatest psychologist. You're our only chance of defeating the mule. You can't hope to do that from Haven. Well, I think that you should go to what's left of the Empire. To Trantor? Yes, to Trantor. The Imperial Library is still there. And I think that there, there just might be something in that library, some knowledge, some technique that might help you to break through Magnifico's empty memory. Mm. But Magnifico would never go without Beta, and Beta wouldn't go without Torn. I've arranged a ship that'll take you all. Ah. Will you agree to go? Yes, but... Frankly, as I said, I think Magnifico's memory is a dead end, a permanent vacuum. Maybe, maybe. But there is another reason for going to Trantor. Hmm? 
It's where Selden lived and worked, where he planned the foundations, both of them. There is another foundation at the other end of the galaxy, if the myths are true. Now, the library might contain some evidence, some clue as to where it is. That's the most important part of the mission. Selden might not be of any use anymore, but we could still get help from this second foundation if we could find it. It's our only chance. You must find the second foundation. Pitcher, former captain of Foundation Intelligence, now captain of Liberation Movement. Sit down. There. What's the plot, Devil? You, if you're not who you say you are, or who you think you are. Who are you? My name is Oram Pally. I gave the coat. I know. You are Han Pritcher. The question is, are you still you? A what? Sit down. Thank you. you remember Levar of Group 3? Of course. He led the attack on the armaments factory. He's with the mule. He... What? Together with Gare, Knopf, and Wallig. So why not Pritchard? What does it matter? If they have Knopf, they have my name. So it's really you who are in new danger, not me. If you have no organization here, where can I find one? The Foundation may have surrendered, but I have... Sit down, Pritchard. Look... You can't wander forever. Men at the Foundation need travel permits to move around nowadays, you know that? And identity cards, do you have one? And all the officers of the old Navy have been ordered to the nearest occupation headquarters. Have you obeyed that order? No, look, I'm not running through fear. I was in Calcutta not long after it fell to the mule. Within a month, not one of its officers was at large, because they were the natural leaders of any revolt. We know that no revolution could be successful without the control of a good part of the fleet. And evidently the mule knows it, too. Anyway, I threw out my uniform and grew this beard. I hope perhaps some of the others have done the same. We can meet and act. Do you want my advice? If you have any. I don't know what the mule is up to. But until now, he hasn't harmed the skilled workers. Pay rates of sword and the production of atomic weapons is growing every day. So the mule is going to continue his offensive. Perhaps. Maybe he's just soothing the workers into submission. <laughs> if Selden couldn't work out the mule with psychohistory, I'm sure I can't. Now, you're wearing work clothes, right? But I'm not a skilled worker. But you have a grounding in atomics. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's all you'll need. You go to the nearest atomic field equipment plant and tell them you have experience. They won't ask questions. They need all the workers they can get to help with the profit. They'll give you an identity card and worker's accommodation. With that, you will not be questioned. And you can wait until the opportunity for action occurs. Well? All right, Pally, I'll do it. But remember, I'm not a worker, I'm a soldier. And I won't wait forever. I've wasted in that factory and I could have been doing something. What? Look, I'll tell you. Sit down, preacher. No. You've been in that factory, not wasted, for three months. Time enough to be ready to do a bit of private work. What? Private work? I want you to make a bomb. A very small atomic bomb with time control that can be held under the tongue, right? <laughs> under the... <laughs> <laughs> Whose head are you going to blow off? Yours. We've located the mule. He's in the ex-mayor's palace. Now, you've been there and know the layout. In fact, you've been in the mayor's private office. Yeah. Pritchard, 
This is our only chance. The mule has upset Selden's plan. One man, one mutant, has upset all Selden's psychohistory. If he had never lived, the foundation would never have fallen. If he ceased to live, it would not remain fallen. Pritchard, the mule must be destroyed. <laughs> to spit out that foolish parrot. It will make it so much easier to talk. It has been neutralized. Hmm. Now do sit down, Captain. So you are the mule? The mule? Me? Oh, dear, no. Oh, oh no, I am just a humble oh. servant, officially known as a viceroy. How did you know I was here? We know everything, Captain Pritchard. You know who I am? Oh, indeed we do. The mule's been looking forward to meeting the man who stole his crown. He rather admires you. Unfortunately, he's absent at the moment, leading the fight against the independent traders, but that shouldn't take long. Hmm? And he will be pleased to hear of your arrival. Now, I do hope your conversion won't be difficult. My conversion? Yes, to the mule. <laughs> you won't convert me. Oh, no, I won't. The mule will, if you don't volunteer of your own free will, that is. Uh, Either way, you'll soon be back in active service again, out in space. And not as humble captain either. You will be General Han Pritchard of the Galactic Army of the Mule. The mule will not convert me. But why not? Don't you see, all he's doing is speeding up the Selden clan. He is the fulfillment of the plan, just a little earlier than Selden calculated. Instead of having to wait for another 700 years before the dawn of a new empire, the mule is doing it now. Just imagine, Richard, one great unified galaxy, galactic peace and prosperity forevermore. Oh, yes, only a fool could fail to be converted to such a worthwhile cause. Oh, take me, for instance. I was a stubborn fool before. I was independent, yes, what's called free, but not satisfied. Never satisfied. Now, I'm a perfectly contented man, a servant of the mule. You don't recognize me, do you? Yes. Should I? Well, you should, really. I know I look different without all the armor and the jewels, but we have met a couple of years ago. On Calgon. Warlord of Calgon? That was me. I was a loud-mouthed provincial warlord, and you were an underpaid, undervalued intelligence officer. And now I am a loyal viceroy of the mule, and soon you'll be the same. A loyal general, a contented man. Oh, Captain Fritcher. I tell you, we are very fortunate men. Torrin, hmm? I'm getting something on the headset. Switch in the main system, will you? What channel? Green 11. I have a special announcement. By order of our master, the mule... Lord of the Galaxy, 
It is announced that at 07 today, the planet Haven, previously in futile opposition to the mule's will, finally submitted to our Lord and Master. The surrender was unconditional, and apart from a few isolated and suicidal groups, it was warmly welcomed by the general public. All the citizens of Haven are now freed from their ignorant provincial overlords, free to be the servants of the mule and citizens of his galactic empire. Praise to the mule, citizens. Praise to the mule. I'm sorry, Tom. I'm truly sorry. It lasted longer than the Foundation did, anyway. I'm sorry, Peter. I'm sorry. My lady, Professor... Yes, what is it? The scanner screen, Professor. Hmm? The rear view has picked up an object. Come and see. Uh, see? Hmm? There. What is it? Oh, it's a single spaceship. Bigger than we are. Gaining on us, too. And we're at maximum speed. Yeah. Well, let them come alongside. There's no point in making them suspicious. Uh, slow everything down. They'll be here in <laughs> seconds, the rate they're traveling. This is Patrol Ship 7 of the Felian world. Here on the space territory of Felia. Identify yourselves immediately. Aware oh, from the periphery, just on a... Destination? Trantor sector. Purpose of voyage. Oh, just a pleasure trip. Mm. Open your main hatch. I'm coming aboard. Thank you. How many crew have you? Just the four of us. Yeah. Travel documents? Well, we have none. So you have no permit to cross Philian space? We never intended to come anywhere near Philian. You have a qualified navigator. Yes, but no chance. I see. Well, that's an offence, of course. Who is your navigator? I am. Um... Come with me, please. Where to? To my ship. I can give you a travel permit there. Fifty credits. And a good chart, too. A hundred credits. And, of course, you'll have to pay a fine for division navigation resulting in trespass. hundred credits. Mm. Come on, it'll only take a minute or so. And that man, too. Me? Why, me? We've had reports of piracy in this area. Your appearance is similar to one of the descriptions of a man wanted for questioning. I shall have to check you through our computer memory. My lady. Go with him, Magnifico. Everybody knows you're not a pirate, so you've got nothing to be frightened of. They'll be back within minutes, then you can continue your voyage. Goodness, that's over here. Uh, what happened, Torrent? Just what he said. I bought a 50 credit visa, paid a 100 credit fine, and he sold me a chart of the whole sector. They're hmm? still following us, but keeping at a distance. Yeah. Magnifico, what happened to you? Oh, no, nothing, Professor. They made me stand in front of a screen for a moment, but that was all. I know one thing. That wasn't a Pelian ship. It was a Foundation ship with a Foundation crew. Foundation? Yes, the mule is following us. It's impossible. It's a Foundation ship, all right. The panels, the engine turn, all the equipment was Foundation designed. But then... Why didn't they just blast us? Yes. Why let us go? Oh, Professor, uh, yes. if I might, I wasn't going to say anything for fear of seeming foolish, but as we were leaving, I saw a man watching us from the control room. I think he was a commander. Our escort from here bowed to him, and I think it was the man who arranged our escape from Kalgan. Han Pritchard. Pritchard. But he stayed to fight the mule. Yes, my lady. But the mule has ways of changing a man's mind. I may have been mistaken, of course. Uh, Torren, are they still behind us? Yep. At a distance, but still following. Right. Now, do everything you can to lose them. Right. The mule is looking for the same thing we're looking for, the second foundation. And he's hoping we'll lead him to it. So lose them, Torren, now. <laughs> Encyclopedia Galactica, 116th edition. Entry, Neo Trantor. Situation, two parsecs from the crumbling ruins of Trantor, the old galactic center of power. 
During the century after the sack of Trantor, it became the seat of the last dynasty of the first empire. It was a shadow world and a shadow empire, and its existence is only of legalistic importance. His Highness the Emperor Dagobert the Ninth, Lord of all he surveys. You may rise. We are pleased to have visitors. Not too often we have the opportunity of welcoming provincial visitors. You're most welcome. Thank you, Your Majesty. Ah, we're usually addressed as Highness. Oh, I'm sorry, Highness. We know you provincials have rather rough manners compared to ourselves. Quite natural, really. Uh, this is my son, the Prince Dagobert. Highness. He's addressed as Your Majesty. Uh, Your Majesty. Hmm. Are you married? Yes, Your Majesty. Happily married? Very, Your Majesty. Pity. I like you. You can't have everyone, you see. Go hunting or something. Get some fresh air and healthy exercise. We wish to discuss important matters with our visitors. Run along. <sighs> All right. I could make you happy, though. Don't you think? A little headstrong, perhaps, but a little too much ruled by his emotions, not quite enough for his, uh, his brain. Still, we were young once, once. Now, uh, what are we saying? Oh, yes, important matters. Oh, will you, uh, will you all be seated? Sit about, will you? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, ah. Uh, Ah, uh, well, why don't you tell us? Ah, uh, oh dear, my memory. He's a simpleton. So many rulers are, my lord. Highness, the purpose of our visit is a very simple one. Oh, good. We don't like complicated things. Highness, we came to beg a favor of you. Mm -hmm. We want to visit old Trantor. Old oh, Trantor? We used to have our palace there. And then we came here. I can't quite remember why. Yes, Highness, we're interested in visiting the Imperial Library on Old Trantor. Library? What, whatever for? We're scholars, Highness. We're interested in knowledge, old and new. Oh, you surprise us. We have always found that old knowledge is very tedious stuff, and what little new knowledge has come our way has always seemed equally tedious, but rather more dangerous. Still, still if that's what you want. Yes, yeah, it is, Your Highness. <laughs> Do we have your permission to visit the library? Oh, certainly. Probably covered in dust, though. Nobody's been near the place for ages. It's much more fun going hunting or dancing, you see. No, we don't suppose you do see you. Strange people, you provincials. Is that all you want, though, just to visit a dusty old library? That's all we want, Highness. Well, off you go, then. Off you go. Oh, oh. A first of uh, important matters. Yes. Uh, well, tell us about uh, a little about the state of the galaxy. How are things in your part of our empire? Hmm? Uh, well, everything's as you might expect, I guess. Oh, good. That's a healthy sign. <laughs> change is a change for the worse, eh? Eh? Yes, Your Highness. And you, my dear, which province are you from? From the Foundation, Highness. Ah, yes. But, uh, the whereabouts is that? Then? Our empire is so large, you see, that even we are not always quite clear about the outer fringe, so to speak. But, uh, do tell us more, my dear, about this Foundation place. What's the hunting like there, eh? All the girls as pretty as yourself. You like a boxing girl, you really do. You. Tell us, my dear. Do tell us. Uh, um. 
no, no. Have you never heard of the new? <laughs> or anything else, really? He actually seems to believe the old empire still exists. Yeah, I rather like the royal weed. Sure. Yes, <laughs> and the way he kept dropping off to sleep. No, Does know. the mule use the royal weed, Magnifico? Oh, no, my lady. The mule says, I, 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 I. Well, come on, let's get to the ship. Yes. I want to get to work. <laughs> Get moved. Uh, stay where you are, well, all of you. I'm usually addressed as your majesty. Do you usually threaten guests with a needle gun? It's not the first time. <laughs> you think I'm as simple as my father? Well, I'm not. I'm going to be Dagobert the Tenth. And I'm not going to wait much longer for that old fool to make way, either. And when I am the emperor, I'm going to rebuild this empire. I'm going to get it all back, all of it. I won't just be a feeble-minded figurehead. I'll be a real ruler, a real emperor. What's this got to do with us? <laughs> Nothing to do with you, old man. Or with you. Or that spindly clown there. Mm. But that's for you. Get away from me. Stay away from her. Oh, don't be shy, girl. I'll be good for you. I'm strong, healthy, rich. And I'll be powerful, too. I shall be the emperor. And you. Well, if you're very good, you can be the Empress. Now, what do you say? <laughs> Disfigure him a little. <laughs> now, what have you got there, clown? Oh, this... A busy solo, Your Majesty, that's all. Can you play it? Oh, yes, Your Majesty. Would you care to hear? Well, it might make my lady more friendly. What? Music? Oh, well, yes, Your Majesty. This is no ordinary music. It can change people's minds. All right. Play me something. Play something nice for the girl. Oh, that's nice. That's very nice. You like it, girl? Cover your ears, my lady. Oh. 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 I'll take his gun. What? I, 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 take I, I, that I, gun and throw it outside. Professor, help me with the body. Torrent, take the lady. Yeah, right, right. Put it outside. Outside. All right? Uh, yes, that sound magnifico, that terrible sound. Yes, I, I'm closing that. Still can't hear properly. I'm sorry, my lord. I couldn't get him without some effect on you, but you'll be all right in a short while. It was aimed at him, not you. But what was it? It was a traditional piece, my lady. I learnt it when I was a child. It is the music of death. You mean he's dead? Yes, Professor. But how? I don't know. I'm only the ignorant player, Professor. Magnifico, did he have to die? Oh, yes, my lady. He insulted you. Are you angry with me? Not angry. Just... Well, I'm grateful. Thank you, Magnifico. I'm happy to repay a small part of my debt to you, my lord. You saved me before. Look, we don't have time now. Torrent, take the controls. I want to get into that library. I'm sure that's where the key to the second foundation lies. <laughs> We come in peace. In peace be it. You are welcome to the hospitality of the group. If you have hunger, you shall feed. If you thirst, you shall drink. Come with me. And 
so we moved to new lands when I was ten years old. The great metal slabs of the glory that was Trantor were uprooted and thrown aside, and there below was the soil which had to be turned and freshened, invigorated. The neighboring buildings were torn down and leveled, others were turned into living quarters. It was hard, but we prospered. What about hydroponics? Surely for such a world as Trantor, they would be the mm, answer. No. Hydroponics need a world of industry, and especially a great chemical industry. Mm. And in war or disaster, when industry breaks down, the people starve. No, the earth is still cheaper, still better, still dependable. But can you grow enough food? Enough. Perhaps monotonous, but enough. We have fowl that supply eggs, and we have milk yielders. But our meat supply depends on foreign trade. Trade? What do you trade? Metal. We have an infinite supply in every conceivable shape and size. They come with freight ships from Neo Trantor, demolish an indicated area. Which gives you more growing space. Exactly. Then they leave us in exchange meat, food concentrates, farm machinery, and so on. And both sides profit. I presume that the university itself has not been uprooted, no. demolished. The university grounds are a static area. We farmers do not grow crops on it. We do not, by preference, even enter. The university is one of the few relics of former times we would prefer to preserve, intact, untouched, undisturbed. Don't you allow anyone to enter? No one here has the desire to do so. But we are seekers after knowledge. We would disturb nothing. No. And we would leave our ship as hostage. Very well. You will sleep tonight, and tomorrow I will take you there. Encyclopedia Galactica, 116th edition. Entry, University of Trantor, subscript. During the great sack of Trantor, the university remained untouched. After the collapse of the imperial power, the students formed a volunteer army to protect the central shrine of the science of the galaxy. Throughout the seven days' conflict, when even the imperial palace was overrun by the forces of the rebel Gilmer, an armistice kept the university sacrosanct. And so it remained. like an intruder. Then you feel anything? Yes. Seems as if the studies and researches go on, despite the emptiness and we're disturbing the work. <laughs> anyway, that mustn't stop our work. I think the cataloging rooms are through here. That's where I start. What do you want us to do? Oh, nothing. I must be no, I can only do this on my own. I want you, Baker, to cook for me. I'll eat in the library while I work. Magnifico will stay with me to fetch him carry, my lord. And to make sure you eat. Yes, my lady. Do you think you'll find what you're searching for? Torrin. I know I'll find it. What do you want? There you are. Look, what do you want? I'm busy. He's very busy, Tom. Yeah. Well, I just... Hmm? Look, Miss, we've been here three days now. Well? Well, you can't study microfilms all day, every day. No, I can, and I will, and I must. But you must Tom, listen to me. I must concentrate all my energy on this problem, my entire being. The Foundation has fallen, Haven has fallen. If the mule wanted to, he could take the old empire, too. I have to find out how he can be so successful. 
I have to find the second foundation before the mule's forces take Tranto, this library and everything. The evidence is here. It must be here. And I think I'm beginning to get somewhere. It's all right. I know it's important, but at least you should eat the meals. It's magnificent. You must see he takes some rest. I do. Jim Tranto, the professor, is a very strong way. Yes, 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 yes. I'll eat the food. I promise, but please leave me alone now. These records are very fragmentary. Some of them are eaten in code. I have to concentrate very, very hard to guess at the gaps between documents before I can make any progress. I need to be alone to have any chance of success. Yes, I'll, I'll leave you then. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Are you coming for some fresh air, Magnificent? Uh, no, I think I'm more useful here, my lord. Yes. Actually, we carry you. Yes. Well, I'll see you later. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Now, where, where, where did I put that film? Here. Yes. Huh? Ah, yes, of course. <laughs> what would I do without you, Magnificent? <laughs> right, now, set up the bureau. Yes, Professor. Well? I tried to make him see sense, but the old man's as stubborn as... as the mule, I suppose. <laughs> Just works, works, works. And Magnifico sits with him like a very eager pet dog. Torrin? Yes? Do you have a feeling that something isn't quite right? That something dangerous is close to us? Yes. But it's only a feeling. Intuition. Anyway, what can we do if anything is threatening us? Nothing. Nothing at all. Preacher. Yes, don't be alarmed. Please. This is just a social call. What are you doing here? Oh, I'm not much of a welcome for an old friend. How did you get here? I followed you. In that so-called Fillion patrol ship? That's right. Sir Magnifico was right. You've gone over to the mule. Yes, but I would like to retain our friendship. Oh, friendship. <laughs> oh, well, be stubborn then. But your idea of the mule is very biased. He destroyed my home planet. No. Nothing was destroyed on Haven because it surrendered. Everything's the same as it ever was. The people are quite contented. Pritchard, what do you want here? What are you doing? Following you. Just keeping an eye on you. Those are my only orders. You're hoping we'll lead you to the second foundation. I'm not hoping for anything. Just carrying out instructions. Follow, observe, but do not interfere. Uh, may I uh, sit down? <laughs> Thank you. Preacher, what has the mule done to you? How can he convert people so easily? Uh, well, your knowledge cannot harm him. The mule is able to change a human being's emotions, not his intelligence. Intellectually, I am quite free. But he can adjust the emotions. He can abolish doubt. He can give you a feeling of confidence in yourself and in him. I feel better now than I ever did when I was free. Now, believe me. And you would enjoy life a great deal more if you just stop resisting, stop trying to be different. If you let the mule look after you, he will. I'm not trying to trick you. I'm speaking as a friend, as someone who wants to help you. It's painful to me to see the way you're wasting your lives, tormenting yourselves with questions, doubts, when really all you need to do is forget about yourselves. Just help the mule to help you and everybody else in the galaxy. You'd better go now, Pritchard. Instead of being here, waiting, wondering, frightened, you could be back on Haven or the Foundation with a good home. A family, perhaps? Pritchard, get away from us. Get out! I'm going. But if you change your minds at all, I'll be waiting. You can call on my help at any time. You will find the mule is not so ready to forgive and forget. Yes, 
tempted, aren't you? Yes, of course I am. But I'd rather be free than be just one of the mule's creatures. Oh, Magnifico, pass me that tape, would you? Yes, sir. Do you know, I, I don't know what I'd do without Magnifico. He's really becoming a first-class research assistant. He should have been a librarian, Mother Cloud. At least you haven't heard a word we've said, have you? No, certainly I have. Every word. Richard told us how the mule wins his victories. He can control men's emotions, which means their will to resist him. Don't you think that's important? Yes, it's very, very, yes, yes, very. It's just that, well, Magnifico and I'd rather come to that conclusion ourselves, haven't we, Magnifico? You have. No, don't be so modest without your moral support. I'm sure I'd be no nearer the answer now than when I started. Are you saying that you knew all this? But yes. Hadn't I told you? It's quite simple, really. Just a third-level equation of psychomathematics. I mean, after all, just ask yourselves, what were Selden's original assumptions, eh? Firstly, that there would be no fundamental change in the nature of human society over the next thousand years. Now... Suppose, for instance, there'd been a major change in foundation technology, a perfection of electronic neurobiology, say. That would have meant enormous social changes and Selden's original equation would be rendered obsolete. Or I would imagine that some new weapon had been developed outside the foundation, something the foundation couldn't match. Now, that, too, would have caused a ruinous deviation from Selden's plan. But nothing like that did happen. However... There's a second assumption made by Silver. He assumed that human beings themselves would remain the same. That human response to stimuli was basically constant. Now, granted that his first assumption proved true, then this second assumption must have broken down. Otherwise, the foundation would not have been conquered. No. So, some thing, some factor had twisted or broken the emotional responses of human beings especially their will to resist, to fight their preference for self-government rather than government by someone else. And what factor was there but the mule himself, do you see? Yes, I do. Well, it's quite simple, really. I, I can't think why I didn't see it much earlier, but then that that's true of a lot of things. Ever since I've been here, my mind is becoming clearer and clearer. Problems seem to vanish. I give full credit to Magnifico here. He seems to be my... Good luck, Charm. Just by being here, he seems to be inspiring me. <laughs> yeah, any, anyway, the nature of the mule's mutation is no longer very important, really. What we have to do is to find the second foundation. You see those? Yes. What are they? Those old films, Beta, are the records of the great psychological convention presided over by Selden himself. It was at that convention that the two foundations were established. You've read them? I have read the summaries so far. There's yeah. a lot of rather specialized language used, but basically they're very clear and open about everything connected with the first foundation. What about the second? Ah, that's the thing. Hardly a single reference. You mean it doesn't exist? Of course it exists, but its location, its purpose, its significance, not a mention. Do you see what that means? What? It means that the second foundation was thought to be much more important than ours. The second foundation is the really critical one, and the mule has no idea where it is. But neither have we. Well, quite. But I think I'm nearer than the mule is to finding its location, at least. The mule has only defeated the first foundation. He hasn't defeated Sheldon. There's something wrong here. What do you mean? Both Pritcher and me say the mule can control human emotions, don't they? Yes. That means he can make people serve him. He can make them fear him, admire him, or even love him. We saw the evidence of that with Pritcher. Exactly. And if the mule can control a man like Han Pritcher, why didn't he control Magnifico? What? Han Pritcher fought against the mule. He was an enemy, but now he's his slave. Magnifico was his slave, but he ran away. Why? Why didn't the mule control him? I don't know. Look, I'm going to ask me. I'll get Magnifico out of the way. Tell him to help you with some investigation somewhere else. Miss must know why the mule didn't condition his clown. But he was conditioned. 
The mule may need faith and trust from his generals, but in his clown he only needed fear, pathological fear, which the mule found comic and helpful. It distorted everything we got from Magnifico. His description was colored by pathological fear. In any case, his information be of no importance now, anyway. The only important thing now is the second foundation. And I'm close to the truth now, Peter, very, very close. <laughs> He's dying. He's driven himself beyond all physical bounds. It's only his mental energies that maintain him. As soon as the mule is mentioned, or the second foundation, he is lucid. He, he glows with strength. But his body won't stand it. It's only the food Magnifico makes him take that has supported him for so long. My lady, my lady, the learned professor is ill. He calls for you. Come, please, come at once. <laughs> Say nothing. Let, let me speak. I'm finished. The work I pass on to you. I've kept no notes. No animals know. All must remain in your mind. No, don't bother about that. Listen. The first foundation was the world of physical scientists. A concentration of all the sciences of the old empire, except psychology. No psychologists were included. That's important. That's the clue. Yes, yes. The second foundation was a world of non-physical scientists. The sciences of the mind and the emotions. The exact mirror image of our world. We have physics. They had psychology. Now, our foundation was scientifically vigorous. It could equip armies, use weapons, but... What about a mental attack from a mutant such as the mule? You mean Selden intended the second foundation to be able to deal with that? Yes, I am certain of it. But they've done nothing. How do you know they've done nothing? Well, what evidence is that? None. None would... Remember, they would be a developing, growing world. As we were. I don't know if they're aware of the danger or if they've developed enough yet. But if they are part of Selden's plan, then surely they must defeat the mule. Not... <laughs> they're not ready. The possibility of an error of timing on Selden's part is quite large. Because of the complexity of two different isolated foundations. If the mule attacked before they were ready before they were even aware of the danger, then the future would belong to him. And the mule's empire is not the answer for humanity. It would break up with his death, and without the continuity of either foundation, mankind would fall back into the millennia of chaos which Selden tried to avoid. What can we do? Listen. I know where the second foundation is. Yes. It has kept it secret, and you must keep it secret. You must warn them. Do you hear me? Well, yes, but where I... Where is it? Where is it? The second foundation is... So a mule did get to you. Now he controls you. No, Torren, no. I had to do it. I suddenly saw the answer to all the questions that have been plaguing me. I couldn't see the reason for the calamity that followed us. Wherever we went, disaster struck, but always after we had just left. Why? We are small, insignificant people. We have no part to play in political upheaval. But someone with us had a very big part. 
Oh. You killed Ebling Meese because you believed he was the mule and had found the secret of the second foundation? I killed Ebling Meese because he had found the secret of the second foundation, but not because he was the mule. I killed him because he was about to tell the mule. Yes, my lady, yes. Yet with all my cleverness and forethought, I made a mistake and lost so much. You were the cause of that mistake, my lady. Since my birth, I have been tormented, hated, shunned because of my looks and my strangeness. I did not understand either until I grew up, and then I found that my appearance was like that of many mutants, but my strangeness was different. No mutant before me could control another man's mind. I had power, power to make up for the miserable position of my early life. I reached out tentatively at first, and then with growing confidence, my control grew, but always through other people. I won Kalgan and a navy. Then I found you. You controlled me on that beach, made me protect you. Would you have risked your life for a grotesque clown you had never seen before without a little mental strengthening? So we reached the foundation with Pritcher, and then I met Ebling Meese, the key to the whole campaign. First he gave me a busy sonar and arranged for me to give concerts all over the foundation, arranged to gather together great audiences with receptive minds for me to play to. It made it so easy. Secondly, with my mental drive behind him, he was obviously capable of duplicating Selden's work. I drove him to the limit. He was dying, but he would have lived long enough to find the second foundation. Then the last battle would have been fought and won. But for my mistake... You say my wife caused this mistake? Your wife was the mistake. She liked me. She was neither repelled by me nor amused by me, so I did not tamper with her mind. I cherished the natural feeling too greatly. I controlled you, Torren. When I went on board that Philian ship to adjust Han Pritcher, who was a prisoner on board, you challenged nothing. You accepted my explanation without question, although it was full of fallacies. But I did not want to control her, ever. Now I must find another Ebling miss. I must start my search again for the second foundation. And you will never find it. The second foundation will defeat you because it was created for your defeat. The psychohistory of Hardy Selden will sweep aside your mean and petty dictatorship without pausing for breath. Thorin and I believe that and we are happy to die in that belief. I won't kill you or your husband. You cannot hurt me further, and your death would not bring back Ebling Miss. Go in peace, for the sake of what I call friendship. But I am the mule, ruler of the galaxy, and I shall defeat the second foundation. No! I have faith in the wisdom of Selden. You shall be the last of your dynasty, as well as the first. Of my dynasty. Yes, I had thought of that often, that I might establish a dynasty. I sense your revulsion. If things were otherwise, I could make you very happy. An artificial ecstasy but indistinguishable from the genuine emotion. But things are not otherwise. I call myself Mule, not because of my strength, obviously. <laughs> Title, Foundation. Foundation and Empire, Second Foundation. 
author Isaac Asimov. Audio adaptation, Mike Scott. Part number six. Part title, The Flight from the Mule. Title, Foundation, Foundation and Empire, Second Foundation, Author, Isaac Asimov, Part Number 7, Part Title, The Mule Finds. Encyclopedia Galactica 116th edition, Entry, Calgam. The Mule's regime, using the planet Calgam as its capital, took on a more conservative and arguably more constructive aspect. The rate of expansion by conquest is greatly reduced. The Mule's government of anonymous bureaucrats concerned itself with consolidating its control of territory already held. Various economic and educational reform programs were introduced. The program of emotional control was virtually perfected and made total, with a small number of deliberate exceptions. The so-called permitted free thinkers the mule himself grew increasingly obsessed with the search for the second foundation, despite popular doubts as to its existence. General Pritchard. Be seated. Sir. We have now completed the five-year survey to find the second foundation. I have just read your final report and summary. It is disappointing, Pritchard. Yes, sir. I, I, I know. I can't see any other conclusion than the one I reached. Of all the evidence we have, sir, there is no second foundation. And the evidence of Evelyn Meese? Yes, sir. Mies was working under the artificial stimulation of your brain control. You may have pushed him too far, giving him a feeling of confidence, of achievement, that was really just the delusion of a disintegrating brain. He could have been wrong, sir. No, he knew. He knew the answer. And if he had lived one more minute, he would have told me. Five years of effort need not have been wasted. Sir, I... We have searched everywhere. Every single planet, every asteroid. The second foundation has had 300 years to grow and to make its influence felt. The first foundation was a galactic power within 100 years. But after 300 years, there's still no sign of the second foundation. Surely that points to one conclusion, that it does not exist. It exists. It exists. Secretly, yes. But it exists. Pritchard, I have decided on a change of tactics for the search. You will go out again, sir, for the last time. But this last time, you will share the command. Share it with, with, with a young man called Bale Chance. I've never heard of him, sir. No, I imagine not. But he is intelligent, very ambitious, and he is not converted. I fail to see the advantage of that, sir. There is one advantage. You are an experienced and resourceful man, General. But you are converted. Your motivation is simply an enforced and helpless loyalty to me. When you lost your own natural motivations, feelings, you lost something else, some drive, some subtle instinct that I cannot replace. Chanis still has that because he is free. He is still himself. Uh, sir, I can remember myself quite well as I was before, when I was your enemy. I, I don't feel inferior now. I've gained a lot and I've lost nothing. Yes, but your judgment is scarcely objective, Pritchard. This man, Chance, is personally ambitious. 
He is quite trustworthy because of that. He knows that by increasing my power, he increases his own. That ambition, that self-seeking, could give him a slight edge in the search. But then why not remove my own conversion, sir, if you think it would improve me? Never, Fritcher, never. If I were to release you now, you'd kill me. Sir, that is unthinkable. Yes, as long as you remain converted. But the human mind resents control, Pritchard. Believe me, if I were to release you now, I would face the hatred you do not now show, which you do not even know you possess. But, but how can you trust this Chinese completely if he is not converted? I cannot. That's why you will go with him. Ah, yes. Sir. You see, Pritchard, if he should stumble on the second foundation, it might appear to him that an arrangement with them might be more profitable than loyalty to me. That's when your presence would be important. Do you see? I do, sir. But be careful with him, Pritchard. Chanis is intelligent, charming, and quite unscrupulous. Do not get in his way until and unless you're certain and prepared. You may leave. Sir. Janice, you may enter. There is a second foundation. It would make the galaxy so much more interesting. You are interested in it, are you? By the mystery of it, yes. The secrecy. And what do you think about the theory that the second foundation can stay secret because it consists of pure mind? Not physical power, but mind power. I don't believe it, sir. A civilization with any kind of power would use that power for its own good. The second foundation remains hidden, not exercising any power, simply because it hasn't got any power to exert. I think it's probably weaker than we think. Chanis, how would you like to head an expedition to locate the second foundation? Well, uh, I'd like it. But where am I to go? Is there some new evidence? Where you go would be entirely up to you. You'd be free to follow your instinct to play your hunches. You accept? Yes, sir, willingly. Good. General Pritchard will be with you on the mission. I thought you said I was to head the expedition. General Pritchard has experience which would be useful to you. And because he's converted, you can trust him? No, Chief. Quite the opposite. Hmm? Because Pritchard is converted and because he is my closest aid, he is actually a risk. That's why I could not send him alone. I don't understand, sir. Of course you do. Actually, you understand much less than you like to believe, Chance. Listen. I know the second foundation exists. I know. And not because of what Ebling Meese always told me. Because the second foundation has already begun to attack. What? <laughs> Minds which were under my control have been tampered with. Delicately, of course, quite subtly, but not so subtly that I didn't notice. And this influence is slowly increasing. It is affecting important men at important times. Perfectly loyal and capable servants of mine have failed to carry out my wishes to the letter. The men concerned were quite unaware of their negligence. But I noticed. Pritchard is my most valuable servant. A principal target for the second foundation. That's why I need you. To watch him. You may not be seen to be one of my people. Because you are not converted. You understand now? Yes, sir. But suppose it were not the second foundation that was doing this. Suppose there was another like yourself, 
Another mutant? No! The planning is too careful. Too long range. Six important minds have been tampered with in the past five years. That indicates a patience beyond a single mutant. A single mutant would be impatient with a single lifetime to achieve his ambitions. No, Chanice. It is a whole world. A civilization. And you are my weapon against it. Hmm. When do I start? As soon as you wish. General Pritchard is ready and waiting. And Chanice. Sir? You are already thinking of the rewards of success. A unique service would deserve a unique reward. As my successor, perhaps. Imagine yourself as ruler of the galaxy, heir to the mule. If you succeed, your ambitions would be satisfied. But remember, Chanis, the reward is unique. But the punishment for treason is unique. I would take your mind, Janice, slowly. And to be sure you understand. Oh! Ah! Ah! Anger won't help you, Janice. Yes, you are concealing it. But I can see it. Remember, I have killed men by emotional control. That will be all, Chanice. Gentlemen, I have called this meeting of the Guardians to inform you of an important decision and to give you the opportunity to question it. Thanks to our negligence, the mule came perilously close to discovering us in the library of Trantor. It was no credit to us that he was frustrated then. You all know the price we have paid. For the first time since our foundation, we have come out of hiding. We have made our existence more than just a suspicion by the interference with certain of the mule's highly placed creatures. Our agents tell us that this interference with the mule's control has not gone unnoticed. The situation is now highly unstable. We are faced with an irreversible breakdown of the plan. It is therefore necessary now for us to take the one solution open to us. The mule wants to find us. We must allow him to do so. In a sense, I repeat, in a sense. explain what they're going to do. You mean we are not going to go on drifting aimlessly through space in depth? Be patient, Pritchard. I've just finished reading my way through your reports. And? It's all very thorough. I can't help feeling that your approach, a general planet-by-planet -planet survey, was a little aimless. You have a better method, no doubt. I think so, yes. I've been working on more specific lines. I've asked myself, what is the Second Foundation? What physical conditions are they likely to have chosen? And then, which places in the galaxy fit the needs of the Second Foundation? As you imagine. That's right. I've used imagination. I realize that your controlled mind will distrust imagination, assuming you even remember what it means. Janice, have you come to any conclusion? I've come to a very clear conclusion. We're going to go to the planet Tarzenda. Oh, Janice. Is that the best you can do? We've checked our sender four years ago. Yes, but you might not have been looking for the right thing. Oh, all right. Why Tarzender? 
First, what would the second foundation mean? They do not have physical power, atomic weapons, massive fleets of ships such as we have, yes, yes, yes. but they can't be completely helpless physically. I think they probably control some other planets, primitive civilizations. So I started to look for a cluster of planets where a central world dominated the surrounding more backward planets. But it's a fairly long list, I admit, but there are other conditions. Selden said the second foundation was at Star's End. Which has never been located. No, but haven't you noticed, Pritchard? Star's End. Star's End. Yes. Well, if that's your only reason for picking Star's End. No, it's not it's my only reason. Come over here. Mm. Now, look at this. That is the winter sky as seen from Trantor. That's something you ignored in your search, I think, that all intelligent orientation must start from Trantor. Selden lived, worked, and planned on Trantor. What are you trying to show me, Janice? The projector will explain. You see that dark nebula there? Yes. The stellographical records call it Pele's Nebula. Watch it. I'm going to expand the image. Now, you'll notice that we're moving along a direct line from Trantor to Calais Nebula. So, in effect, we're still looking at a stellar orientation equivalent to that of Trantor. Right, right. That there is known locally as the mouth. It's significant because only from the Trantorian orientation does it look like a mouth. Now, follow the mouth down toward the gut. See, it narrows down so that eventually it's just that thin flicker of light. And there, right at the end, you can see how thin the nebula is. The light of that final star flickers back in just that one direction to shine on Trantor. And that star picture is Star's End. Star's End. Well, it's Oh, I've checked on what's known about Star's End. The answer is not much. It keeps itself to itself. It's an oligarchy ruling seven neighboring planets, all of them agricultural with low population density. It is not scientifically advanced. It has always adhered to a neutral position in any interstellar dispute, and it is not expansionist. The last fact alone would make it worth a closer look. Imagine, Pritchard, a civilization that is not expansionist. Have you informed the mule of all this? No. I don't need to tell the mule every time I breathe. We are at this moment on course for Tarzenda. Uh, by whose order? By my order, General. We leave now because we were supposed to leave in three days' time. You don't believe in the Second Foundation? I do. You can only obey the mule's orders without faith. I recognize a serious danger. The Second Foundation have had five years to prepare. They may have agents on Calgar. If I carry the knowledge of the location of the Second Foundation in my mind, these agents may discover it. So, we are in space, and the only other person who knows about Tarzenda is you. And you are certainly no agent of the Second Foundation. Are you, Preacher? Oh. Oh. Good. Well done. However, you will consult me in future before making decisions of this nature. But, of course, General. Excuse me, sir. What is it, Hoxlani? I made the equipment inspection, as you are, sir. Good. And? Could we speak somewhere more private, sir? Oh, what? Huh? You found something? Yes, sir. This. Behind the automatic navigator. Hmm. Huh. Neat, isn't it? What's it called? It's a hypertracer, sir. The most recent design. What does it do in simple language? It allows the ship to be tracked 
even through hyperspacer. In other words, whoever's got the twin of this one would know exactly where we were anywhere in space. Yes, sir. Ah. Well, interesting. There is something else, sir. This model was developed in the Mules Research Institute. Ah, I believe it's still a government secret. I mean, I don't think anyone else has anything so sophisticated except our master, the mule. <laughs> and yet here it is, planted on one of the mule's own ships. How do you explain that, Oxalani? I don't understand it, sir. But I hope it doesn't mean that I... Uh, well... I'm converted, you see, sir. And... Relax, Huxlani, you've done nothing wrong. I told you to make the search, and you've done it. Well, you were only obeying orders. Now, take it and put it back exactly where you found it. Understand? And then forget the whole incident, Huxlani. Forget it completely. Yes. Yes, sir. Understand? Yes. Forget it completely. Right. Yes, yes, what, what is it? Channis here, Pritchard. Sorry to disturb your sleep, but we're moving in towards the Tarzenda system. Yes, well, uh, wake me when the ship lands. The ship won't be landing. What? We're going down alone, Pritchard. Just you and me in a capsule. The ship can stay in space, just in case there's any trouble. Oh, yes. Well, all right. I'll, uh, I'll be with you immediately. Hooks, Lonnie, can you hear me? Loud and clear, sir. Good. Tell the pilot to remain in deep orbit around the planet and make sure you're always available on the communicator. Yes, sir. That is received. It looks pretty desolate down there, Janice. Yes. I don't recognize anything. Uh, hey, wait a minute. That's not Tarzenda. Quite right, it's not. I thought it might be a little reckless to land right in the middle of the second foundation. Janice, where are we landing? A little agricultural planet called Rossum. Oh. One of the farm worlds that services Tarzenda. Yes. No, I, right, Janice. No objection. I do realize it must be difficult for you trying to keep up with a mind that's free. Right. Down we go. just received confirmation. Thank you. So the mule is on his way. Yes. We are taking a risk. But if everything adheres to the function set up, we will succeed. The mule is not an ordinary man. It is difficult to influence the minds he controls, even at this distance without his noticing. But not all minds are controlled by him. Some are still free. But so few are in positions of authority. Systems off. Check positive. Busy screen on. Busy screen on. Well, what do we do now? We don't do anything. Just wait. We must have been tracked on the way down. Should be someone here to meet us soon. Oh, good. Probably put us up against a wall and blast us. Don't judge others by your own standards, Pritchard. Remember, this is part of the second foundation. They use their minds here. Ah, look, here they come. 
Don't look too fierce, do they? They're old men. Not even soldiers. Not even armed. Well, let's go and meet them. We come in peace. Oh, oh we don't, don't doubt it. it. Welcome to Rossem. Welcome indeed. We are the local elders. Uh, if you care to come with us, we can offer you our willing hospitality. Thank you. Thank you both. It's lucky for us you were close by to welcome us. Oh, nothing lucky about it. We were expecting you. Really? Yes, the governor said you'd be coming. Uh, keep an eye out for visitors, he said. Don't be so suspicious. How did he know we were coming? I don't know. The only way to find out is to go with uh, Gentlemen, uh, will you come with us? Gentlemen. Ah. The governor of Rossum, in the name of the lords of Tazenda, will see you now. If you'd like to follow me. Yes. Your Excellency, our visitors. Thank you, friend. Uh, you may go. Your Excellency, honored visitors. Your Excellency, thank you for receiving us at such short notice. I hope we're not interrupting your work. No, no, not, not at all. The fact is, I'm glad of any interruption. I'm pleased to be seated. Thank you. A uh, drink? Uh, yes, please. And you? No. Thank you. Well, please yourself. To you. Ah. <clears throat> to you. Mm. Ah, that's better. Uh, uh, what was I saying? Oh, yes, always glad of interruptions. You see, the fact is, it's not much of a job, really, governing a place like Rossum. Very quiet, you know, very quiet. Farmers, that's all we have here. But since you are here, I, I wonder if you could tell me something about yourself, whereabouts you come from, that kind of thing. I have to fill in the usual forms, you know. Your <laughs> routine, of course. Oh, we understand, Your Excellency. We come from a small world in the Santani sector. Oh, do you? Ah, well, that's, uh, that's quite a long way from here, I imagine. Yes, Excellency, it is. Yeah. And yet your transportation appears to be rather small. That's just a surface to ship capsules, sir. Ah. Our ship has remained in space, waiting for us. So it's your ship that's orbiting the planet, is it? Yes, sir. We felt that to land with such a large ship, so heavily armed, we thought that might perhaps give rise to doubts about our peaceful intentions. <laughs> <laughs> so we preferred to land alone, unarmed. Well, that's very considerate of you. Yeah. But... Um... Uh, now uh, we know you're peaceful, and now you know you're welcome here. <laughs> uh, perhaps uh, you'd like to bring your ship down into our space dock. Ship stays, yes. We have quite good maintenance and repair facilities there, and I'm sure your crew would welcome the rest. Ah, uh, forgive us, Your Excellency, but I'm afraid the ship has to stay where it is. It's traditional for our large ships to remain in space. It's an old custom with us. Is it really? Well, uh, perhaps you could give me some hint of the purpose of your visit to Rossum. Certainly, sir. We are very interested in establishing trade relations. Trade? Look, Captain... Um, uh, uh, Captain Channis, uh, sir. Uh, Channis, yes. Look, the fact is I don't know a great deal about trade. I'll have to refer back to Tazenda. If you could... Wait here for a few days. Well, perhaps we could go on to Tarzenda, sir, and inquire directly there. Ah, no, 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 Captain Channis. It would be much better if you just waited here. Large foreign ships are not encouraged to visit Tarzenda. It's an old custom of ours. 
Yes. Well, we await here then. Oh, good, good. And uh, perhaps our local vintages will make any delay seem quite tolerable. Huh? I'm sure they will, Excellency. <laughs> Thank you. One more thing before I open another bottle. Mm? Your silent friend, the abstainer. Perhaps I might know his name. Just for the record, you know, purely routine. Ham Pritcher. Ham Pritcher. Hmm. Right. Now, a fresh bottle, eh? A fresh bottle. Any communications at all yet? Suppose the second foundation have tried to tamper with my mind. Would I know? Would I feel any different? I didn't feel any different after the mule converted me. The second foundation must be found and destroyed. No hesitation. Hatred. Pure hatred. The mule must be found and... and must be... Good. If I feel absolute loyalty to the mule, nothing else matters. Any communications yet? Yes, sir. Channel open the cargo. Ready to report, sir. Go ahead, Pritchard. Sir, I think Chalice has got us into trouble. We're stuck here on this backward little planet, supposedly waiting for permission to go to Tarzenda. That's all, sir. We're, we're just waiting. Waiting. I, I don't like it. And Janice? Oh, he, he is perfectly happy doing nothing. Seems to think everything is going very well. I don't like that either. I don't trust him, sir. You do not have to trust him. Just be patient. Wait and watch for any sign of the second foundation. Understood? Yes, sir. That's all for the moment, Pitcher. Uh, yes, sir. Joy, Pig Farm 155. <laughs> what do you think? It's very I impressive. It is, isn't it? There's something about pigs. They have such, such dignity. Oh, and intelligence. Oh, very shrewd animals, pigs. There's something deeply reassuring about being surrounded by hundreds of happy, well-fed pigs. Uh, don't you think? No. They smell. Ah, oh, but what a smell. What an aroma. What a perfume. A perfume. Yes, it's a very individual smell. Oh, oh it clears the mind and soothes the mouth. Uh, see him. Uh, see that one? Mm -hmm. uh, his great-grandfather was the biggest boar ever produced on the whole of Rossum. You don't seem to share our love of food, sir. Pigs smell bad, but taste good. That's all I know about them. All I want to know. Uh, uh, well, then, uh, perhaps we could move on. Uh, we've arranged a little visit to our finest mush farm. Mush? I'm sure you'll enjoy that. What's mush? Have you never eaten mush? To the best of my knowledge, never. Imagine oh, you yes, never having yeah. enjoyed a good dish of mud. I know, I know. And just think, there must be some people on our visitors' world who will live and die without ever having savoured the taste of mud. <laughs> done today. First they introduced us to a crowd of pigs, and then they showed us fields of mush. They? Who are they? The two elders who met us when we landed. They seem to feel it their duty to entertain us while we wait word from Tarzenda. They 
don't know anything about anything except wine, pigs, and mush. Uh, they're not interested in anything except wine, pigs, and mush. Preacher, you must be patient. Talk to them. Ask them what they know about Tazenda, its system of government, its people, its technology. All right, sir. But I know what their answer will be. live there. I know that. Have you ever seen them? Have you ever uh, been to Tazenda? Oh, we've uh, never been anywhere. Uh, Could you have gone to Tazenda if you'd want to? Oh, I don't know. We, we never did want to. So you, in fact, have no real knowledge of Tazenda at all? Well, no. Uh, it's uh, never seemed very important. We send food to Tazenda. Um, pigs, wine, and, and mush, of course. And what do they give you in return? Uh, well, um, they uh, give us government. Yes. Uh, they let us live... Um... Live, live in peace. Uh, live you in don't peace. know. You never ask. You're very easily satisfied, that's all I can say. Yes, and you are not easily satisfied. <laughs> we must seem uh, very ignorant to you, but, but uh, we are contented, uh, and to us, you seem very clever with your spaceships and your great desire for knowledge or information, but uh, you don't seem contented at all, if I may say so. It's true. You don't seem to be a happy man. Why not? I don't like sitting around doing nothing. Good ah. gracious, don't you? Oh, well, I can see how you would be unhappy then. Do you really not enjoy just sitting, thinking? Drinking? Daydreaming? Doing nothing? nothing? I enjoy doing things. Uh, what things? Anything. I, I, I enjoy being busy, uh, Doing things. Oh, well, we do sympathize. We do indeed. Yes, oh, poor man. No wonder you look so, so, uh, discontented. Poor man. Oh, poor man. Poor man. Doing things. Oh, doing dear, dear, things. dear. They know nothing about Tazenda, sir. What did you talk about? Just, we, well, they, they feel sorry for me, sir. What? They feel sorry for me. They're ignorant old men living on a boring backward planet with nothing to do all day, nothing to hope for, nothing to work for, fight for. And yet they feel sorry for me. Somehow it makes me feel uneasy. I, I mean, I, I don't... Roger, where is Janice at this moment? He's in his room, sir. Nothing. Just sitting, drinking wine. The time has come for action. Richard, I have something to tell you about Janice. Guardian, a message from the center. We have intersection point. Yes. Good. Very good indeed. Hello, Pritcher. Drink? Get up, Janice. What's the matter? Stop pretending to be drunk and get on to your feet. Keep your hands free where I can see them. I thought we agreed to bring no weapons down here. Janice! You're under arrest for treason to the first citizen of the Union. And your proof? Sit down. <sighs> Tell me, why should the mule send out an untried, uncontrolled person on this search? He wanted to find the second foundation. He and I had both failed. So there was one other course open to him. To find a seeker who already knew the hiding place. I presume that is me. How easily you found Tarzenda. How miraculously you examined the correct region of the galaxy. How lucky you were to find a planet which fitted your information. What a successful man you are. Too successful, is he? Yes, for a loyal servant of the mule. What do you mean, 
you are under the mental influence of the second foundation. Without the mule's knowledge, oh, really, Chris? With the mule's knowledge, Janice. With the mule's knowledge. Hmm? And you led us both to the second foundation, as you are meant to do. Ah, I see. You think the mule is following us because of that hypertracer on the ship's communication, sir. Ah, you look surprised. Yes, I knew about it, too. Now I'll tell you something you don't know about. The mule knows that the minds of some of his converted men have been tampered with. What? Yes, and that is why he needed me, an unconverted man. Didn't he emphasize that, even though he didn't give you the real reason? Ah, try something else, Janice. If I were against the mule, I'd, I'd, I'd know it. Oh, you may feel loyal. Loyalty wouldn't be tampered with. But perhaps your mental faculties have been affected. You didn't see the mule plant that hypertracer. You just assumed so. Just as you have assumed the mule is following us. Just as you have assumed that it is the mule you have been communicating with. But it is not the mule who is coming after us. Then who is it? Who do you suppose? Yes, Pritchard. The second foundation want you. You know more about the Union than anyone except the mule. And you are not dangerous to them while he is. That is why they put the direction of the search into my unconverted mind. I knew that, but I played along with them. They wanted us. We wanted their location. So why not play their game? Now, give me the blast, huh? It isn't your mind that's made the decision to kill me. It's the second foundation within your mind. No. Give it to me, Pritchard. Come on, give it to me, and we'll face whatever happens together for the mule. No, Pritchard. Stay just as you are. I was right. It was you following us. He is a traitor. I knew it. Well. I am not a traitor. I may have been mistaken about Pritchard, but I am not a traitor. I thought General Pritchard was under the control of the Second Foundation. You no longer think so. No, I can't, or else you wouldn't be here. Well, let us get this straightened out, shall we? We will not be interrupted, by the way. I've thrown an emotional repulse field around the building. Nobody can break through that without losing his sanity. Now, Chanis, how do you explain this odd theory of yours? that it was not really me who was in contact with Pritchard? Sir, I can only suggest that the idea was put into my mind. By the Second Foundation? Well, it must have been. And yet I wasn't aware of any control. I suppose you think now that your idea to come to Descender was also put into your mind by the Second Foundation? I suppose it must have been, sir. But I don't see why. Really, Chad? Really? If I were a traitor and knew the whereabouts of the Second Foundation, you could convert me and learn the knowledge directly. True. If you needed to trace me, then obviously I didn't have the knowledge and so was not a traitor. Your conclusion? I am not and never have been a traitor. Irrefutable. Sir, I can't have been mistaken. There is a third explanation, Pritchard. Do you see it? No. Only one kind of man could both know the location of the Second Foundation and prevent me from learning it. Bail Chanis is, and always was, a loyal member of the Second Foundation. Your evidence? Important minds under my control have been tampered with. The medium of interference had to be unconverted and fairly close to the center of my empire. That left quite a large field to choose from. But you, Chanis, you were a man apart. You were too successful. People liked you too much. Even I liked you. That made me very suspicious. I invited you to lead the expedition to find the second foundation. And you were not surprised at the offer, Chanis. I observed your emotions. No man of real competence could have avoided uncertainty at that moment. But your mind showed no uncertainty. That meant you were either a fool or an enemy. And I knew you were not a fool so you were a second foundationer. The extraordinary ease with which you decided Tazenda was a second foundation, combined with your very crude rationalization of this choice for Pritchard's benefit, that only confirmed the fact. I knew you were a second foundationer before you left Kalgan. 
The mule must be destroyed. And now, mind to mind, we communicate our way. You are between two fires, first citizen. You cannot control two minds simultaneously, not when one of them is mine. Pritcher is free of his conversion now. He is the old Pritcher, the one who tried to kill you once. And he knows you have debased him to helpless adulation for five years. I am holding him back by suppressing his will. But if you kill me, that control stops. And in considerably less time than you could move your blaster, let alone your will, he would kill you. If you turn to him, you will not be quick enough to turn again to stop me. So throw down your blaster and you can have Pritcher back. So, I miscalculated your abilities, Chanis. It was a mistake to have a third party here when I confronted you. It introduced one variable too many. A mistake that must be paid for. What about Pritcher? What about him? He is not important. He is an instrument, that is all. I did not know the second foundation was humanitarian. There are many things you did not know. Will he survive? Yes. His sleep is largely protected. Once he wakes up, he'll begin to function again, slowly. You still seem confident, Mule. <laughs> you are defeated, Mule. You really thought you had achieved something, didn't you, when you conquered the first foundation? The first foundation is like Pritcher here, just an instrument. The sole guardian of the Selden plan is the second foundation, us, only us. Janice, I am not interested in Selden, his plan, or the intended purpose of the second foundation. Only one thing interests me or amuses me. You should speak of the second foundation in the past tense now, because it no longer exists. I know you're playing for time here, waiting for your allies to arrive. But they will not be coming, Janice. Nobody will be coming here to help you. You are bluffing, Mule. I do not bluff. I take action. Did you think I was following you alone? Really, Janice, how naive. My entire fleet was with me until a few hours ago. I came here. They went to Tazenda. A few minutes ago, the planet of Tazenda was entirely obliterated. No trace of life was allowed to remain. The second foundation no longer exists. No. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Oh, yes. I promise you. Janice, you are pretending again. Janice, you're faking. I can tell. I can tell. Tazenda is destroyed, and yet your despair is not real. Janice, what is the truth? Tell me. Tell me the truth, Janice. What is the truth? Talk, 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 talk. The truth is... That you have destroyed an innocent world, you. You have murdered millions of people for nothing. Tazenda was a decoy, a figurehead. The true second foundationers were never the obvious holders of power. Rossum is the word of the second foundation. Rossum, not Tazenda. You are telling the truth. Yes, you are telling the truth. At last. <gasps> Rossum is the world. Rossum! Oh, you... Yes, I believe you this time. But did you really think you could fool me for long? You were fooled. But not for long enough, Chanis. My fleet has contingency orders. After destroying Tazenda, they will now be in orbit around Rossum. They can destroy this world as easily as any other. No! No, I... No, no, no. Yes, Janice. Yes. Oh. 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 Who 
are you? How did you... I am the first guardian of the second foundation. It took time to penetrate your emotional repulse field. I congratulate you on the skill of its construction. You are alone? Quite alone. Have you too come to test my brain? You see how your agent Chanis tried and failed. He did not fail. He performed well, especially since he was not your mental equal. And you are my equal? I am. I see you have mistreated poor Chanis. I hope we can still restore him to health. He volunteered for his mission, you know. Although we were able to predict mathematically the great likelihood of damage to mind and spirit. So, Chanis was a brave man. But he didn't achieve anything. You know I have destroyed Tazenda. I bitterly regret the necessity of it. You know that my ships are now in orbit around Rossum with orders to blast the whole planet except for this tiny area unless I receive your surrender. My evaluation of you was inaccurate in one respect. Even when I knew you were a mutant, I failed to realize what a pathetic creature you were, how you were driven on by your terrible feeling of inferiority. It did not occur to me to pity you at first. Now, of course, I do pity you. Poor megalomaniac, so starved of affection and love. Do you really think you can blast the galaxy into loving you? Do you really think the controlled loyalty of converted minds can ever compare to true affection, freely felt? I do not need affection. I do not need love. I have power. I control. I conquer. Yes. But how miserable you are. Aren't you, you? Of course, the fact that you're an emotional cripple is not to be condemned. Merely changed. Cured. I cannot give you physical well-being, I'm afraid. But emotionally, you can be healed. Believe me, Mule, we will help you to be happier. You talk of helping me. I am about to destroy the second foundation. My fleet is about to destroy Rossum. Yes, you can destroy Rossum. But the second foundation is not on Rossum. You deny the truth. Chanis said it was there, and he spoke the truth. Yes, the truth as he believed it to be. I stripped his brain. I saw it was the truth. Yes, the truth as Chanis knew it. But when he volunteered for his mission, he not only accepted the risk to his life, he accepted the most drastic emotional and mental surgery. His character, his ideas, and his memory were replaced by synthetic models. Janice himself honestly believes Rossum is the second foundation. He believes he was born here, and that his family and everything he values is here. Then Rossum is not the second foundation. Do you think we would ever risk the second foundation for you? We took some risks, Mew, but we are not insane. The second foundationers who were here acting as drunken governors or simple village elders, have left the planet. While your ships were busy with the massacre of Tazenda, second foundationers were already on their way to your home planet, Kalgan. It is too late for you to catch them now. But do not worry. They are not going to destroy anything at all, except your emotional control over the people of your empire. Within a matter of days, or even hours, there will be no mind controlled by the mule. Everyone will be a free thinker again. At least in so far as the normal human brain is ever able to think freely. 
I think you can abandon your dreams of galactic empire. <laughs> Do not cry. You should be glad. It was all something of a nightmare, even for you. And we have no interest in revenge or in your death. I'm afraid your body is not very strong. But at least you can live out what years you have left as an ordinary provincial lord. We are going to return you to Calgan and allow you to govern there. You will be greatly helped by a course of emotional medicine conducted by one of our finest doctors. In a very short time, you will no longer feel any need to conquer the galaxy. Nobody will ridicule you. Nobody will have any recollection of your former powers, and neither will you. Neither will you retain any memory of the Second Foundation. Now, are you ready to leave for your new life back on Calgan? I... I am... Yes. Now, Mew, look into my eyes. Look deep. Look. <sighs> Very well. You may leave now. Yes. Back to Calgan. Certainly. How do you feel? Me? Excellent. Who are you? No matter. Now wake Pritcher and take him with you. He will need care and attention. He's been badly hurt. But he has no memory of emotional control. And therefore no desire for revenge. Revenge? For what? Never mind. Just go with him. Yes. Come on, Pritchard. Wake up. We are going home. Everything's all right. We're going. We're going home. Janice? Mm. Janice, how do you feel? Uh, oh, weak. Weak. Yes, that is to be expected. Do not worry about anything now. We will soon have you back to full health. And with your own feelings and memory back again. I... I... Is it true that Rossum is not the second foundation? Not my home? Quite true. You had never been here before this visit. I am taking you back to our real home now. You will soon be back on the real second foundation with your family and friends. You will have your genuine memories back. Can we be sure that the mule will never remember? Quite sure. The mule will never even conceive the idea of a second foundation. Our problem in the future will not be the mule. The real problem we will face will be the first foundation. But why? The first foundation is now free again from the mule. I'm afraid that unlike him, their minds will be aware of the second foundation and the part we played in stopping the mule. We were to remain hidden until the time came for Selden's plan to reach fruition. We have had to come out of hiding because of the mule. Now our problem will be how to become hidden again. How to stop the First Foundation becoming dependent on us without causing them too much damage. 
It will be for your generation of guardians to solve that problem, Janice. When your mind is whole again. <laughs> Title, Foundation. Foundation and Empire, Second Foundation. Author, Isaac Asimov. Audio adaptation, Mike Stott. Part number seven. Part title, The New Funds. Foundation. Foundation and Empire. Second Foundation. Author, Isaac Asimov. Part number eight. Part title, Stars End. Encyclopedia Galactica 116th edition. Entry. Darrow. Arcady. Born the year 362 Foundation era. Died the year 443 Foundation era. Although primarily a writer of fiction, Arthur D. Darrow is best known for the biography of her grandmother, Beta Darrow. It has for centuries served as a primary source of information concerning the rise and fall of the mule and the resurgence of the Foundation. of Selden's Plan by A. Darrell. The Foundation's past history is, I am sure, well known to all of us who have had the good fortune to be educated in our planet's efficient and well-staffed school system. Mmm, that's good for five credit marks from old Erling for a start. Through our possession of the physical science of the Empire, we at the Foundation were able to withstand the attacks of the barbarous kingdoms around the periphery and eventually to subdue them. It seemed nothing could stop the workings of Selden's plan. Every crisis came at its appropriate time and was solved. Then, with the last remnants of the dead First Empire gone, and with only ineffectual warlords ruling over the splinters and remnants of the decayed Colossus, there came the mule. Oh! What are you doing spying on a lady in her bedroom? Will you let me in, please? I am not the kind of girl who lets strange men into her bedroom via the window, even via the door. And you can't force the window, it's got a protective screen. He'd only see the occupants of this house. One of whom is Dr. Darrell, am I right? Why should I tell you? Oh. Or if you jump off, young man, I shall raise the alarm. What do you want me to do? It's better to come in. Dr. Darrell does live here. I'll turn the screen off. <laughs> Well, you are risking your character and reputation, aren't you? No, you are. If anyone comes, I'll shout and yell and say you forced your way in. And the deactivated protective screen? Easy, there isn't one. How old are you? Don't be impertinent. Oh, oh don't leave now. My father's expecting you. Huh? Actually, I'm not supposed to know about it. <laughs> that seems a forlorn hope on the part of your father. But how do you know he's expecting you? He was secretive. You're secretive, it's obvious. Really? And if you're wrong, and he's not expecting me, but someone else? Then at the slightest move, I'll hit you with my ball court club, which is under my bed. As we're being so friendly, may I introduce myself? I'm Pelias Anthor. And I am Arcady Darrell. Good. Now, perhaps you can. Arcadia, will you... Oh, who are you, sir? Dr. Darrell, I'm Pelias Anthor. You're expecting me, so your daughter says... So oh, my daughter says. Oh, will you come with me, please? And... Oh, Arcadia, you seem to have left the transcriber running. Hmm. Arcadia, it strikes me that a young lady should not be so impertinent to older men. Well, why was he looking through my window? A young lady has a right to some places. Then you should never have let him in at all. You should have called me immediately. 
Especially as you knew I was expecting him. Anyway, I wouldn't see him at all, stupid man. Oh, oh, dear. He'll oh. give the whole game away if he keeps on going to windows instead of doors. What game are you referring to, young lady? Combating the second foundation, that's what. <laughs> You have reached the end of your theoretical studies. The time has come for your initiation into the practical workings of the plan. Yes, Guardian. Now, study the wall. There you can see the plan in its entirety. A finished work of art, is it not? Yes, Guardian. Wrong. It is not finished. That is the first lesson you must unlearn. The Selden plan was neither complete nor correct. It was merely the best that could be done at the time. Generations of our people have studied the equations, worked on them, and improved them. Before you are admitted to the guardianship, you too will have to make an original contribution to the plan. Now, tell me the aim of the plan. To establish a human civilization based on an entirely different orientation from anything which has ever existed before. What is this orientation to be? A civilization based on mental science. In all the history of mankind, advances have been made primarily in physical technology. The capacity to control an inanimate world. Control of self and of society has been left either to chance or to intuitive ethical systems based on inspiration and emotion. The result is that no culture has ever existed of greater stability than 55%. And even these have only existed as the result of great human misery. Why should not this desired civilization, based on mental science, come about spontaneously, without the plan? The benefits to be derived from mental science are not perceived by most human beings, because although they are longer lasting than any physical benefits, they are more subtle and less apparent. Therefore, a spontaneous orientation around the mental sciences would at best lead to a benevolent dictatorship by the few who could perceive its benefits. Virtually a higher subdivision of mankind. This would be resented by the majority and could therefore not be stable without the application of force which would depress the mass of mankind to the brute level. The solution? The solution is the seldom plan. Conditions have been so arranged that in another 650 years, a millennium after the plan's inception, a second galactic empire will have been established by the first foundation. At that time, the second foundation will be able to reveal itself and provide the leadership of mental science. And why is it necessary that the existence of the second foundation should be hidden? Because the first foundation is still in a very early stage of its development, still at a stage where its population would resent a ruling class of psychologists and would, in fact, fear its development and fight against it. Good. Now, to begin your practical study of the plan, I want you to consider that area there. The contemporary situation with a brief projection into the future. You see the situation on the first foundation? Yes, Guardian. Potentially critical. It is indeed. You will see there... And there, that we have already taken limited action. Your problem will be to study the effects of this action and to formulate further actions which may be possible and necessary. Guardian, this is dangerous. Yes, we have considered other, less definite actions, and the equations clearly showed they would not achieve our aim. So we are left with this one course of action. Do not worry. You will not be alone. I shall be supervising 
your supervision of them. May I introduce Dr. Pelias Anthor of the Kleis Laboratory. He was the late Dr. Kleis's chief assistant. Uh, Dr. Anthor, this is the Emeritus Professor of Physics at the University, Elvet Semik. There you go. Uh, Joel Turbor, the well-known physicaster and commentator. My pleasure. And last but not least, Omir Mund, the senior foundation librarian, and also the leading expert on the mule and his period of power. <laughs> you flatter me, Darrell. How do you do, Anthor? Gentlemen, please sit, yes. <coughs> Now, I checked Dr. Anthor's brainwave pattern to the fifth level, and he has checked yours and mine, <laughs> so we can rest assured that we are all who we say we are. <laughs> Dr. Anthor. Thank you, Dr. Dow. Gentlemen, for some time there's been speculation about the existence of the Second Foundation, and for those who accept that it does exist, speculation on its purpose and its effect, particularly with reference to ourselves. I have conclusive proof of its existence and its effect upon us. Proof? Don't you really say that? Now, I'm an electroneurologist by training. I worked with Dr. Clive until his death a few weeks ago. And I was in charge of organizing the results of a survey that Dr. Clive conducted. A survey on the brainwave patterns of the upper levels of our society. Uh, Dr. Clive himself died before the analysis had been completed. However, I completed the work as best I could. And it was during the analysis that I saw for myself what had so excited Clive before his death. And I brought this evidence with me in the form of copies of a dozen or so selected brainwave records, and I'll project them for you. <coughs> uh, the first four, they're all government officials on anacreum. Uh, this is a psychological researcher from the University of Locris. Uh, There's an industrialist from Siwena. And the remainder, they're members of the provincial legislatures of Locris, uh, the Nacrian, Siwena, and Haven. Uh, all these men and women have two things in common. Firstly, specialized knowledge of psychology. And secondly, well, this may be seen on the records themselves. And I ask, Dr. Darrell to interpret them. Well, the crucial area is there in the Taurian secondary wave area. There's a quite distinctive plateau common to all of them. What are we supposed to make of that? I'm not sure. Even in amnesia, where there is suppression of this level, I've never seen anything like that. It's um, a complete absence, a removal. Yes. I agree. With no sign of any physical surgery, no drug traces, we have clear evidence of the removal of part of the brain. Ah. And you think this was done by the Second Foundation? Well, I think we all do. We've all suspected something like this. Now we have the proof. Well, Dr. Anto, how widespread is this Second Foundation infiltration? Well, in detail, we don't know. But in general, it seems so far to be restricted to citizens of the outer worlds. Terminus itself seems to be still clean. Seems to be. But gentlemen, all we can be sure of is that at this moment, we five are still ourselves. Those people whose brainwaves you saw are quite unaware that they're being controlled. Any one of us could be affected, probably quite suddenly, and be completely unaware of it. Well, gentlemen, I'm just a librarian. No, of course. Oh, well, maybe I am an expert on the mule, but really it's purely antiquarian interest. I'm quite out of my depth here. and I mean, well, I mean, this is dangerous. I don't see what we can do about it. I mean, we can talk, but uh, what can we do? Is there anything we can do? Yes, Mon, there is. We can find out more about the Second Foundation. But how? The mule spent the first five years of his rule searching for information. He failed. We don't actually know why the mule suddenly abandoned the search, do we? Because it was hopeless to go on. Because he failed. What if he stopped because he succeeded? What? Succeeded? Hmm? The mule's palace on Calgan is still completely intact, isn't it? Yes. And nobody's allowed to touch anything there, right? Yes. 
It's a kind of shrine nowadays. The local people have all kinds of superstitious beliefs about it. Now, the yeah, most Mon, Mon, have one you would... ever considered that the superstition that protects the place might have been arranged by the second foundation? What is the result of the new search? Ah, there in his palace. I wonder if they contain a clue, one clue, that we could use. Oh, I hardly think Look, that you'd find... Look, it's possible, at least. We need to grasp every chance, no matter how slight. You're suggesting a mission to Calgon? Yes, I am. Who do you think should go, Anton? Somebody with two qualifications. First, expert knowledge of the mule. Second, the experience in searching through old documents. Well, now, who could we... Oh... I see. Anthor. Anthor. Uh, what is it? I'm sorry to wake you, but we've got a slight problem. What? Well, Mun's on his way, isn't he? That's the problem. He's on his way, but he's not alone. He's, he's got a stowaway on board. Well, who? My daughter. You... I found this note in her room just now. Dear Father, just a note to tell you how much I'll miss you all the time I'm on vacation with Uncle Homie. Oh. I must say my new sound receiver worked well last night. Love, Archibald. Now, what do we do? Nothing. If we call Moon back now, he'll never agree to leave again. Oh. And assuming we're being watched, somewhere by someone, it's better not to draw too much attention to ourselves by making a fuss. That's true enough. And Arkady's given us a way out, saying she's on vacation with her Uncle Homia. Hmm. Well, she's your daughter. Yes, she is. She's very much like her mother was. But I think the least we can do is to tell Moon, don't you? <laughs> I should think he's well aware of the situation by now. <laughs> Good morning. Sleep well. Oh, I... Arkady, what are you doing here? I'm having a little holiday with you. But it's quite all right. Father knows all about it. I've left him a note and I just got his reply. It says, have a good time and best wishes to Uncle Homia, father. But you... I'm not your uncle, Arkady. I'm nobody's uncle. We can always pretend... Uncle Homer? Oh, no. oh but, 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 but this is outrageous. It, it was bad enough having to come here on my own, getting bundled on board and blasted into space. But, but now it, 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 it's even worse. Worse? But I'll look after you. Breakfast for a start. Breakfast? I made it just for you. Oh. Well... Now you just relax and enjoy your holiday. <laughs> Guardian, may I speak with you? You have solved our little problem with a plan? No, Guardian, I have not. My analysis of the situation on the first foundation has shown there are, in fact, two distinct problems. Yes. Firstly, the tendency of the most able men and women of the first foundation to study psychology and the arts in preference to the physical sciences. They are clearly trying to make the First Foundation like ourselves, or as they imagine us to be. Yes. The action already taken, induced brain absences, the elimination of Dr. Clyes, and the continued infiltration, seems to be at least containing that problem. But the second problem, the economic stagnation, the enormous reduction in scientific research work, the fact that that there have been no recent renewals of the defense fleet is not being dealt with at all. The First Foundation is placing a growing reliance on our protection and are increasingly failing to look after themselves. We must do something to correct that trend. What is your correction? Guardian, I have considered your recommendation to cause minimal damage 
But the only cure I can see is to create a limited war against the First Foundation. I have been in power here a whole month now, Myrus. Uh, yes, Myrus. Myrus, I am an ambitious man. Calden was only the beginning. Pucci, can I just make Do not point? interrupt matters of state, Talia. Oh, sorry, Pucci. Look, Myrus, we have spent most of this month convincing everybody that I really am descended from the mule on his sister's side. So I do have a perfectly legitimate right to the throne. It is widely accepted now, my lord, especially since my... Chance discovery of the old family tree. Yes, yes, yes. So I have Calvin, right? Yes, my lord. And I have a powerful fleet, right? Yes, my lord. My rest, there's no point in having a well armed fleet if you're not going to use it. It'll go rusty. So what I want you to do now is to have a good look over the galactic map and to pick out a short list of places we could conquer. Oh, uh, my lord, get an eye. Would that be wise, my lord? It is what I want. Therefore, uh, it is wise. Would she? I don't want Carrier, to hear that. Carrier, will you please not interrupt me? And do not call me Pucci in public. I am the government of Calvin, after all. I'm sorry, Pucci, but honestly... Carrier, go to your room and kneel down in front of the portrait of me over the bed. Spend the rest of the day practicing calling me Lord Stettin. All right, I'm going. You don't need very much of my intelligence, do you? I didn't marry you for your intelligence. You didn't marry me at all, not legally. I have publicly said you are my wife, which makes it legal now. Not like a real old-fashioned wedding, are we? Carlia, go and do not bother me again. I need to consider my place in history. Oh, could she? Get yes. out. Could she? Get out. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. <sighs> now, as I was saying... Uh, what was I saying? <laughs> you were telling me to find you a war, my lord. Right? A war? Conquest? That is what we need, Marius. Yes, my lord. In the last three or four years, how many lords of Calgon have you served, Marius? Um, Eleven, my lord. Exactly. I am number twelve. Now, what did all the others lack, Marius? Oh, well, I lord. tell you, a Christian. Yes, my lord. They all tried to govern peacefully. So what this world needs is a war. We've got to distract them, Marius, entertain them. So you find me a war. I'm not too far away either. I'll get no credit for smashing some little planet nobody ever heard of. And I want something within easy range of public vidicard coverage. Let the people see that I am the true heir of the mule. But my lord... I that... am... But, sir, it's the mule fails. Fails. Hey. You say he fails. My, my lord, the history films all tell us quite clear. Please, the history films, then. Anybody who says the mule fails a traitor, Myrus. And anybody who gets in my way is a traitor, too. <laughs> quite so, my lord. <laughs> but she, the Lord said him we've got visitors. Visitors who? A nice old man and his niece. They're just a, a couple of troublesome tourists, my lord, uh, from the foundation. Tourists? What are tourists doing in my palace? Yes, my lord, I'll deal with them. They're not tourists. They're, um, histological researchers, is that right? Uh, well, uh, not exactly. What do they want, disturbing me like this? My lord, I was trying to keep them from disturbing you, but uh, if you will just wait in the ante room and... As I told you, I don't think it's possible, Myrus. But you, they want to look round the mule's old palace, so they thought they'd better come and ask your permission. Look round? For what? I told you, they're researchers. They're interested in the mule, in old things. They're intellectual. <sighs> Bring them here. <laughs> my lord. Thank you for seeing us, my lord, Stephen. 
What do you want in the mule, Phallus? Just, uh, uh, just to study, my lord. Hmm. And you? Oh, I've just come for holidays, my lord, with my uncle. Hmm. Oh, be nice to them, for a change, you pretty little girl. Hmm. Yes, she is. Not so little either. <laughs> She's beautiful. What's your name, young lady? Lady Callia, I believe you have just made a fundamental error. <laughs> gown you ever saw? Hmm. What there is of it. It's a don't you think? Oh, no. It's my first woman's gown, Lady Callia. For the first time in my life, I'm being treated like a woman and not like a little girl. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Lord Seton gave it to you, didn't he? Yes, and the jewels. Uh-huh. Ah, Kitty, I may give you some advice. Don't believe everything Lord Seton said. But he hasn't said anything. He's just given me these beautiful presents. Mm, yeah. Look, I don't know really much about fishing, but the way to catch a fish is with a hook. But first you bait the hook. The fish takes the bait, and the hook takes the fish. You see, Arkady, I'm not very bright. Most things I'm not interested in. Stettin's interested in war. All right, I don't mind. I'm just interested in Stettin, in keeping him. So war's all right, but if he gets too interested in you... Lady Callia, I'm not in love with Lord Stettin. Well, it's not exactly love I was talking about, however. Subject closed, yes? Yeah? Yes. Yes. Modern in the old palace again, is he? In the library there, yes. Well, it's beyond me what he finds so fascinating in all those dusty old films. Do you understand it, Arthur? Oh, yes. It is very important. Well, I know I'm rather slow on the uptake, but how, I could you explain it to me in words of one syllable? Well, I'll try. <laughs> and of course, Butchie, I couldn't really understand most of what she was talking about. Well, she is intelligent as well as beautiful and young. Yes, but she quite. But anyway, I did try to keep up with her, and I found out one thing that I thought you might be interested in. Mm -hmm. Well, she was explaining how it was that Mum was trying to find some clues about something called the Second Foundation. She is wasting his time. There is no such thing. Well, that's what I thought, but I didn't like to say anything. Anyway, what was interesting was that Arkady mentioned just in passing that because people on terminus thought this Second Foundation thing would protect them, they didn't bother much with self-defense anymore. Mm -hmm. So? Well, I may be stupid, but I thought, well, if my Pucci wants somebody weak to conquer and he doesn't want to have to travel too far, well, the foundation seems like a good target. Ah. Well, of course, it's probably just another of my silly ideas. I don't know why I mentioned it, really, Pucci. I'm telling you. The mule conquered the first foundation. Did he? And he did not have much trouble with it, either. The second foundation myth did not stop him. Oh, well, maybe it did thinking about. Ah, maybe it is. You have heard of history repeating itself. Ah, come here. You are not just a pretty face after all. Oh, would she? Oh, would she couldn't be get married, please? I mean, a proper wedding. Wedding? Carlia, I have a war to fight. I have plans to make. I have a world to conquer. <laughs> I requested this audience because, uh, well, I've just had an urgent message asking me to go home. Your requests are no longer of any importance here. Oh, but uh, it was an urgent message. Man, do you think I'd let you just go back to the Foundation now, you a spy? Well, but... Uh, oh, what? You are a spy, Man. Oh, but my lord... You came here disguised as an ineffectual, foolish little man. But I wasn't fooled for a minute, Mum. I knew you were an agent of the Foundation all the time. Oh. 
Now the penalty for espionage against my royal self is death. For who? But in your case, I'm going to be lenient, man. In return for your help, I am going to allow you to live. I... But no, you... What kind of help? You are the leading galactic expert on the late and great mule, are you not? Yes, but I... Do uh... you know what reincarnation is, man? Oh, yes. It is a primitive superstition. Concerning... Man, you see before you conclusive proof of reincarnation. Hmm? I have experienced a revelation. It has been revealed to me that I step in the first and not merely the heir to the mule. Man, I am the mule. I am the reincarnation of the mule. What do you think of that, man? I, I am struggling to see what this has got to do with me, my lord. I am the reincarnation of the mule, so I need to find out something about him. The kind of clothes he wore, the way he looked, the way he spoke. Everything. You mean you want to copy the mule? Not copy. Be. Be. But, well, if I was able to uh, give you advice, could we go back to the foundation then? You could, perhaps, ah. if it still exists when I have finished with it. Oh. But the girl stays here. Oh, that was the other part of my revelation. She is going to be my empress. Empress of the Second Galactic Empire. But why don't, don't ask questions, Archibald? <laughs> Look, if you don't leave before war is declared, you won't be able to leave at all. But where's Uncle Hermia? <laughs> Something we can do for him. He's locked in Pucci's stateroom, showing him how to walk and talk like a mule. Because not to put too fine a point on it, but she has turned the corner. He's busy convincing himself that he's not set in bulk one time junior gunner of the fleet, but he is, in fact, the reincarnation of the mule, none other. But that's silly. Mm, but that's silly. What about his other idea or revelation to make you empress of his galactic empire? You mean... I mean the hook, remember? He wants to marry you. He's got poor Maris organizing the ceremony now. But he hasn't even asked me. No, he won't ask you. He'll tell you. And unless you want to be the empress of a non-existent empire, you don't, do you? To be really safe, I'd pick some other destination. If he does find out you've gone the first flight, he'll stop with the foundation one. Yes, sir. And don't talk. Go. Go while you can. Yes. All right. Lady Callier, I have the feeling you arranged all this. Oh, really? Well, you credit me with more brains than I do. Look, child, I have one reason for helping you. I want Pucci, and if that means pretending he's the mule, all right. But I can't stand competition, Arkady. I don't have youth on my side. I'm helping you out of simple self-interest, you see. Simple jealousy, protecting what's mine. Hmm. Well... Go on, go. Leave that old fool to this fairly old fool. Goodbye. Goodbye, Lady Tanya. And perhaps we'll meet again. Maybe, maybe. Goodbye, Arkady. But if we do meet again, I shall have failed. Can I help you, miss? Oh, yes, I, I want a ticket. Where to? Um, where's the first flight going to? Uh, foundation. What about the next one? Or two together. One to Trantor, direct, and the other a roundabout flight. Trantor, please, your... the direct flight. Oh. Return? No, single. I don't blame you. There'd be a war here, you know. Yes, I know. Well, that'll be 172 credits, please. 172? Uh, I, I've only got 170. Here you are, young lady. Two credits. Oh, I couldn't... Take have... them, take them. Thank you very much. There's your ticket, miss. Thank you. Any baggy, miss? No, none, thank you. So you're going to Trantor, miss? Yes, yes, that's right. So am I. And so is my wife. She's over there, if you care to meet her. Maybe travel with us. Oh, yes, I would. Thank you. Our pleasure, our pleasure. Uh, Mother, mm -hmm. here. 
this young lady's going to tramp her, same oh, as we are. Well, and she's on her own, so I thought we could travel together. That's the best idea you've had all day. He's probably forgotten to introduce himself, dear. He's Preen Palver, no. and I'm Mrs. Palver, and we're pleased to meet you. Thank you. I'm Arkady Dow. Ah, oh, that is a pretty mm. name. And, and do you live on Tranter, dear? No, I'm just going for a holiday. <laughs> a holiday <laughs> on Tranter? Well, you must be the first person ever to do that. <laughs> well, I, I thought I'd just like to go there just to see what it's like. Well, it's like one big farm, <laughs> that's what it's like. Apart from a few old ruins. Yeah. Oh, we're farmers, that's why we've been here. Mm. We came for a sales conference trying to arrange to export our produce to Calgary. So you don't know Planter at all, Mark, do you? No, I come from the foundation. <gasps> oh! But my grandmother lived on Tranter for a while when she was young, and my mother was born there. Uh, is, is your mother there now to meet you? No, she's dead. Oh. There's nobody to meet me. I don't know anyone there. Oh, well, you do now. Uh, how old are you, Arkady? I'm 16 and a half. Oh, I'm 16 and a half and sitting out the galaxy on your own. I, I never heard the like. No. Well, well, now, Arkady, when we get to Tranter, you'll stay with us. It, it's not right a child like you being on your own. No. no. You're very kind, Mrs. Palver, and I'd love to stay with you. Good. But really, I'm not a child. Attention. <laughs> oh, Attention. This is a public service announcement. There is to be a security check. Oh, no, 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 Security officers will check your tickets and your identity papers. This is purely a routine checkup. And any person making any attempt to escape will be instantly killed. They really take life very seriously on Gal, don't they? Oh, child, what's the matter? You, you're shivering. It's, it's me. It's me they're looking what for. Did you, you haven't done anything wrong, have you? No, nothing, I no. promise you. But I have to get away from Calgon and they're trying to catch me. And don't you worry about a thing, Argonne. Just give me your ticket and your identity papers and I'll do the rest. We just say you're our niece. But, but they'll never believe that. God, with a little persuasion, they will. I have a... Special way of the officials. <laughs> but they're not ordinary officials. They're security officers. Arkady. An official is an official, mm. and my method has never failed yet. Well, I think a hundred credit notes should be enough, don't you, Mum? Oh, yes. The man in charge is only a lieutenant. Oh, here they come. Oh. Hold your breath. And smile, Arkady. Smile. Papers, please. Uh, well, certainly, Lieutenant, certainly. Uh, I'm Preen Palver. Agricultural exporter, and this is my good wife. Thank you. This is my niece. Just give me the document, please. Thank you. Oh, uh, just a small token of our appreciation. Your men do a fine job here. We're glad of your protection. Yes. Mm. All right. Pass. But shush, shush, now don't say a word. They all have their prices here. <laughs> We'd better get on board ship before greed gets the better of that young oh. man. Ship's due to leave at any minute. And, and once we're safely away from here, in space, then you can tell us all about it, Arkady. Mm. I'm dying to hear why they should be looking for you. It's war, Daryl. Yes, I heard. You got my message. Then what are you going to do about Arkady? There's nothing I can do. Did you get my medal? Oh, yes, yes. Now, look, Daryl, that child could be in danger. Professor, please. Now, just sit down. There's nothing we can do to help Barkady, but we can help ourselves. Now, did you get the equipment I asked for? Uh, yes, I did. It wouldn't be easy, though. Fifty hyper relays is more than even the keenest researcher would use in a lifetime. But the vital thing is, how small can you make the device? Like, so big. No, I've got to be able to carry it in the pocket. It won't be easy, Daryl. You can do it. Believe me, it's very important. Well, what is this thing for? I can make it, but I don't understand the purpose of it. Shh. That's Anthor. I can't explain, Felix, not yet. But don't say a word to anybody. Absolutely nobody must know. It's deadly knowledge, right? All right. Darrell, Felix, this is Orem Dirige from Calgan. Calgan? Yes, police lieutenant, Orem Dirige. Don't worry, Dr. Darrow. I was a Foundation agent on Calgon, and I'm part of the resistance network Dr. Amther has been setting up. But what are you doing here? Deerage was the last man on Calgon to see your daughter. Huh? 
she left the spaceport on the last flight before war broke out. She took a flight for Trantor. Trantor? She was with a middle-aged couple who were returning to Trantor after trying to sell their farm produce in Calgon. They seemed a nice couple. But I don't understand. Daryl, don't you think it would be a good idea for you to go to Trantor? No. But if Arkad is there... At least she's safer there than she was on Calgon. But I'm not going because I want to. What? That doesn't make sense. I think it does. Why should Arkady go to Trantor? For all we know, the Second Foundation arranged for her to go there, and they're using her now as bait for me. They know how much I want to see her, but I'm not taking the bait. I'm going on with my work here. We must just hope that Arkady is in good hands on Trantor. We must just hope. Why don't you tell me what's bothering you? I'm not sure myself, Mr. Palva. Is it the food? You're getting enough to eat, aren't you? And Mother's a wonderful cook. And your bed's comfortable, isn't it? There's nothing wrong here, Mr. Palva. You've both been very kind to me. I've enjoyed the sightseeing and I like life here. But, you see, the more I think about what happened on Calgon, the more suspicious it seems. Suspicious? I mean, I thought I was escaping. I thought I was taking decisions. But the more I think about it, the more it feels as if it was arranged. As if I was sent here. Sent? To us? <laughs> we only met you by chance. And who would want to send you from one end of the galaxy to the other? What did you say? What? That's it. Seldon created one foundation on Terminus, and the second foundation at the other end of the galaxy. Star's End. But... But the galaxy's like an oval dish, isn't it? So there is no other end. Mr. Palver, I have to get back to the foundation. I must tell Father. Well, uh, back to the foundation? Oh, but how? You have a small spaceship, don't you? Oh, yes, but well, I don't know if it could travel so far. It's pretty old, and it's only designed to carry farm produce, arcade, vegetables and fruit stuff. That's perfect. Mr. Palver, what is there a shortage of in any war? Uh, ammunition? Food! Vegetables, fruit, food. The prices rocket up, and anyone with a whole shipload of food would make a fortune. Oh, a fortune, is that? One load of fruit and vegetables will be worth its weight in uranium on the foundation now. Oh, well, maybe the old ship could reach that far, but... Well, I I'd have to speak to Mother, of course, but... A fortune? Oh, that does sound interesting. This is Joel Turbo reporting from the warfront. Citizens of the Foundation, this correspondent has watched the progress of the war with Calgan with a deepening sense of despair. We are now in a desperate situation, with a massed fleet from Calgan preparing what could well be the final attack. Our only hope now is to rid our minds of any further thoughts of the Second Foundation. We might learn a lesson from our arch enemy, Stettin. Here's an excerpt from one of his recent speeches. So the second foundation will save the will it? So where is it? Where is the all-powerful second foundation? I'll tell you. Nowhere. Nowhere. It does not exist. There is no such thing. Which is why, my loyal subjects, which is why we are going to smash the foundation like a gun. The first, the one and only foundation, the mule did it, and I, the mule incarnate, I will do it again. Oh, Arkady, I should never have listened to you. It seemed like a good idea at the time, but now... Don't worry, Mr. Palza. This is a foundation ship. Yes, a warship. 
Are these the prisoners? Sir! There's no need to scream. Sorry, sir! Right. Now, who are you? I'm Prem Palva. I'm a farmer. Just a farmer from Tranter. I thought I could bring some food to the Foundation to help the war effort. God, think... does that make sense? The ship is crammed with food, yes, sir. Hmm. And you? You're who? I'm Arcady Dowell, the daughter of Dr. Toran Dowell of the Foundation. And Mr. Palva was taking me home when you stopped us. Oh, you're the child who got stuck on Calgon, aren't you? I'm the young lady who was on Calgon, if that's what you mean. Mr. Palva helped me to escape from there. That's Mr. right. Mr. Palva sounds like a useful man to know. He's been very helpful, and I think the Foundation ought to treat him as a friend, not as an enemy. Hmm. I rather agree. Uh, you're not suspect anymore. Oh, good. Thank you. Now, I have to get back to the Foundation to see my father. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Darrow. We're in the middle of a war, you see. Actually, we might be almost at the end of a war. You mean we've almost lost? No, I mean we've almost won. <laughs> Of the various reasons for your complete failure, mm -hmm. I doubt whether you could understand one of them, even if you had the time. If you don't, step and pull yourself together. In a very short time, the survivors of the invasion fleet are going to get back to Caldum, and they're not going to care about explanations. The least they'll want is your head, mm -hmm. minus the body. Mm -hmm. And the only way to maintain your present wholesome condition is for you to go now, far away, quickly, before they get here. But the government will rule Calgon. I will. Huh? I've had sufficient practice serving one half with dictator after another. I think Calgon has had enough of military dictators. I think the planet is ready for a civilian dictator now. But you must go. Quickly. I prepare a ship for you. I suppose I couldn't take Mun with me. Certainly not. Mm. I'm going to be very nice to Homier Mun. I need him to negotiate a reasonable surrender with the Foundation. You will have to go alone. Uh, no. Quite alone, Myrus. The Italia will stand by me. She'll still call me Pucci. I very much doubt if she'll ever call you Pucci again. But what way is she? I have no idea. Oh. Several hours ago, an unidentified spaceship of a very peculiar design was seen to land on the far side of Calgary. Carrier was seen to board, mm. and the ship was seen to leave again for an unknown destination. Well, well that's not possible. Carrier's too simple-minded to have left me. She worshipped me. As long as was necessary. But where could she have gone? I have a shrewd idea. She's gone to a place you said did not exist. <laughs> I know for certain the second foundation does exist. And I know exactly where it is. What? Where? Kalga. And so I was on Kalgan for the signing of the surrender, and I had a good look round the place. It's just an insignificant little holiday planet. It can't be the second foundation. Ah, Turbot, if you came here for the first time, would you recognize it as the technological center of the galaxy? Well... Look, the number of scientists of the first foundation who actually control our physical science is very, very small. Well, why shouldn't that be true for the Second Foundation, too? Just a tight, well-organized oligarchy. And they're hidden even from their own host world. Which we have just defeated. We defeated that fool, Stettin. So now, where's the last place we think of looking for the Second Foundation? Calgan. And where was the place the mule never thought of looking? His own capital, Calgan. All right. If you are right, Anthor... How are we supposed to find these second foundationers on Calgon, eh? Who are they? How can we tell them from everybody else? And how can we protect ourselves from them? I think I can answer your questions. 
the solution to the last problem, our protection, is also the solution to how we can identify second foundationers. Semik and I have been busy making a device which will do the job quite well. This. What is it? It creates and maintains a field of mental static. I've already arranged that all vital installations of the foundation are fully protected by this mental static. In other words, they're protected from interference by the second foundation. Eventually, any place we choose can be made absolutely safe from the second foundation. Then it's all over. Not exactly. You see, the second foundation does still exist, but not on Calgan, Ambro. Well, where then? Where? I'll let Arkady explain. It was her idea. It was more intuition than idea, really. Something Mr. Parva said on Tranto. It just suddenly made me see. It was really so simple. You see, Selden gave us the clue that the second foundation was at the other end of the galaxy. But what is the other end? A cross-section of the galaxy is a circle. And a circle has no end. We are on the edge of the galaxy, on the rim. And if you follow the rim of a circle, you'll come right back to where you started from. And there you'll find the second foundation. Ah, there? You mean here? Yes, here. It makes sense, doesn't it? Why do you think Ebling Meese was so surprised by what he discovered in the library on Tranto? He had tried to find the second foundation to warn them against the mule, and he'd left the very place where they were, already in the mule's empire, just where their mental scientists could best work out how to stop the mule. It's so obvious. But then any man or woman on this planet could be a second foundation. Anyone, yes. You said you could protect us against them, and you said you could identify them. How? By the mental static device. You see, Turbo, compared to them, we are like blind men. But there's one weapon which will hurt a man who can see, but will not hurt a blind man. A strong light in the eyes, which is what this device does. It sets up a powerful shifting electromagnetic pattern, which to the mind of a man of a second foundation would be like an unbearable blinding light. It would sear his brain. <laughs> the second foundation, aren't you, Anthor? Yes. Yes. And the second foundation is here, on Terminus? Yes. Yes. The situation was growing dangerous. You knew that our physical scientists were becoming interested in brainwave patterns and that we were close to developing the mental status of ice. I had to stop it. Without ruining Seldon's plan. You tried to control your group, join it. You tried to divert your attention and suspicions away from us. The Calgan War was such a distraction. I tried to distract you, Darrell, from your work on the mental static device by getting you to go to Transor, to Arcady. Why didn't you control my mind? You were thought to be important for the future government of the First Foundation. The answer wasn't to control individuals, but to control the times, the circumstances. And for how many of you are there in the Second Foundation? There are... There are fifty of us. We didn't need more. We... Oh. When did you suspect him, Darrell? From the start. He came from Clyde, he said. But I knew Clyde. And on what terms we parted. He was a fanatic and I had deserted him. To him, I was a traitor. Yet suddenly, he sends me his most promising pupil as a co-worker just before he died. Obviously, he was being controlled by that very pupil. Now we know how many second foundationers there are. We can identify and deal with the whole 50 of them. And then we will be free of the second foundation forever. At last. And all because of Arkady's ability to see the obvious when nobody else could. Goodbye, Mr. Powell.
Oliver. I'm sorry you have to go. Well, now, you remember. You know where we are, Mother and me. You'll always be welcome. Goodbye, Dr. Darrell. Goodbye. And thank you for taking such good care of our kids. Oh, please, I should be thanking her. Not only did I get a regular contract for fruit and vegetables, I got this beautiful medal. The Foundation's highest award. The freedom of the first foundation. The one and only foundation. Uh, yes, so you said. <laughs> I can't say I quite understood all that. But <laughs> anyway, you'll soon be clear of that other foundation. We've got most of them already. In a few hours, we should have completed the search. Well, well, good for you. <laughs> then I must get back to the farm. And Mother, <laughs> oh, she'll never believe me when I tell her the adventures I've had. Well, goodbye again, Dr. Darrell. Yeah, goodbye. <laughs> Parkady, goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Salva. Uh-uh. Uncle Preem. <laughs> and I will come to visit you someday. Well, Trantor's the perfect place for a honeymoon, you know. Quiet, peaceful. <laughs> Goodbye. The Empire will vanish, and all its good with it. Its accumulated knowledge will decay, and the order it has imposed will vanish. Interstellar wars will be endless. Interstellar trade will decay. Population will decline. But psychohistory, which can predict the fall, can make certain statements concerning the succeeding Dark Ages. The Empire has stood for 12,000 years. The Dark Ages to come will endure not 12, but 30,000 years. We must fight that by conserving the knowledge of the race. My plan is to set up a foundation devoted to the preparation of an Encyclopedia Galactica. This will reduce the Dark Ages to only one millennium. And another foundation will be established at the other end of the galaxy, at Star's End. Everything has gone according to our calculations. I regret the sacrifice of those 50 men and women, like Peleus and Thor. They have given their lives to protect the first foundation from its own ignorant aggressions. It had to be 50, Guardian. They would never have believed less. And they have not died for nothing. The general population is convinced that we never existed at all. And the intellectuals are convinced that we no longer exist. All because Selden spoke of the other end of the galaxy. But because they were physical scientists, they were unable to discover us. Their thought processes were geared to the physical form of the galaxy. But Selden was a social scientist, and to him, the other end of the galaxy was something entirely different. Terminus was founded at the periphery, where the first empire was weakest, where its civilizing influence was least. The second foundation was at the other end, socially, where the empire was strongest, where its civilizing influence was the greatest. And Selden allowed himself a little poetic imagery when he spoke of the second foundation. All the universe was once guided from this rock. All the apron strings of the stars led here. All roads lead to Trantor. And that is where all stars end. And now I had better go home. My wife will want to know exactly what has happened to our adopted niece. Titan, Foundation, Foundation and Empire, Second Foundation. Author, Isaac Asimov. Audio adaptation, Mike Scott. Part number eight. 
Vater, zeig uns da sein.